ladies and gentlemen, ministers, distinguished members of parliament, your excellencies, distinguished representatives of the media, dear participants, the Balkans integration topic would have had a different focus probably if the 24th of February had not occurred, we would have uh, discussed the traditional issues related to the usual cliches about integration, the need to include uh, these countries in our family, the right to a civilization choice enjoyed by each country. How can we make the enlargement policy more successful? How uh, can Eastern Europe convince Western European societies that are not fully convinced as to Western Balkans integration. The Western Balkans and the Balkans topic and their integration in the EU has acquired different dimensions. It has become a security matter. Let us recall uh, uh, the Thessaloniki 2003 message. Then the Council outlines a clear perspective, namely all uh, the Balkan countries should sooner or later be part of the EU. We were dreaming about a prosperous world, about a world involving countries, a world opening doors to opportunities. This is the reason for the existence of the EU, namely equal opportunities for each and every country. We are facing a different challenge nowadays. In the 21st century, we wouldn't have imagined uh, that uh, borders might be changing, but this is happening. We would never have uh, thought uh, that on the 24th of February, the sovereign uh, uh, choice of a country as to uh, belonging uh, to its space uh, uh, ha has not been observed. The Ukrainian crisis and Russia's uh, aggression are uh, the uh, bell uh, sh that should be ringing uh, in the EU institutions. Reformation does not uh, suffice. Uh, Europe uh, should uh, perceive uh, its eastern neighborhood dimension in a different way. We are still hearing skeptic voices. According to them, Ukraine will never be part of the EU. They will never acquire a candidate status. Now that the EU has uh, stands firmly united behind its values should make the most decisive June, namely award the candidate status to Ukraine. I do hope that the European Union will deliver on its responsibilities. Recently, we have witnessed a concept behind which leadership is hiding. Leadership requires making decisions. This does not suffice. Leading the process is necessary. We are not analysts. We are not political scientists. We we are policy makers. Uh, we should be making important decisions. The European Commission started with a serious pledge, namely being the geopolitical European Commission. This sounds great. However, it should be the political, the policy European Commission before being uh, the geopolitical one. Uh, where? Can uh, the EU play a more important role, if not with respect to the Western Balkans? I don't have the answer unless uh, we show the way forward uh, for North Macedonia and Albania. It will be difficult for us to explain to upcoming generations what uh, choices, what decisions we have made. I think that uh, the Bulgarian national interest is for each and every country in the region to be part of the EU. This implies security well-being for all the countries in the region. Moreover, Bulgaria should not only uh, be uh, the uh, state uh, faced with issues, it has to be a state leading the path forward. 
we have our say. Uh, the uh, Bulgarian ethnic uh, model uh, sets the best example. Uh, in addition to the 15-year experience in the EU, we can not only uh, provide assistance to the Western Balkan countries, we can lead them. We have made mistakes. All countries make mistakes. Some critics say that uh, we did not deserve acceding to the EU. Romania and Bulgaria acceded to the EU first and foremost due to the efforts made by the previous generation of politicians in relation to the Kosovo crisis. Let us recall that back in the past, both Romania and Bulgaria ensured its uh, air space uh, for the NATO air forces. The main reason was the breach of human rights. N nowadays, uh, we uh, speak about visa liberalization. We know that there are still citizens in Europe that cannot freely travel based on a visa-free regime. Given these circumstances, it is high time for us to say no. If we want to be a union that is a driving force for global uh, progress, it is high time for us to unite our efforts uh, both on a national and a global level. Uh, our uh, issues on the agenda are not only uh, national ones, they're global ones. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs has honored this forum as Bulgaria should be a leader. My gratitude to Dr. Solomon Pesci uh, for believing firmly in this idea. It is a meaningful forum. We will continue with this forum. North Macedonia, Greece, Croatia has a forum. Bulgaria should have a forum, a space for the exchange of ideas, so that Bulgaria can set as an example its ideas, can prove uh, its capacity. Thank you to Danny Kadik from the ELF. Thank you for your financial support. Thank you for being like-minded persons. Thank you for providing perspective uh, for the Western Balkans. Nowadays, uh, today, the EU is having a meeting with the Western Balkans. It is not the last meeting. It is the beginning of a long-term partnership. Now I would like to give uh, the floor to the Executive Director of the European Liberal Forum, Daniel Kadik. You have the floor, Daniel. Thank you very much, Ilhan. Excellencies, dear ministers, vice ministers, skipi priyateli, dami gospoda, I'm very happy to welcome you here today in my old hometown of Sofia. It's always a little bit special for me to come back here and especially address such, a, such an audience that when I still worked here would have never thought would be possible and talking about a topic that we hoped would not be possible. And one of those is the war of Russia against Ukraine and the fallout that we are seeing right now. One topic that we have predicted will be high on the agenda is also what you hear, see there over there. It's the EU enlargement. And what we want to talk about today is not a world that has changed. The world has not changed our perception of reality has changed. And I have to say that especially as a German whose government has been turning a blind eye on the Russian threat that has been looming over our heads for years and years. Not only looming o over our heads, but actively being promoted, pampered, financed by the German government, um, starting with Mr. Schröder over Mrs. Merkel. It is not a new reality, it's the old reality that we have been woken up to. And I hope this will also have effect on how we perceive foreign policy, foreign relations, having a more mature um, approach to foreign relations. And especially on the level of the EU, when we are now finally talking about strategic autonomy on level of the European Union. Something that has been in the making as I hear for quite a while. 
But we must not only wake up to the reality of foreign policy and the area around us. We must also react, wake up to the reality of European integration. And this is manifold. There's the reality of the candidate countries that have been in the waiting room for years and years. I just want to name Montenegro as one of the countries that is ready to join the European Union, where you pay with euro most of the time. And still, they are in the waiting room. Um, we, are, we are in the reality of countries who desperately wanted and want to join the European Union, like Ukraine, like Moldova, that has been left on the sidelines for quite a while. And we also have to take into account the reality of the integration that we have had so far. And I, have, I hate to say this, but Bulgaria is the best and the worst example of European integration. The best example, if I move around this city and see how much has changed in the, in the years, how much positive people are still towards the European Union. And especially saying that again as a German, the feeling towards the European Union. For a lot of the Western European countries, the European Union is something that was bestowed upon them. That it was just there. Let's have it so we don't fight each other. For Bulgaria, it was something, and I hope you don't mind me saying that as a semi-Bulgarian, that Bulgaria wanted to be a part of because there was something in it that goes beyond economic prosperity, but it was the feeling of belonging to the West, to the European family. And this is, I think, the fantastic qualities. The not-so-fantastic qualities have a lot to do with the EU itself, that the EU once Bulgaria was part of the, the club, forgot about a lot of the things that club members need to perform, deliver, when they knock on the doors. I just want to point to the controlling and verification mechanism, which has been a complete disaster here. And I'm very glad that we are now talking about a proper rule of law mechanism on the European Union. But what are the consequences? People are fed up in a lot of places. We must. Um, prevent that in potential new member countries. People who should not be in the parliament are in the parliament. People who should not be prime ministers have been prime ministers for years and years and have been stealing this country poor and have accumulating wealth of over a couple of billions of euros. If we can prevent that, if we take European integration seriously, as a role, not only as a realm of security, but a realm of values, prosperity, European integration has a chance. And we should start, as the name suggests, with the Western Balkans, have the Western Balkan countries as part of the Union, as we have worked on for so many years. We should give a proper perspective to Ukraine and Moldova, not only because it is in their interest, but it's also in our interest, but a realistic perspective that goes beyond the speaking point, points of an accelerated accession where still an acquis communautaire and the chapters stand before. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you with all my heart that you are here today being interested in that topic that is so important for the European liberals. One of the great, I might say, European liberals is in, in Brussels most of the time, working very hard, and I would like to personally thank Ilan Kuchuk for this hard work that he has been doing for the integration of the Western Balkans. Thank you very much for that, Ilan. I would like to thank our partners, the ALDE Party, our mother party as the European Liberal Forum as a think tank and foundation, but also, of course, the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria. Moni, um, we've, we've met a couple of times. Um, so thank you very much for that. Please let us take this forum, as the name suggests, as a room for discussion, how to make integration work, how to work out the pitfalls, and have a liberal future in a united Europe. Thank you very much.
Мадам Могерини, господин Карадая и госпожо министр. Господин Кичук, как... Mr. Kichuk, of course, uh, I can believe you. I did uh, believe and trust you 30 years ago when you were the first political party that uh, supported uh, uh, the uh, accession of the Atlantic Club uh, to the overall idea about NATO. I believed in the liberal idea some 30 years ago, and ever since I have believed in that idea. Today's uh, forum uh, has uh, quite a few important issues on the agenda. The most important one is where did we make a mistake? Uh, we have made a series of mistakes. When we are asking this question, uh, what was our mistake? Of course, uh, uh, the mistake relates to Bulgaria, to the European Union, to NATO, to the world as a whole. Whenever we refer to others' mistakes uh, before giving the answer to the mistakes of the others, we should answer, what about our mistake? What about my personal mistake? Back in 1943, uh, when Bulgaria saved 50,000 Bulgarian Jews, including my family, I have a cousin uh, who uh, was not uh, in Bulgaria at that time. He was in France, and uh, he was detained by the Nazis, and uh, he was uh, murdered. He shared the destiny of the six million Jews at that time. I haven't told this story frequently. I abstained from telling the story till the 24th of February this year, as I thought uh, that this story belongs to the far past. That was uh, the big mistake that I make, namely believing uh, that the war is a part of the past. The war has always been a part of the future. Yesterday, on the 25th of April, uh, we marked uh, 17 years uh, uh, of uh, the date uh, when Bulgaria signed uh, the EU uh, treaty in Luxembourg. After 14 years of efforts uh, in starting with the Grand National Assembly, we had already acceded to NATO, we acceded to the EU, the signatures took only four seconds, thus Bulgaria embarked in a new era. That was uh, uh, the greatest achievement in my professional career. In 2005, uh, when we were part of uh, NATO and the EU, we did not believe uh, that uh, we might uh, witness such a war. How would that However, nowadays uh, we have uh, very serious evidence, uh, namely uh, we made a correct choice with respect to NATO and the EU. This is why I would like to address all the participants in the Liberal Conference. I kindly call upon you to answer the question, uh, where did I make a mistake? Uh, where did the EU make a mistake? Uh, having said uh, this, I would like uh, to pass over to the uh, video message by Roberto Mezzolo, the President of the European Union, the youngest uh, uh, President of the European Parliament ever since. It is the first time that these key EU institution has had uh, a lady president, an institution that we highly uh, appreciate. You have the floor, Mrs. Metzal. Uh, dear ministers, honorable panelists, dear participants of the EU Balkan Summit, thank you to ALDE co-president Ilhan Kukchuk, the ALDE party, the European Liberal Forum and the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria for inviting me to address you today. And more importantly, Thank you for organizing this timely summit at what will become one of the most decisive moments in European history. Not too long ago, when we would gather in these exchanges, we would speak of pre and post COVID. And now we cannot but speak of pre and post 24th of February, 2022. Because the war in Ukraine has changed everything. And it serves as a wake up call for Europe and the world. Less than 1000 kilometers from Sofia, Ukrainian men, women and children are paying the ultimate price in protecting their homeland, in protecting democracy in Europe. 
It is our responsibility to stand united with Ukraine against the aggressor and to draw important lessons from this brutal and unprovoked invasion. The European Parliament welcomes the Western Balkans Sixes condemnation of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. And we commend those countries who have implemented EU sanctions against Russia. We further emphasize, however, that sanctions must continue to be implemented in full. This is what is expected from every country aspiring to become a member of the European Union, because we are only as strong as we are united. In this vein, stability in our immediate neighbourhood is vital for EU stability. And that is why we need to think of ways to accelerate the enlargement process in the Western Balkans as a powerful tool to counter the efforts of malign foreign actors, including through disinformation and propaganda campaigns, in order which they try to destabilise the region. Geographically, Western Balkan countries are surrounded by the European Union. Their accession would not only mark the enlargement of our Union, but more importantly, a significant step towards its completion. The Western Balkan countries have been knocking on our doors for far too long. Clarity is now needed for them and for us. As I mentioned in my inaugural speech to the European Parliament, we must reverse the lost momentum when it comes to our relationship with the Western Balkans. So the Western Balkan Six need to continue working hard to comply with the accession criteria and genuine efforts must be made to solve all outstanding bilateral issues. Yet while the need for implementation and full implementation of internal reforms rem remains, we cannot keep lingering and adding criteria as we go along. The European Union must also keep its word. We have to deliver on our promises. Albania and North Macedonia have done their part to start the accession negotiations. But despite repeated calls by the European Parliament, the dates for their first intergovernmental conferences are yet to be set. Despite having fulfilled all our requirements, Kosovo still require a visa to enter into the European Union. Again, the repeated calls of the European Parliament have fallen on deaf ears. Not only is it unfair, it undermines the European Union's credibility. It weakens us. Montenegro, the front-runner of the EU accession process, has been struggling with internal disagreements instead of working towards closing the negotiating chapters. Serbia, another front-runner, is seriously lacking behind when it comes to its alignment with the European Union's common foreign and security policy. And with Bosnia and Herzegovina, here we remain particularly attentive. Russia's recent threats leave no doubt that Putin is ready to continue his destructive campaign also in the Western Balkans. The European Parliament remains fully committed to the sovereignty, territorial integrity and stability of Bosnia and Herzegovina and is resolved to counter any attempts to challenge it. On this note, we welcome the UN Security Council's decision to extend EU for Althea for another year and to strengthening its force with an additional 500 members. We encourage all efforts to solve the internal political crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina and support the country's efforts to obtain candidate status as soon as possible. Understandably, the ghosts of the Balkan Wars remain very much alive in the region. But EU integration will bring the much needed and awaited breath of fresh air to effectively overcome the past. It is crucial for the future of the Western Balkans and it is crucial for the future of the European Union. The European Union's enlargement policy has always been one of our biggest, most transformative successes. And this is why the European Parliament remains committed to clearing the accession path for the Western Balkans. Let me reiterate, as I have done in the past, the Western Balkans will always find an ally in the European Parliament. Thank you once again, and I wish you many fruitful exchanges throughout the rest of the summit. Thank you very much. Uh, we're looking forward to receiving you in person in Sofia next time. Now I have the floor and pleasure to um, give the floor to um, the Bulgarian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ms. Genchovska. 
few ministers uh, have not faced uh, a global crisis um, uh, over the last uh, couple of years uh, than uh, the crisis in Kosovo, the 11th of September, the crisis in Kuwait, Afghanistan. However, um, such a crisis uh, of such scale and uh, such a destructive potential, I think that we have not had before one. It is unprecedented. That is why I believe that we all have to support our Minister of Foreign Affairs in her efforts to solve not only the crisis, but also um, the crisis in her uh, decision to uh, provide um, um, arms to Ukraine, but also for a positive development uh, uh, for the Western Balkans as well as the Eastern Balkans uh, towards uh, uh, in the direction of Turkey. We're really happy to have you with us, uh, um, Madam Foreign uh, um, Affairs Minister. Uh, dear friends, um, I will skip um, a formal address to the audience. First of all, let me thank uh, Mr. Pesci. Uh, let me thank uh, OHA as well as um, uh, the European Liberal Forum for this uh, very timely initiative, uh, as well as ALDE. Um, I'm really impressed uh, with uh, the uh, high-level guests that we have here today, which shows how timely this forum is. Perhaps uh, it is a good idea for this forum to become uh, uh, a tradition, something that, Bulga that Bulgaria basically misses, uh, what uh, Mr. Ihan uh, Kichuk said. Um, we're really grateful uh, if it, this happens, and uh, we would fully support you. And Dr. Pussy, you said that we should ask about the mistakes we made. I believe that um, each and every one of us uh, um, is asking themselves this question every day, especially in the context of this uh, unprecedented um, aggression in the territory of Ukraine. I don't believe that um, the right uh, uh, answer can be found. At least 50 years have to pass before we become aware of the mistakes we have made, according to historians. But perhaps, as Emmanuel Kant says, we should know our history well so as to avoid making mistakes in the future. Russia's aggression towards Ukraine has um, created lots of challenges, uh, unprecedented in scale challenges, not only um, facing the European uh, countries, but also um, the whole democratic world. As you know, Africa is uh, threatened uh, um, with a looming of food insecurity. So the conflict um, has uh, given rise to many challenges and uh, to many asymmetric challenges um, uh, towards um, to the security of the whole world. We currently see um, how a um, member of um, a permanent member of the Security Council of the UN is trampling on uh, human rights. Uh, it is also a country that has a nuclear um, power, and uh, there are no guarantees that uh, democratic values uh, um, of the whole world can be actually uh, defended by such a member. The war uh, and um, the atrocities against um, Ukrainian civilians, against children and uh, women, um, all these atrocities show that um, uh, the right of a sovereign state uh, to define its future and uh, its um, uh, foreign affairs policy and defense policy, um, this right is actually trampled. And this aggression um, is also a risk against all of us. This is uh, also. Um, something that threatens um, uh, the freedom that uh, has been uh, um, won by all of us. Uh, Russia is to blame for this war, and we have to make our best uh, um, 
to actually learn the lessons of what we see in uh, the um, um, final communication of the extraordinary um, NATO summit, all of the allies, we um, <coughs> were united that we should uh, actually prevent Russia from destroying the foundations of international security, independent, sovereign, and stable Ukraine that uh, um, is adamant uh, in its uh, um, aspirations uh, to uh, protect the rule of law. This is very important for our Euro-Atlantic security. Bulgaria uh, has uh, supported the European uh, perspective of Ukraine over the years uh, repeatedly. Just some time before uh, the unfounded aggression of Russia against Ukraine, the Bulgarian um, Prime Minister and the Ukrainian President signed a declaration supporting the Ukrainian perspective uh, on your, um, in the European Union. Bulgaria believes that uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine belongs um, uh, with the European Union. That is why Bulgaria supported the idea of a fast uh, track procedure uh, to grant a candidate status uh, to Ukraine. I can assure you that uh, there has been no um, foreign affairs uh, um, a meeting without Bulgaria supporting this um, uh, European perspective of Ukraine. We initiated uh, the informal group of uh, friends uh, to Ukraine. We provide uh, daily uh, support uh, to Ukrainian families fleeing the war. They found their home in Bulgaria. We are looking forward to the European Commission um, and uh, its um, uh, announcement uh, uh, that uh, Ukraine has uh, the um, has uh, been granted uh, candidate status. However, uh, this declaration depends uh, on the member states uh, and uh, uh, to what extent they will live up to the expectations. We are also um, supporting the European perspective of uh, Georgia and uh, um, uh, Moldova. We uh, have also supported the European perspective of all the six countries in the Western Balkans because this is um, actually um, the largest and the m most powerful driver towards um, uh, integration in um, the Balkans. However, Euro European integration cannot be an antidote. The antidote uh, has to do with um, the values, with the civilization, um, civilization uh, choice. Every time the uh, integration perspective is accelerated, uh, uh, the values should also, and their acceptance should be acceler accelerated. Otherwise, um, there will be a detrimental compromise with the European values, uh, such as um, rule of law, um, neighborhood, as well as uh, loyal uh, and uh, predictable partnership relations. We highly appreciate um, the support of the Western Balkan countries uh, that joined the sanctions uh, imp imposed by the European Union as a sign that they're ready to join the EU policy. We um, call for um, finding ways um, to help these uh, countries um, um, somehow be integrated uh, with the European um, uh, scheme for natural gas. The stability of uh, our allies uh, from the Western Balkans is um, uh, guaranteed uh, by the collective uh, security of NATO. However, our main focus should be on um, uh, the uh, stimulation and uh, the revival of the European integration of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. These two countries, they have uh, the, uh, the least um, um, stable level of security. And uh, um, these two countries, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and uh, Kosovo, they uh, still have not uh, been granted uh, a candidate status. Uh, the citizens of uh, Kosovo are uh, 
the only citizens in the region that are required to have uh, visas in order to travel in the European Union. Bulgaria has repeatedly supported um, uh, the visa liberalization regime of Kosovo, and we are still confused that no decision has been made in that respect. In general terms, uh, um, the EU cooperation in the region does not only boil down to integration uh, processes, we also um, promote um, uh, cooperation with the Western Balkans when it comes to security. That is why we would like to welcome the strategic compass adopted recently by the European Union. As you know, um, we have um, been taking part in the K4 um, NATO mission as well as the EU4 uh, Althea mission for more than 20 years. Well, we're trying to strengthen um, the stability of uh, the Western Balkan countries against the third uh, countries. We have to um, recognize that uh, the Russian influence is an active and um, um, and conscious choice of uh, some of these countries. We also have uh, to consider um, the influence on public uh, opinion. Perhaps, Dr. Pasi, we need to have another forum that has to do with disinformation and uh, um, fighting with uh, propaganda. I think that uh, that will be also a timely initiative. That is why you understand why um, our support for the European uh, perspective of the Western Balkans is adamant, but not uh, uh, undoubted, because it uh, means that um, apart from geopolitical orientation, it will be important uh, for um, all these countries uh, to um, comply with the main European values, such as uh, good neighborly relations. So we keep um, constantly in touch with our um, counterparts. Um, um, and uh, we also um, invest a lot of uh, resources and political capital in order to find uh, uh, solutions uh, and to help um, the integration process in Skopje to develop uh, on stable foundations. Building uh, predictable and loyal relations, however, is difficult, and it requires a lot of political will. It also depends on specific uh, outcomes and not on deadlines. Our joint work in this uh, area will continue. In conclusion, let me once again state that the Western Balkans undoubtedly, undeniably, would be much more prosperous and stable if they are part of the European um, Union of uh, Shared Values. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I think you were reading my thoughts uh, as regards uh, disinformation. In two weeks, we're going to focus on disinformation. On the 11th of May, we will have uh, a conference similar format uh, in relation to NATO's uh, Madrid summit. I very much hope uh, that you will take part in our meeting. The uh, speaker is uh, Olga Stefanishina, Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of Ukraine. Uh, I'm uh, very proud to have uh, Olga with us. Uh, Olga, I want to assure you that uh, Ukraine is uh, in the house of uh, each of us every day and every night. And uh, I want to assure you more than that, that Ukraine is in the heart of each of us every day and every night. Uh, if I happen to be President Kennedy, I would say, I'm Ukrainian. But uh, because I'm uh, not, I will say uh, in Russian, Ya Ukrainitz. So, this is the first time I have been in the Zemesnik, uh, Minister Predsedatel na Ukraina. Olha, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, uh, indeed, I feel that Europe is really standing with Ukraine and European people first and foremost. I was just 
uh, spending one day in Brussels discussing the expectations of uh, Ukrainian side over the next um, uh, EU leaders summit in June and uh, all the city and all the area around is surrounded with Ukrainian flags and people willing to support Ukrainian people to this or that extent. Today is the 62nd day of Ukrainian people's heroic resistance to the Russian full-scale military invasion. Ukrainians as a nation are a strong and courageous people. This has something we always knew about ourselves. Now the whole world knows. Uh, now on this 62nd day, we already know for sure which is the clue for ending this war. There is only one clue, the, the unconditional victory of Ukrainian people, of Ukrainian army, of Ukraine as a state, with the support of, of, the, uh, of the democratic coalition around the world. The scenario of surrendering will never be successful. It will never stop us from further aggressions and opening the war again. So we're really grateful that we are now here discussing our joint efforts how to stop this war. Uh, moreover, um, I want to bring us back to some of the lessons of the past as we are now discussing the future and the geopolitics and lessons learned from the Ukrainian history. Russia's successive invasions of Georgia into southern and eight and unfortunately in Ukraine into southern 14, followed by its full-fledged war against Ukraine in 2022, showed that its strategic reasoning for not provoking Russia are just used by Kremlin to proceed with further aggression and to destruction of European security architecture. And in fact, we all should recognize that this narrative has been successful. Now the experience and the process Sweden and Finland are going through is showing that if Ukraine would join NATO back into Southern LA, the war would not start, probably even in Georgia. And this is already a fact which we unfortunately should recognize. Behind the Russian war against Ukraine uh, is first and foremost Putin's desire to reacquire outdated so-called spheres of influence. Ukraine's membership in the EU would reaffirm that Russia cannot turn the clock back to a darker times. Today, Ukrainians are united and mobilized as never before. We understand that we are fighting not only for free, peaceful and democratic future of my country, but for Europe as a whole and for democracy as a whole. And we hope that with such courage and resilience from European partners. Just let me give you a couple of figures we all are living in on a daily basis. The cost of this war in Ukraine are the thousands of people who died. Unfortunately, most of them are women, children, elderly people, anyway, civilians. Millions of refugees and IDPs, cities in ruins and over 100 billions of dollars of infrastructure damage and county. According to uh, our estimates, the cost of one month of war for Russia amounts at 610 billion of dollars, which comparable to Russia frozen assets abroad which we hope that these assets would one day serve the rebuilding of my country. During the invasion into Ukraine, the Russian troops systematically violated the norms of international humanitarian law and international human rights. The number of war crimes committed by the Russian soldiers and Russian army through all of the chain of command, from Putin to the regular soldier of Russian army, who has been in the Bucha, Rogastomel, or any other area around Ukraine, are the tens of thousands. Unfortunately, I cannot bear my tears when I can recollect only that all possible war crimes we have all been known and managed to identify since the Second World War have been committed on the territory of Ukraine. We could never imagine in a most tragic nightmare that we will hear and our dictionary will be filled with such words like filtration camps, and it will be applied to thousands of Ukrainian people who has been forcefully displaced to the Russian territory without knowing about their destiny. Russia must be recognized as a state sponsor of terror because what is happening in Ukraine is far beyond the war. 
It's far beyond aggression. It's a terror and genocide in its pure vision. And basically on April 14th, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and um, Colombian President Ivan Duke joined US President Joe Biden calling Russia's actions in Ukraine a genocide of the Ukrainian people. On April 21st, the parliaments of Estonia and Latvia have recognized Russian actions against Ukraine as a genocide. The EU was, um, and for us it's really important that of course the, the international criminal justice will hold everybody accountable, but we should not close our eyes to something which is already obvious. And as we all now trying to join our efforts to stop this aggression, and it's not in time to, to stop tomorrow or a day after tomorrow. The sanctions, the pressure, the resistance of Ukrainian armies are, army are already very strong and uh, it plays its role. But we should also think unconventional. The EU was designed to ensure peace and development on the European continent after the World War II. Thus today, as the EU faces also the greatest challenge of its history, there's no time for hesitation, there's time for decision and for making unconventional steps, for making those steps who, which can unite and bring consensus and prosperity in the European Union. EU leaders, we expect that EU leaders must show political leadership and courage by reaffirming the EU's mission of promoting peace and freedom on the European continent. Historic times require historic decisions. In fact, the EU's policy on strategic ambiguity towards Ukraine helped to induce this escalated war. Candidate statues for Ukraine and further integration would really serve as a powerful political signal of support and of change of the unsuccessful policy. For us, it's really important that when we're talking about the enlargement policy, we also see this new wave of discussions in that regard as the new spirit which could be brought also to the enlargement process of the Western Balkans and generally um, the, the whole concept of the United Europe. For us, it's really important that the political leaders, when they meet in, in June, they will take the decision that whenever this war is ending, there will be a future for Ukraine. And making the decision that Ukraine becomes a candidate status would really be another lesson which will be learned by Russian Federation as a failure of their narrative, as a failure to undermine the unity among partners and to failure to recognize and the failure to recognize that Ukraine belongs by concrete actions to the family of European nations. Future EU membership is a hopeful aspiration that unites the whole Europe, uh, the whole Ukraine uh, and uh, support of all regions around the country, despite their, um, their neighboring or neighboring um, with, not, with the EU. Today's support of Ukrainian accession to EU has risen on the record 91%. The Ukrainian application for membership was supported by European societies even before 2002 Russian invasion. Support of Ukrainian membership was uh, much higher in many of the EU states. For example, Italy in 2020, it was more than 60%. Uh, I should be also clear that uh, in, in our aspiration, because Ukraine is not asking you to give a, a free ticket to you. Before 21st of February, Ukraine has implemented a number of structural reforms in order to achieve the Copenhagen criteria. And the whole world knows about the history of long-lasting democratic elections in Ukraine. And basically the resistance and the resilience of Ukrainian institutions has been proven by the war. We have a fully operational government, fully operational financial and social sectors. So the background of our aspiration is the reforms with that we managed to committed, uh, we were managed to implement and we were committed to implement and we're committed to continue after the war is over. Uh, in fact, Ukraine has proven that even in times of war, we can transform ourselves. And the witness of that has been all the reforms and which has been implemented since 2014, when the Crimea was annexed and, and the full-scale war on the Donetsk and Lugansk region has started. And it's not a secret that when we are taking the historic decisions, we have to take care uh, of the historic momentum. 
it's absolutely obvious that Ukraine is a key player to a post-war European security. Having one of the most powerful armies on the continent, Ukraine can significantly strengthen the security and defense to you. Even before 2022 invasion and 24th of February, Ukraine constantly contributed to EU's operations missions, participated in the battle groups, and applied four PASCA projects. And now, after the Russian invasion to Ukraine, the whole world witnesses the commitment and effectiveness of defensive actions of Ukrainian army. Indeed, I can stop. Uh, I cannot stop and speak endlessly about all the uh, all the background of our aspirations. But I want all of us to make sure that when we are taking the decisions on the next step towards my country, we are making sure that we are not making the mistakes of not taking the decision, not making the mistakes of hesitation. In Ukraine, it's much easier now to see the, uh, much more clearly and boldly the, the need for historic decisions. I hope the voice of Ukraine will be heard. I'm absolutely grateful to Bulgaria and to Minister for a very explicit and clear messaging towards supporting Ukrainian past towards the EU. This would be the powerful argument of our um, of our commitment, the powerful argument of, uh, of your unity and the powerful uh, argument for the future post-war time of the prosperous Europe with Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Olha. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Everybody in this room is applauding you and is with you. Bulgaria supported Ukraine in 2004, the democracy in Ukraine in 2004, and this created a duty to continue to support democracy and peace for Ukraine. And uh, we are satisfied that uh, our Prime Minister decided immediately after this conference, uh, listening to results of it, to visit uh, Ukraine tomorrow. He is departing to, to Kyiv tomorrow with a governmental delegation, a parliamentary and governmental delegation. I have a question, uh, Olha. What is uh, your wish list to our Prime Minister? What would you like to receive? I'm very sure he is not planning to come for photo opportunity. He is coming for serious business. What would you like to, uh, uh, to receive from the uh, Bulgarian government? Thank you so much. As I was just uh, saying a minute ago, uh, the, the needs are very clear for us. Uh, we need support for our membership towards the EU. And second, we need weapons to make sure that this perspective is realistic. We need weapons and hope uh, your prime minister will be there with the good news for us. Weapons, weapons, weapons. Thank you, Olha. We are with you. Long Thank live you. Ukraine. With this um, very touching um, um, address of uh, Olha Stefanishina, we would like to appeal um, to Bulgaria to uh, support our Ukrainian friends, um, uh, partners, uh, allies, uh, um, our um, our people, so now we'll uh, hear. Um. Dear Minister Ginchowska, Excellencies, Dr. Passi, distinguished members of the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Brussels, from NATO. And it's an honor for NATO and for me personally to join your distinguished audience today. And I thank the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria, our partner organization, for organizing this important and very timely discussion. The theme of this discussion is important. It's important for Bulgaria as a member of both the EU and NATO, but also for all your Atlantic institutions, be it EU or NATO, also for allies and for partners in the Western Balkans and beyond. We are at a difficult juncture for global security and stability. Russia's barbaric attack on Ukraine is a threat to peace and security everywhere. And it also threatens the very basis of the rules-based international order. It also threatens the essence of our societies, of every individual, every person, our businesses, NGOs, our institutions, 
Why? Because Russia is attempting to deny Ukraine the right to make its own decisions. The choice for Ukrainians to decide what they want their country to be and what future to have. And this freedom of choice, this sovereignty, the right of people, be it Ukrainians, Bulgarians, Icelanders or anyone else, the right of people to live in freedom and decide the future of their country is a fundament and fundamental right of our societies and the wider international order. If we deny this right to one and accept somebody else's right to control it, then we accept it for ourselves. That is why NATO and the EU are responding together with many other countries to support Ukraine's self-defense and their right to make their own decisions. We respond together to protect fundamental principles that have guaranteed peace and security for NATO allies, for EU members, but also for our wider partnership for the last decades. That is also why each one of us, every one of us in our societies at individual or group level have to do maximum to support Ukraine and thus to support the peace and security in our countries and globally. We at NATO do believe that peace and stability in the single Euro-Atlantic space can best be guaranteed by NATO and the EU working together. And Western Balkans is definitely part of the single space of freedom. NATO offered Western Balkans countries partnership and integration prior to the EU, also as a consequence of our engagement and operational intervention in the region in 1990s. Today, most of the countries of the Western Balkans sit at the North Atlantic Council table here in Brussels as full members and take part in Allied decision-making. They chose their way. They chose to be part of the Alliance and they participate in the decision-making as free people and as sovereign countries. We think that that is one of the longest lasting investments that NATO has made in the region and also that has proven in time to yield the best results. We see that the whole Western Balkans region has made huge progress in the last decades, economical, social, political, uh, stability and security wise. And despite acknowledging backlogs and recurrent problems like in, in many other regions, we are firmly convinced and committed to make sure that achievements reached so far become irreversible. And that is important that in order to fully achieve this, we fully support the region's integration into the European Union to the highest degree possible. Again, it will be up to the people and the countries to define and decide the forms of integration in the EU. But as far as the overall interest for the peace and stability is concerned, we at NATO support this integration process. Uh, looking at NATO, when we discuss the particular role of NATO in the current situation and the wider international situation, let us remember that earlier this month, on the 4th of April, we celebrated the NATO Day. What is that? That is the day when NATO was founded, 73 years ago. Allies came together to establish NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, guaranteeing peace and security for their peoples, their countries, their territories, and their future. And today, it is one billion people and 30 allied countries who are members. Russia's brutal war has highlighted the importance and brought back the main core task of NATO, the collective defense and deterrence, and its role. Uh, the importance of being united by a strong transatlantic link is visible every day as we speak. We quickly activated our defense plans within hours of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. We deployed thousands more troops to the eastern flank of the alliance from both sides of the Atlantic, meaning also from the US, to demonstrate but also to ensure that those countries that are members of NATO 
that each one of them is safe and secure. And the commitment that we have given each other is iron strong and fully, fully supported by actions. Along with that, of course, it has also, this current situation brought back this to the center stage, the importance that NATO attaches to our partnerships and to each and every one of our partners, to their security, stability, and territorial integrity. That is why allies, partners are supplying Ukraine uh, with maximum aid possible, be it lethal aid, non-lethal aid, humanitarian, political, financial, and others. But that is why also we provide training exercises and other uh, capacity building to other partners from Georgia to Western Balkans. Never ever NATO has worked so closely with EU partners, with partners across the globe, with the private sector, with academia, non-governmental organizations, as we do now, with one primal objective, to defend our shared values, our shared understanding of what it means to live in a free country, to be free as individual, as society, to live in democracy, and to have that highest respect for the rule of law in our countries, in our partner countries and everywhere. That is our joint and common interest, and we believe that the best to achieve indeed is by working together. Having said that, we have to remain vigilant, of course, that there are other threats out there, uh, that a kinetic attack such as Russian attack against Ukraine comes with a variety or is enabled by a variety of other non-conventional threats. And uh, we should never lower our guards on these threats. We might not have kinetic attacks to our societies, to our countries, uh, no. But we have to be aware that non-conventional threats, especially we are referring to the Western Balkans or other countries such as hybrid uh, challenges, foreign interference, take place on an everyday basis. Foreign interference has become, in more recent times, particularly insidious, and that is indeed for a number of reasons. First, it is very often difficult to assign an ownership to foreign interference. It can be international, it can be transnational, but it can also be domestically enabled. Also, new technologies have enabled, in many cases, even facilitated hostile actors to interfere in a wide variety of ways in our societies. This makes it more difficult for all of us, for NATO, for allies, for European partners, to detect and respond to these threats. So, uh, in that respect, uh, we, have, we have clearly identified that foreign interference can take many different forms. It could be hostile information activities, including disinformation, and uh, indeed the main aim very often of these activities is to sow discord in our societies, and that doesn't require soldiers being deployed on the ground. Uh, it can be conducted from outside of our territories such as also cyber activities, uh, and, and they have a potential to cause significant degree of harm and destabilization. Uh, there are no geographical constraints, and they are below uh, the threshold of an armed attack, very often. Then, of course, uh, in such a situation, the countering of all these threats is one of top priorities for all of us, be it within the EU, be it within NATO, be it among the partners and others. Um, the way we proceed, whether these activities manifest themselves through disinformation, cyber threats, or through, through other use of hybrid tools such as energy and security, uh, we are particularly vigilant in first monitoring all these phenomena uh, to identify where they take place in our countries, in Western Balkans or elsewhere. And we have provided uh, a lot of inputs to our partners and allies in the Western Balkans because of the unique importance that NATO attaches to this region. So not only we know and we monitor what is happening, but we share that information and we also share the experience and our knowledge how best to counter it. 
I would also like to say a few words on, on a particular importance for Western Balkans uh, that is here in the alliance, the way we feel it, and, and allies are very unanimous about it. I would say that the Western Balkans region has marked, uh, and again I noted that earlier, impressive progress in the last decade. So the level of stabilization that has been reached uh, since the 1990 is very significant, both from political, institutional and security dimension. Um, indeed, NATO will continue to promote stability, security and cooperation in the region through the cooperation with our allies from the region, with our partners and through our mission uh, in Kosovo, the K4 mission but also through efforts of our offices in Sarajevo, NATO HQ Sarajevo, and in Belgrade Military Liaison Office there. But also through our everyday cooperation with the European Union, uh, with the United Nations and the other members uh, of the international community, other international organizations and, and their colleagues. For that reason, for NATO, uh, we regard it as imperative to counter all attempts to undermine and destabilize any Western Balkan country. Whether it's an ally, whether it's a partner, we cannot face these threats alone. We need collective action. And this is what makes cooperation between NATO and the EU and the wider international community essential. We do that with one very concrete purpose, to protect our freedom, your freedom, and our common world. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Baiba Braj. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, besides being NATO official, Ambassador Braj is also coming from the Baltic countries, which means that she has the right uh, genetic detectors for the threats uh, uh, coming to all of us. Uh, we're completely out of schedule, I believe, uh, which, uh, which is an excellent test that the topic is of uh, utmost world importance. Uh, I, therefore, I put the schedule in the skillful hands of uh, Federica Mogherini. Federica, thank you very much for being uh, with us. Uh, she was, uh, uh, of course, uh, HRVP between 2014 and 2019, and today she is uh, Director of uh, the College of Europe. Thank you very much for being uh, with us. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Verhey, to being with us uh, as well. Most welcome. First panel. Thank you very much. You hear me well? The microphone is on? Yeah. Yes, excellent. I, I think this should make it. Uh, well, thank you very much. I understand that I have the challenging task of uh, trying to say a few words. First and foremost, uh, pass the floor to uh, my good friend, Commissioner. Uh, and uh, you cannot imagine how relieved I am that I am the one uh, moderating and putting questions now and not giving answers or trying to. <laughs> uh, and also trying to keep uh, uh, the time to, into a reasonable uh, time framework. Um, I understand that we'll have first uh, a very short conversation about uh, the costs of the lack of integration and then we'll open the panel on the benefits of integration to the European Union uh, uh, with our colleagues and friends from the region. Uh, I will say only a few words uh, uh, to start with and then ask the Commissioner to give us his, uh, his views on, uh, on the risks and the costs uh, related to a lack of credibility or lack of progress on, uh, on European integration of the region, but potentially also of uh, other countries uh, like Ukraine, but Georgia and Moldova too. I was just reflecting that probably I'm uh, in the room one of the few that are coming from uh, one of the funding member states of the European Union, I guess. And I was reflecting on the uh, costs that would have had the lack of uh, integration of the European Union in the very first place, uh, some 70 years ago, uh, in uh, the world of today. Imagine the aggression of uh, Russia against Ukraine today without the European Union in place. Imagine the impact that this would have had not only on Ukraine, with the lack of support and mobilization, but also on the rest of the continent. Imagine the divisions, imagine the fields that would be created, one against the other, and imagine the fragility of the continent that would have been exactly the same fragility that we had repeated for thousands of years, where Europe was the epicenter of war, 
rather than the epicenter of stability. And I was thinking that the same courage and the same uh, long-term vision and determination that uh, our founding fathers and mothers managed to find back then is probably what is required today. The cost of the lack of integration of the European Union back then would have been immense. I believed personally very strongly that uh, the real antidote to war and the real key to reconciliation uh, is the European integration. I tell you a little anecdote from my personal life. Um, my grandmother, I still remember that very clearly, uh, that had lived through the Second World War, obviously, she still was very anxious whenever she heard any German tourist speak in the streets of Rome. And it's only through the integration process of the European Union that we have become one Europe. And let me challenge the title here. I would like to rather focus on integration more than enlargement, because especially when we talk about the Balkans, I believe it's completely inappropriate to think about an enlargement. It's actually including one part of Europe that is already within our borders geographically and physically, not politically yet. This is why I think it's about reunification of Europe as much as it is when it comes to the eastern part of Europe. Uh, I believe that uh, we will have the opportunity to discuss more about both the costs of non-integration and the opportunities and benefits of integration in the Balkans with our friends from the region in a moment. But first, I would like to pass the floor immediately to um, Mr. Commissioner, my good friend. We were working together in different roles uh, when I was high representative. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, we will have basically, I think, two rounds, one now more dedicated to you and then the other one more in conversation with the other colleagues and friends. So please, Oliver, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frederica. Thank you, Rector Mogherini. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a bit of an oddity to talk about first the, non, the cost of non-integration. It's a very central Eastern European approach. First, we always talk about the negative uh, before turning to the positive. Um, maybe this is something different, but it also um, highlights first the dangers. And I think um, if we uh, look at the war that we're seeing around us, uh, that um, directly affects us, uh, like it or not. Uh, what we see is that vulnerabilities imminently lead to conflicts and challenges. And this is why, when you look at the Balkans in a similar way, uh, we all know where the vulnerabilities are, we all know where uh, the real challenges are. And when we took over uh, the mandate, this commission, uh, it was a very important part of our priorities to put enlargement or integration of the Western Balkans back as part of the top five political priorities of the European Union. Because the war that we see in Ukraine, we have seen already in the Balkans and we still have the aftermath, and we still have the homework uh, to do and the lessons learned, which is a full integration of the Western Balkans into the European Union, but as importantly as that, a full integration of the Western Balkans within. Because peace and stability is best created through prosperity, uh, and not the other way around, because once people have something to lose, they will think in a much more sober way. And I think the lesson that we have learned um, from all the previous years uh, with the Western Balkans is that we have to now accelerate uh, what we do. Accelerate in the sense that we don't only talk about the process, the institutional, um, if you will, the Brussels gibberish. But we talk about the real integration, the integration on the ground, 
how the life of the people of the Western Balkans is going to change and improve so that it will become similar or the, or the same as the life that we are living in Europe, in the rest of Europe. And this is why uh, when, we, uh, when we inherited uh, a deadlock um, in the negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania, we also inherited um, a region where the social and economic gap between the European Union uh, and the Balkans is one of the key challenges in front of the Balkans uh, joining uh, the European Union, not to mention the institutional reforms uh, that needs to be done. So with all these three challenges, we had to start to work very quickly. First, we de-blocked uh, the enlargement process as such uh, through the new methodology. Because the new methodology was not only created uh, for the candidate countries to be able to move faster uh, and closer to the European Union, but it was also created for our internal reasons. Because I think um, that we got lost some of the, the key priorities on the way. Key priorities, why is it important for Europe to have the Western Balkans uh, fully integrated? And I think that through the war now we, we, we start to remember. We start to remember why. And this is why the second big endeavor of ours was to speed up the economic and social convergence as fast as we can. Because through that we can create stability in a much more credible way. So if we help the Western Balkans to move faster, to have growth and jobs locally, to keep the youth uh, working for them, uh, to have the latest technologies when it comes to digital or green uh, energy, when it comes to energy security, we are providing security and stability for the entire region. And this is why we have been pushing very close uh, and very hard uh, for a common regional market, so that they also start to work with one another, because we still have the heritage of the wars uh, of the Western Balkans. And of course, uh, when in Sofia, uh, there is still one issue that one uh, cannot avoid discussing. And that is, um, when are we going to have the first intergovernmental conference? Um, of course, for those living in this bubble uh, of, uh, of Brussels and, and, and our procedures, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a buzzword. But for those who are not that closely involved, I think the key is when do we start to work on delivering membership? This is the big question uh, when it comes to uh, North Macedonia and Albania. And um, I cannot hide the fact that um, I'm extremely disappointed that we're still discussing this issue. Uh, because we thought that we have sorted it out uh, two years ago. But now it's back on the table again. So, you know, if you have powers and you don't use it, it is also considered by others as a surrender of your powers and capabilities. So we need to trust ourselves, we need to trust uh, our powers, and I think all member states should trust the transformative nature of the accession process. And this is the message I have been bringing to Sofia again. Uh, I was here three weeks ago, and I'm happy to, I'm happy to come as frequent as, as, uh, as necessary to get this thing off the ground and get it done uh, in June this year. Because the war shows us that we have no time to lose. Not only time, but we have no interest to lose any more time on this. And finally, on the topic, the non-integration, I think that the COVID and the economic crisis has shown um, what non-integration can bring. You have seen that we have included the Western Balkans in as many initiatives that were reserved previously from member states when it came to the COVID crisis. We were very quickly deploying our financial support, be it bringing healthcare equipment, 
be it saving SMEs, being uh, uh, helping uh, to keep the public finances uh, stable in very challenging and never seen crisis before. And we have seen how fast the Western Balkans have profited from this. If they were not there, they wouldn't be the first partners to receive vaccines from Europe. If they were in Europe, they would have received it even, even earlier. Uh, if they were not uh, participating in our integration, at least remotely, then they would have had trucks and goods stopped and supply chains broken off completely. But this was not the case, because they were integrated. And I can go on uh, with, with other, other examples. It only shows that uh, it is not just a political project. This is an everyday project. Thank you. Let me, if I may, uh, let me get two or three lessons from what you said, reflecting on the mistakes that had been done in the past, in a, in a way that we can try to avoid making mistakes today, because I think that this is the key point. Not so much reflecting on the past, or rather using the reflection of the past to avoid making mistakes today. First, as you mentioned, and I couldn't be more on your side on this, uh, the completing the integration of the European continent is first and foremost in the interest of every single EU member state. So it's a national agenda. So. Second, use the power you have. And this is true for the European institutions, the Commission, the Council, the member states, and obviously also the partner countries and the candidate countries, and those that are not candidate yet. Third, the integration the complete, the, the complete integration of the European continent is indeed a peace project. And I think that in the Balkans, as well as in Ukraine, this is now self-evident, while it was not so much self-evident in the decades that we have in our recent history. It was more about democracy, rule of law, economic development and standards, which is also part of the project. But I think that here we're going back to the roots of when the European Union started reconciliation as the key element of living together, sharing interests, as you mentioned. And last but not least, and here maybe I would invite our friends to join us, the credibility of the process. Use the power you have means that, I've always been convinced about this, there is no space for anybody to seriously compete with the European Union strategically in the region if the European Union is consistent. And I know that since, uh, I would say not since I left office, but since uh, the year before I left office, uh, May, June 2019, the credibility of the European Union in the region has probably been shaken a bit. And I think that uh, since then, at least now as an observer, uh, I've seen frustration growing in the region, and I think that frustration is dangerous in this region more than anywhere else. So maybe this can be a useful forum, and sorry, I forgot to thank the organizer for uh, having taken this initiative, because I think it is particularly important to have this, especially in Sofia, let me say. I think it is uh, maybe a good opportunity today to understand what will be, or what could be, the costs or the risks or the dangers of uh, lack of consistency or lack of movement, and on the other side, what could be the scenario should the process of integration in the region proceed as it should. So let me ask our colleagues and friends, ministers and vice ministers from the region to join me, us, on stage. And um, if you agree, I would probably ask them first to give their reactions so that you have the concluding words. Would that be Thank you. Uh, a good option? So please uh, join uh, us on stage. Take your time to put your... Uh, um, free seating. Here. Free seating. Free seating. And uh, uh, please take your time to put your microphones on. And... Um, uh, I will, again, try to keep an eye on the watch, and, uh, but, you know, uh, asking an Italian to be strict on time is a bit challenging in <laughs> itself, but I'll try my best. <laughs> Please. Excellent. We are here. Um, that's... Uh, it, uh, yes. This... Around, now, I'm not, I'm not the best technician you could have, but... 
it should be working already. Excellent. So, uh, as you were the first putting it on, <laughs> uh, I will maybe uh, start uh, with you, uh, Boyer, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, North Macedonia. First of all, let me uh, say that I'm very pleased to see you here. Uh, and um, my first question to you uh, would be this. Uh, and I would ask similar questions to probably all of you, knowing that you have different perceptions from different capitals, uh, as it is uh, correct to have. Uh, North Macedonia has gone through major reforms, major courageous steps. I witnessed myself personally, together with, at the time, Commissioner Han, uh, the signing of the PRESPA agreement. A lot of expectations, a lot of enthusiasm at the time, and I know a lot of uh, frustration afterwards. One year, five years, ten years from now, how do you see your country? How do you see North Macedonia? In one scenario or another, what would be the risks, the costs, the dangers of uh, a lack of progress on the European Union path? I never say European path because you're already Europeans. And on the other side, how would you imagine your own country, one, five, ten years from now, should progress be made, should negotiations start? What kind of future you see? Yeah. And what are the steps needed today to go in the right direction? Thank you. Thank you, Federica. It's, I'm pleased to see you as well. I'd like to thank first the organizers for inviting me and for the opportunity to be participating in this discussion with such distinguished group of panelists. And I find this title first intriguing. The EU meets Western Balkans in Sofia. How exciting, isn't it? Uh, actually, it did happen just four years ago when EU met Western Balkan in Sofia during the Sofia summit, which took place 15 years after the renowned Thessaloniki summit of 2003, which established the European perspective of, uh, of the Western Balkans. And uh, you remember the atmosphere back then. The hopes were high. Sofia was taking the leadership in guiding the Western Balkans toward the European Union. But unfortunately, I was wondering how to, to uh, respond to you and be different from the responses I'd been giving to you while we were meeting officially, you as a high representative and me as a deputy prime minister back then. And I, I don't have new things to say. We are, the situation is status quo. North Macedonia is still waiting. After 21 years since uh, signing its Stabilization Association Council, after 15 years of uh, gaining candidacy status and 13 consecutive positive recommendations of the Commission that we have met all necessary requirements to start the uh, accession process. What is new is that the credibility of EU in North Macedonia has plummeted. The latest poll was showing only 8% trust of Macedonians, of people in North Macedonia in European uh, Union. Albania is waiting as well after doing uh, the painful reforms they underwent. The decoupling is again on the table, this time the other way around. Kosovo waiting for the visa liberalization. In Serbia, for the first time, majority of public opinion is against joining the EU. Bosnia is still waiting for the candidacy status in a very uh, difficult situation. So what has changed? Is there a strategic approach? Is there a strategic leadership of EU for the Western Balkans? I could not say at the moment. What it is new is, unfortunately, the fact that the Russian aggression in Ukraine is backing now the arguments that we've been gi uh, giving and providing to you that EU stalemates is a source of systemic vulnerability for the region. And this vulnerability is due to the, uh, uh, the open files in the, in the region and due to the continuous Russian influence. 
which is hijacking this emotion of frustration which is among our people who are overwhelmingly uh, disappointed due to the lack of predictability and, and uh, strategy uh, ahead. Uh, but uh, regardless, in regard to the Russian aggression in Ukraine, the region was almost unequivocal. I can talk about North Macedonia, which has joined immediately the sanctions of European Union toward Russia, but not only the newly imposed sanctions as a response to the invasion, to the aggression, but also to all restrictive measures from 2014 onwards, thus achieving a 100% alignment rate with common foreign and security policies. And now there are three candidate countries with 100% alignment rate, of course Kosovo is there with uh, the alignment rate, but because of the candidacy status I name them the symbolic trio of 100% in the region which requires a new uh, approach of European Union toward the newly organized, uh, 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 new, newly organized approach of the region uh, toward European Union. We imposed, uh, uh, besides sanctions, uh, provided humanitarian and other uh, support to Ukraine and we opened our doors for U uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees. All these measures are being taken against the backdrop of a negative context within our region and within North Macedonia because of the ambiguity that European Union is showing toward the best Western uh, Balkans. And uh, I believe that this is high time that Europe will take strategic leadership. You mentioned previously what would have been the situation now if there was uh, not a European Union. I would say what would have happened if there was no strategic leadership of EU in 2004 and 2007 when EU integrated Central and Eastern European countries. Imagine EU at this point in time. Will, would there be unity? Would there be security in Europe? And I think that we should learn from that lesson and take that strategic leadership now because we will have the responsibility for the next uh, generations. Uh, I think we don't have to wait for a war to wage as it now in Ukraine to show solidarity, to visit Kiev and to provide a perspective for its European future. We, have, we are having a pending a perspective of the Western Balkans in the last uh, uh, 20, 20 years and I think that for the sake of security and stability in the region it's time to take strategic leadership. The future and the next generation will uh, judge us based on the decisions we make today. Thank you. <laughs> Let me say that I witnessed uh, with my own eyes uh, how much North Macedonia has invested during my term in office at least, but I can say this has continued afterwards uh, into delivering what was uh, on the agenda uh, always. Uh, and, uh, let me join the Commissioner in, uh, in uh, high expectations on uh, negotiations to start soon, as well as for Albania, we'll talk about that later. Let me now move to uh, Kosovo, uh, Donika, for a Minister of the Republic of Kosovo. Here also, I would say, uh, there has um, been some um, frustration for sure on the visa liberalization. I will always remember when I came that time with, at that time, Commissioner Avramopoulos uh, to announce uh, that the decision was taken and then Again, lack of delivery on, uh, um, on the European Union side. Uh, in the meantime, um, difficult, uh, uh, difficult uh, situation in the region again, and uh, your turn to share with us your perspectives on uh, uh, what kind of impact could have on Kosovo and on the future of Kosovo, uh, a lack of progress, or on the other side, consistency on uh, uh, the European Union path of Kosovo. Uh, from, seen from Pristina. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for inviting us to uh, be part of this event. Um, yes, um, Kosovo needs to make progress in the question of visa liberalization and that's something that should simply happen now because there's no explanation at all. Now we have had the elections in France and we hope for a progress in that and we hope that all our par partners and allies in the European Union will um, help uh, moving forward. But visa liberalization is not the European aim of Kosovo. 
the European aim of Kosovo is the full membership in the European Union, and that's what we are working for. So mentioning Kosovo um, different than the other Western Balkan countries on their path to the integration in the European Union uh, should be changed because um, Kosovo will apply this year for the candidacy, we will apply for the membership, and we will see then how serious the European Union will be in um, addressing the, the facts and addressing the challenges that Kosovo has to fulfill to become partner of the European Union. But um, not only wanted to talk about Kosovo, I believe that uh, the European Union uh, should not need a war to understand the importance of um, in not enlarging, I, uh, I agree very much to you, but of integrating one part of Europe inside. And at the same time, the messages uh, sent it to the Western Balkans should be very clear. Uh, we have uh, seen that uh, it needs unity inside the European Union about what uh, the member states want and what they do not want. And one of the main messages should be that no European integration without European values and European principles. That should remain, even if we have now a war which pushes us to, to be more, to accelerate uh, the processes. And yes, I agree very much that it should not uh, sound that technical uh, being part of the European Union, because the European Union is, uh, before it was an economic, um, before it is a very successful economic uh, project, it is a peace project and it is a political project. And the Western Balkans should be part of this political project because it is the project that uh, has uh, decided one and forever that no wars anymore in, uh, inside the European Union and the Western Balkans should become part of that. Now, talking about the recent situation in Kosovo, sitting here, I just got from my chief of staff the information that today again, there have been attacks in the north of, uh, northern part of our country against police. This is not the first, this is not the second, but this is now an approach from uh, different, um, different um, groups uh, who are attacking our police while they are uh, fighting organized crime uh, in, in the country. But yes, the northern part of the country is part of Kosovo as well, and the same they are doing in the northern part of the country. Some of the attacks have, has come from inside the Serbian territory, and this um, sounds for me dangerous in this situation. Um, we are not crying and we are not um, trying to make out of it something big, but the European Union, NATO and other partners and allies should be watching very careful what's happening on the Balkans. Because uh, the 24th of uh, February, as it was said today so often, has changed everything. It's no more possible in the Western Balkans and not in the European Union to sit at the same time uh, between uh, two chairs. For uh, our countries, it has been clear, and Kosovo has shown from day one on which side we are staying, not only uh, improve, uh, Im improving all the sanctions that had been decided from European Union and United States, but at the same time uh, having some uh, different uh, um, measures uh, trying to help and to show our solidarity and admiration for the people of Ukraine. For example, in having 20, up to 20 journalists from Ukraine not only coming and living in Kosovo, but at the same creating for them a workspace from where they can help us understand better what's happening in Ukraine, because um, as everybody knows, the, the, the uh, fake news campaigns and the trolls and bots who are created in the Balkans from Russia and her proxies um, are invading the world and we need to know the truth about what's happening not only in Ukraine. So um, Kosovo um, has decided um, 
on which side we stay and uh, how strong we are committed, not only in European values, not only in becoming as soon as possible part of the European Union and NATO, but we at the same time are working very hard in fulfilling all the criteria for that. But, uh, Mr. Commissioner, it must be clear, once the criteria are fulfilled, then the European Union should act. And that's the lack of uh, credibility. I need to say that in Kosovo we have no frustration with the European Union. Uh, the, the, the recent polls have, have told that in Kosovo 93% of the people are for the European Union and more than 90% are for becoming a full member of NATO and that's uh, what people expect from their government in Kosovo and that's what we are doing every day. But it needs to, to, um, to change uh, the reality and that's why European values, European um, principles, fulfilling criteria, rule of law, uh, stable economies, everything else, but then the European Union should show that they are serious in what they tell us to do uh, and that uh, they are serious in having us inside as soon as possible. Thank you. Monica. Um, moving slightly, but not completely out of the region, um, I would now um, ask uh, uh, his thoughts uh, and reflections on past, present and future, including some possible mistakes of the past and how to avoid them in the present and in the future. Uh, to Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, uh, EU Affairs of the Republic of Turkey, Farouk, which is, by the way, also, I'm very proud of that, uh, an alumnus of the College of Europe, of which I am director today. So, good investments done uh, uh, where, where I am now. And especially, I would like to ask you a question. Um, you know me, I've always been very outspoken, even when I was in office, so now that I'm free, even more so. Is there a time element that needs to be considered when uh, looking at the integration process in the European Union? My impression is that the integration process is a little bit like a bicycle. Either you ride or you fall. And if there is no progress forward, you risk to miss that moment that can then uh, open the way for positive developments. Has there been any lesson learned on the EU-Turkey pattern there? And I guess I know the answer, but I guess that you can elaborate on that better than me. Farouk. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. Yes, I cannot hear myself. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the European Liberals and Bulgarian Liberals, as well as Atlantic Club, to organize this timely event. And uh, also, I would like to thank them to, because they used the right wording the Balkans instead of Western Balkans, uh, which doesn't mean anything, because there is no Eastern Balkans, there is no Southern or Northern Balkans. Turkey, in addition to you know, being a candidate country, uh, is also a Balkan country. So I am, uh, I am really grateful uh, to the organizers you know, for using the right terminology. But I understand you know, why we use uh, the terminology of Western Balkans still to continue to discriminate against Turkey or to push Turkey away from the road where the bicycle should continue. We have the bicycle, Rector. We have the uh, energy to run this bicycle, but the, the problem is our road is quite bumpy and on the road, uh, you know, some artificial bumps are created and this doesn't help. And this, this has been also the case, unfortunately, for uh, Northern Macedonia and also Albania for many years. Why did we have to wait 25 years to have, you know, Northern Macedonia, uh, I mean, to join NATO and to, you know, to start the accession negotiations? So unfortunately, the same goes for Turkey. You know, if, if Turkey had been treated fairly on the accession process, I am sure today Turkey would have already been a strong uh, member of the EU and this would also lead to a better NATO-EU cooperation. And I think this would also create a strong deterrence in Europe against this you know, brutal war uh, against Ukraine. 
And I always claim that if Turkey had been a member of the EU years ago, I think we could have prevented the war in Iraq, you know, the internal war in Syria, and today the war in Ukraine would have been prevented by strong deterrence, which would be created by Turkish membership. But okay, um, I was, as a student of the College of Europe, uh, I was uh, thinking about, you know, saying three things as, you know, as an analytical approach. Uh, the benefits of the integration. First, stability, security and peace. Uh, I mean, this is, this is very important. And also, as the title of this, this meeting clearly indicates, EU integration and EU membership is the strongest antidote to war. And this is important. And unfortunately, we have a lesson today to take. If we had integrated, uh, you know, some of the countries in the region, uh, I think today, uh, you know, this war would not really start. Because I think the other side has clearly seen the divisions within NATO, divisions within the EU, but also lack of better coordination between EU and NATO. And I think this has led, this is one of the main reasons of this war. Um, the second benefit of the integration, of course, is you know, we always say uh, democracy, better democracies, uh, freedoms, and this is important. And for example, when we had a better accession perspective for Turkey, we made all the reforms from 99 up to 2006. And I remember those days, the enlargement commissioner of that time, Mr. Verhegen, used to call this as a silent revolution in Turkey. And that Turkey had met the Copenhagen political criteria. But today, unfortunately, this perspective has been reduced, diminished, and this is not helping those people in Turkey who would like to push for a better democracy, for more reforms. And this is, uh, I think, an important benefit that we have to realize. The third benefit, of course, is you know, social econ and economic welfare. We know that you know, European integration has helped all the countries in the, I mean, uh, join, joining the EU, and it has also helped Turkey. And I remember from 99 up to 2006, we had tripled our GDP, thanks to the EU reforms that we did in order to start the accession negotiations. But again, today, uh, this, this perspective has been, you know, unfortunately reduced, and this is why, uh, you know, we have some, uh, you know, slowing down of, of reforms. So, um, of course, Turkey is too big, too poor, and Muslim. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, really these three issues are specific to Turkey. But we know that these three points will not be, you know, liabilities. They will be assets for the EU. A big Turkey will contribute bigger. And economic Turkey, okay, today maybe our GDP is not you know, that much, but in 2004, Turkey's GDP was bigger than most of the candidate countries of the time. So we can do it easily, and this is not a big issue. And also, having predominantly a Muslim population with a secular understanding, I think is also a big asset for the EU. If the EU really is a club of values, if it is a union of values, we have to have respect for all beliefs in the EU. And I believe that with the Turkish membership, Turkey's outreach in the East, in the Muslim world, will be much better. But also with the Turkish integration, integration of Muslims already in the EU will be much better and we will be able to prevent any radicalization. So this is an important thing. And uh, my um, last point, of course, you know, we know uh, Turkey's size, we know Turkey's difficulties, and we also know the hurdles, unfortunately, created by one, of one or two member states in the EU in this process. But despite this, as my colleague was telling from Kosovo, today, 79% of the, you know, the Turkish nation is in favor of EU membership. 65% of the Turkish nation believes that Turkey can fulfill the membership criteria and can join the EU. So what we need is just equal treatment, but also we need Europeanization of enlargement policy. Please, please, please. The Commissioner Warheli mentioned 
the powers. <coughs> we want the European Commission to, put, to, power, to use full powers. Because unfortunately, the enlargement process after 2004 had been too much nationalized. Of course, we can understand some you know, nationalistic points of some of the member states. But if it is not a vital interest, if it is not in line with the EU's general interest, we should not allow this unanimity rule to block the process. And I think we need their leadership and we need their courage. So uh, that's what I wanted to say to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, Farouk, and uh, let me stress that uh, indeed the European Union is a project based on values, and among these values there's for sure the absolute uh, refusal of any discrimination on the basis of religion or ethnicity or gender or political beliefs, so this should not and never be an issue. Uh, in, in my view, and uh, also according to the treaties, I guess. Uh, now turning to Albania, um, I'll give a floor to the Deputy Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Albania, uh, I think one of the youngest, if not the youngest in the region. Um, we had the pleasure uh, to meet each other already a few months ago, because uh, I have to admit uh, I was very proud to use the College of Europe in Bruges uh, as a stage for gathering most of you. Uh, in that case, we applied the Western Balkans uh, principle, sorry, Farouk. Um, to have a discussion with the students about, uh, uh, indeed, uh, the perspectives of uh, uh, the Future of Europe conference seen from the Western Balkans. And I remember that the students were very impressed by hearing uh, views uh, of a deputy foreign minister that was uh, basically younger than the students themselves. And I think that this tells a lot also about uh, um, the um, impulse that Albania has given uh, to um, renews and, and reforms inside the country. And also here again, as I mentioned, for North Macedonia, I uh, had the privilege of witnessing and following and accompanying while I was in office uh, the, one of the most impressive reforms of the justice system that could possibly be done in the region. And yet here we are still. So please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rector Mogherini. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure seeing you, the commissioner, and of course the colleagues, ministers of, uh, of the region. Um, please firstly allow me to thank the Bulgarian hosts for um, the hospitality, for their excellent organization, and, um, and also for the very relevant time, actually, in which they have chosen to have this dialogue between the EU and our broader region on the benefits of EU integration. Um, I say relevant time because it is a discussion that has assumed a new sense of urgency in the aftermath of Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine. This war has shaken our sense of peace and security. Indeed, it has shaken the very foundations of Europe's security architecture and the international rules-based order. And for us in the Western Balkans, the war has conjured up painful memories from a recent past when our region also offered the world horrible images of ruin and bloodshed like those coming out of Ukraine today. But look at the Western Balkans now. I believe I do not exaggerate when I say that there is no other region in the world where the benefits of EU integration are clear for all to see. Indeed, the Western Balkans are today a showcase of what concerted European and Western engagement can achieve when there is a clear and strategic commitment and focus. The truth is that the Western Balkans managed to leave behind the terrible logic of ethnic wars and begin its transformation from a region that produced more history than it could consume into a region of peace, stability, and cooperation because of the EU integration. The EU offered the region a dream that was powerful enough to replace the calling of history. Moreover, the EU and the West backed this dream with the proper instruments and support that made it tangible and credible. One has but to look at an initiative like the Open Balkan to understand how far the region has come. Only 10, 15 years ago, any Albanian or Serb or North Macedonian politician entertaining such an idea would most probably have been branded a traitor. But here we are today, and despite the emotions it understandably brings up, and despite the hesitation by some in our region, the initiative is slowly becoming a reality. The region, or at least a significant part of the region, has borrowed a page from the history of Europe and the European Union, and is trying to replicate it in the Western Balkans. Uh, would an idea as revolutionary as this initiative have been possible without the EU integration uh, process? I doubt it. 
Now, I focused on this initiative because it is one of the most emblematic symbols of the transformation of the region as a whole. But the list of achievements and advances in all countries in the region is definitely far longer. From democratic standards to institution building, from rule of law to capacity building, from the economy to the environment, from culture to education, most countries in the region have made giant strides towards building modern European cities and societies. The Western Balkans are fully aware and grateful of the benefits of integration. It seems, however, as if the EU itself, or rather a, few, uh, a number of EU member states, have forgotten just how beneficial integration can be, and not just to the Western Balkans, but to the EU itself. In recent years, the EU has lost the focus and strategic approach that made such a difference in transforming the Western Balkans. And instead of being a strategically approached process, integration became hostage to considerations that have nothing to do with the merit-based, transformative and strategic process it was supposed to be. Um, in recent events, we're happy with the victory of Macron in France, but why should a merit-based integration process be conditional upon election results on which we have no bearing and whose results have never been part of our conditionalities? Or if we look at the opening of negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia, which have stalled for the past two years. Just try to imagine just how detrimental an impact that has had on the EU's image and credibility. What makes the situation more concerning is the fact that while the EU has lost its strategic focus, other geopolitical rivals vying for influence in the Western Balkans are very strategic in their approach. For instance, um, Russia and its investment in stoking tensions in the region, or China and its attempts to build economic influence in the region. How can it be that the same EU that just 10 years ago enjoyed unchallenged strategic exclusivity in the Western Balkans, all owed to the benefits of EU integration, is today satisfied with managing rival geopolitical influences in its inner courtyard. We believe that the time has come for the EU to find a new, the strategic impulse that transformed the region in the late 1990s. The integration process must, must once again become credible and tangible for the whole region. Situations like in Bosnia and Herzegovina or Kosovo, with no free movement right in the middle of Europe, are not tenable anymore. And it is high time for Europe to remember the findings of the Amato Commission and act accordingly because the cost of isolation is higher than that of integration. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Indeed, uh, the costs of non-integration are higher than the cost of integration. That's, uh, I think, the core message that should come out of this panel this morning. Uh, I will now turn to Josip, the Deputy for Minister of uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, for a view from uh, Sarajevo or Mostar, if I'm not uh, mistaken, where you are. From Bosnia and Herzegovina. From Bosnia and Herzegovina yeah. as a whole. That's, yes. a, that's a very good way to present it. Yes, of course. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Magherini. And uh, at the very beginning, I would like to thank our organizers, the uh, Atlantic Club and the MEP, Kuchuk Ilhan, to gathering us all. And uh, for us from Bosnia and Herzegovina, being in Sofia, being in Bulgaria, is. Uh, of somewhat very important and close to our heart, because 30 years ago, Bulgaria was first country recognizing the independence of my country and being the flag carrier for the others to try to, by concrete deeds, support expansion of freedom, expansion of all of the values that EU today is built upon. Um, 30 years ago, it, there was a very clear message coming from Bulgaria. I have heard it also this morning, Madam Minister, from you, uh, that uh, Bulgaria is still co uh, continuing to support territorial integrity, sovereignty uh, of uh, my country. But the question is why we are 30 years after proclaimed uh, uh, independence and uh, you know acceptance by the other sovereign country are even talking about the territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina and my country. Um, Multi-layer answer is coming uh, from, from, from this. One of them definitely lies in the cost of uh, not having the enlargement process um, sooner than we are having it, uh, uh, it uh, later, but also a great share of responsibility lies on us within the Bosnia and Herzegovina and the international community that invested for the past three decades in uh, 
uh, my country, uh, and especially after the war and aggression to Bosnia and Herzegovina, conflict that happened there, and Dayton Peace Accord that was 26 years ago. Today we have a two political tendencies, I would say, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which are the predominantly main reason why we are discussing about the territorial or the question of the territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina, even though I think that uh, uh, it's not in the imminent uh, uh, danger, but always have to be careful having in mind what's going on with the devastating Russian aggression to, to, to Ukraine, always to be vigilant, and that's something that uh, uh, we in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, are very serious. First one is a separatist political, I would say, agenda, which is coming from one part of the political club in the Bosnia and Herzegovina. Another one is the, um, the antidote, which is the unitaristic uh, agenda, which is also coming uh, from another part of the uh, political uh, club in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the um, solution for this, or the, let's say, uh, the, 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 the cure for those two opposite political tendencies which are feeding each other would be to respect what brought peace uh, to my country 26 years ago, which is the simple formula from the Dayton Peace Accord. Bosnia and Herzegovina, one country with the two entities and three constant people and other citizens uh, living uh, in the, uh, within, the, within, the, within the country. Um, also, this would you know, stabilize the political situation and keep us um, trying to focus back on what is important for my country, and this is, in first line, regional cooperation and good neighborly relations, and second of all, this is the EU and NATO integra integration on equal footing. Um, I am uh, convinced that um, uh, candidacy status for Bosnia and Herzegovina would give a breeze of fresh air, who said uh, politically, uh, this morning to help that the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, can see the palpable benefit of the integration because after we submitted our application, Madame Mogherini, 2016, you were in office, uh, the no major integration step took in Bosnia and Herzegovina and this is something which is uh, really, um, I would say, uh, concerning that we have to try to meet uh, this uh, integration path from both ways, from Bosnia and Herzegovina side, but also from uh, the EU side. When it comes to the NATO, we are very glad that the open door policy is more vivid, more uh, uh, visual or palpable for us because North Macedonia, uh, Montenegro, our imminent neighboring countries, dear friends, have become the full member states. So. We equally believe that the enlargement, or better say, as you said, the integration policy of the EU would have, in a short period of time, the equal amount of, uh, of uh, success. Because I have my doubts where the European Union can be considered credible in the global geostrategic uh, position if it's not credible in its own kitchen garden. And Balkans? or Western Balkans, as it is the Brussels, or Southeast Europe, that I would personally prefer, uh, what is the uh, denomination of our region, is a kitchen garden of uh, the European Union. And us living in this kitchen garden, we are no less Europeans by social, cultural, religion, or any other background, because we are not only the part of the political or institutionalized, institutionalized Europe. In order to prevent third actors that we are discussing every year on the level of the political consultations between the EU and the Southeast European countries to go deeper or to go wider in the region, we have to put the mouth where, the money where our mouth are. Meaning that the EU for all of us in the region is the biggest biggest trade partner, biggest investment partner. We have no viable alternative than to push towards the uh, European Union because the alternative to the EU membership is the reality in which we are living right now. I personally don't like it and I think that the rest of my colleagues are sharing this, uh, this, uh, this feeling. 
also in the terms of widening the NATO umbrella, Bosnia and Herzegovina is going to take the steps closer in the cooperation uh, towards the, towards the uh, alliance. This is our domestic obligation. This is our domestic uh, uh, will. Uh, and it goes hand in hand with the EU and the NATO uh, uh, future of, uh, of uh, my country. Um, prerequisite for all of this is excellent regional cooperation that we have to put on, uh, on, on, uh, on another level for us. Um, uh, European regional uh, space, something which is uh, um, welcomed and we believe that this uh, as the continuation of the Berlin process should be further developed, giving the opportunity for all of us to go easier, move our businesses, our contacts and everything through, throughout, the, throughout the region. So, um, unfortunately, with the aggression uh, of Russia to Ukraine, this is galvanized again discussion about lost uh, opportunities. Uh, the time is maybe the only asset that we, st that we don't have on our, in our toolbox uh, and we should act now and we should once again put the money where our mouth are and to integrate the entire region to our joint European family. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, uh, last but not least, before we give back the floor to the Commissioner for reactions, uh, uh, we turn to Pogorica, that, uh, by the way, I have always been told is the uh, closest, geographically, closest capital uh, to Rome. So this to give you a sense of uh, geographical distance and how, well, not, no need to do this in Sofia, I guess. Uh, but this to say that even Western Europe is so close to the Balkans uh, uh, that we sometimes don't realize. Uh, so, uh, please, uh, Madam uh, um, Deputy Foreign Minister of Montenegro. Thank you, for your Thank you very much, uh, Rector Mogherini. Yes, it's true uh, regarding Podgorica and Rome. Actually, uh, we in Apart Montenegro... Apart from the Vatican and San Marino, I should, I should well. mention. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. National duty. <laughs> okay, but we feel, we, yes. we feel the same as well from, uh, from Montenegro. Um, I have to admit that uh, 10 years now I've been dealing with European integration of Montenegro that uh, started in 2012 and since the very beginning uh, we felt some kind of crisis. First it was a uh, financial crisis, then economic crisis, then mig migration crisis, then Covid crisis, now we do have real war crisis in, in Europe. None of these crises did not caused by any country that are here today from our region yet. So now it's time to prevent any, any possibility that we will not like it in the future period and that is uh, the main message I would like to send today. Now it's time for European Union and for our partners from European Union countries to make a really bold moves and to do something with the enlargement process. That was actually enlargement was the, maybe the most successful politics of European Union through the time. So uh, now we are uh, dealing with uh, a lot of bad things that uh, we did not, we could not uh, even imagine that could happen in Europe. Uh, we are dealing with war in Ukraine. My heart uh, started missing a bit when I heard a colleague from Kiev, Olha. Uh, she was saying uh, uh, things regarding European integration. She was uh, skipping to, to say anything about war, but we saw the tears in her eyes and I really felt it. Uh, now we have to say uh, that we have to do whatever we can do to, to stop war in Ukraine and to prevent any other things in Europe, in the, in the soil of Europe. No, no, none of us needed that. Uh, the only thing at this stage what Montenegro could do for Ukraine uh, is to uh, continue to accept the, the refugees from, from Ukraine, uh, like we were dealing through history in, in Montenegro. Uh, through the Balkan Wars, we actually had uh, 200,000 refugees in Montenegro. That was one third of our population. Now we do have uh, something around between six and seven hundred, uh, seven 
thousand people from Ukraine in Montenegro. That is again 1% of the uh, whole Montenegrin population. So we can, uh, we can uh, continue with this and of course we can support Ukraine on European uh, path. Uh, we are willing and we are ready to exchange uh, uh, our experience regarding the uh, negotiating process with our Ukraine colleague when time, times come. Regarding Montenegro, I would like to say that uh, membership to the EU does not have alternative. Uh, still in Montenegro, after 10 years, uh, people actually supporting the idea of full-pledged full membership to the EU, uh, between 75 and 80 percent, depending of a pool. So Montenegrin people still believe, and I personally still believe in enlargement policy in uh, our country to become a member of the EU. Uh, now we are aware that uh, a lot of things were happening in the previous period. We are aware that uh, we have to do our homework as well, uh, because we have to deal with a lot of difficult things. Uh, now it's time for rule of law, definitely, and now it's time to unblock the process, uh, European Union uh, negotiating process in Montenegro. We are hoping in next couple of days we will get a new government who are uh, going to deal with uh, unblocking of European integration process. And we are really hoping that from your side it's going to be uh, watched the positive, not negative signals from Montenegro, from all of our countries, because now it's time to, to see and to search for every single positive thing in our countries. It's not time to, to, to search and to see for negative things. If, if we are searching for them, we will find them. Uh, but now it's time for positive things. One of them is definitely common uh, foreign and security policy. Montenegro is 100% aligned with uh, uh, CFSP, and uh, we have no doubt about that uh, uh, when it comes to the sanctions towards Russia as well. Uh, there were no doubt at all. Uh, so we will continue to be aligned 100%. Uh, in, in Montenegro now, a lot of people actually support uh, the, the membership to NATO as well. That was not the case before the war in Ukraine. Uh, we, uh, we do have 10% more uh, supporters to the NATO than it was before the war, so it is one of the uh, crucial signs that uh, future things are really, really important for all of us and the security of the region and security of the whole Europe is really important for all of the people who live in Europe. Now it's really time for us uh, to, to uh, accelerate our path toward European Union and we are not searching definitely for shortcuts, we are just searching for, uh, let's say, merit-based acceleration, at least for the countries who, who have no doubt where, to, where they are belong on, on uh, what part of the civilization they, they belong, actually. Uh, that, that was the main messages uh, from my country uh, to you, to <coughs> European uh, member countries as well, and to the institutions uh, of European Union. And now, at the end, uh, I would like to say at the end that it is indeed a pleasure for me to be today with you, uh, esteemed Madam Minister, uh, esteemed uh, Gergana, colleagues, Your Excellencies, uh, Mr. Karadaya, Dr. Solomon Pesci. Let's, let's, uh, let's not allow to ourselves more mistakes. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> and I think we heard very clear commitment from uh, the region, the broad region. Uh, I think we heard uh, <clears throat> very clear commitment from the President of the European Parliament. Uh, uh, I think we heard clear words from the Minister uh, of Bulgaria here, uh, even if I know um, there are some probably steps that could be usefully taken here in Sofia. And I think we're all, uh, all looking forward to, to unblocking the situation when it concerns the start of the negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania. 
And I think that uh, uh, there could be no better conclusion to this panel. Unfortunately, without time for opening to questions, I'm afraid. Uh, but I think uh, the concluding words uh, uh, go to the Commissioner uh, for final comments. Uh, and uh, please, you have the floor. I try to make it very quick. Um, first of all, for those who are not uh, always familiar with these discussions that we have, um, as I said at the beginning, this is Central and Eastern Europe after all. So we, we first always talk about the negativism. Uh, and uh, you have heard quite a significant amount of frustration uh, for different reasons uh, from, from different corners. But what is, what is very important uh, for me, and this is something that uh, I keep on repeating to our member states who are taking the decisions, is that we have to take every decision we can make. No matter how small it is, and no matter how big it is, but when the time comes and when the conditions are met, we have to take the decisions. And there is no excuse, because if we don't take the decisions, uh, all the negative consequences will haunt us, and not those uh, in the Western Balkans. So I think this is a very powerful message uh, from here. My message to the region uh, back is uh, maybe in the region we talk too much about the process. This IGC, uh, that um, uh, negotiating round, this candidate status, that candidate status, this is not the core issue, I think. Because this will come if there is progress if there is progress on the ground. So if reforms go ahead, uh, without you know, being called upon all the time uh, to deliver this and that, if it is visible enough, be it the rule of law, be it uh, democratic prin principles, be it fight against organized crime, be it uh, fight against corruption, uh, be it economic reforms, be it social reforms, this will reach a critical mass the European Union will not be able to ignore. Uh, the, other, the other interesting message um, I take back is that, um, yes, once criteria are met, European Union should deliver. Uh, but it's not a technical exercise only. It's also a political exercise. Political exercise meaning that it's not enough to convince the Commission. You always have to convince the Member States. And I understand that this is a difficult, sometimes it is a difficult and challenging task, but we are here to help, and maybe this is the part where we need to do even more uh, than before together. Now, of course, this brings me uh, to the comment from Farouk that uh, the enlargement process became too much nationalized. Uh, to some extent, yes, but don't forget that when we introduce the new methodology, we have tried to make it even more objective. But we have put the rule of law reforms front and center. There, there is no discount. No progress in the rule of law gives you no, prog no progress anywhere else. So we need to see a progress uh, there before we can move on uh, elsewhere. Now, uh, finally, um, I fully agree with the message, and I think this should be the concluding remark here, is that we have to work together to avoid any conflict emerging from uh, the Western Balkans. Because uh, it's not only the Western Balkans that will be affected directly, but also Europe, the whole of the continent. Thank you. Thank you. And indeed, uh Thanking all our panelists and excusing myself for not having uh, had the ability of uh, gaining a little bit of more time to open the floor. I think the concluding message indeed is this. Uh, uh, the number one priority for the entire continent of Europe is to prevent further conflicts uh, and uh, hopefully to try and resolve uh, the current ones, starting from uh, the war in Ukraine and the aggression of Russia to Ukraine and indeed uh, still the best uh, way to prevent conflicts, uh, the antidote is the European integration. And my final message uh, to you on the basis of what Commissioner just mentioned is uh, 
to whoever is concerned, use the power you have to avoid regretting mistakes in the future. Thank you very much, and have a good continuation of the forum.
I'm checking the microphone. Prova. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Most difficult session of our conference because it's after the lunch. This is the post lunch session. But uh, we have an important question the EU after the Ukraine war. And we have two distinguished guests absolutely capable to answer one million dollar questions. And uh, uh, that's why. Uh, we hope we'll wake you up after the lunch with this 20 minutes short discussion. Let me introduce, first of all, the guests with the lady. Uh, Mrs. Mylinda Bregu is the Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council, regional organization. Uh, she was Minister of European Integration and Government Spokesperson uh, from uh, 2007 to 2013 in the Cabinet of Albania. She was also the European Integration Committee. Uh, she, was, she has chaired the European Integration Committee of the Albanian Parliament and also chaired the National Council for European Integration. And also another person whom you also know very well, this is Mr. Miroslav Lajcak, is the EU Special Representative for the Belgrade-Pristina uh, Dialogue and uh, other Western Balkan regional issues. Prior to that, he was uh, uh, serving as Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of Slovakia, President uh, to the United Nations General Assembly. He has held several diplomatic posts and also, most importantly, he has been EU High Representative for Referendum in Montenegro and High Representative also for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I think we'll have um, time for one or two short questions after the 18th minute, but now I'll try to begin with the discussion. Uh, Mr. Lajcik, does the, the war make EU enlargement easier or more difficult? Well, the war definitely changed the way the European Union looks at enlargement, in a positive sense, because uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine made the enlargement political again. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, the member states realize that it's not a technical exercise, it's not about ticking boxes, it's really about being part of the family, sharing the values, uh, being part of the solution. Uh, that's one thing. Second, uh, we need the Western Balkans to be with us in, in these uh, difficult times. So that means there is a feeling of urgency, there is a feeling of, uh, of unfulfilled process. But there is always a but. And the but is that in these times, the European Union has no capacity to deal with too many problems because everything is absorbed by Ukrainian problems. So there is no patience for uh, problems or quasi-problems in the Balkans. So we also expect our partners in the Balkans to demonstrate that they are part of the solution, not only to the statements or, or joining the sanctions, but also through the way they are addressing their own problems or they are helping us to help them with their problems. And here, I was a, 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 a bigger optimist a month ago. Uh, right now, I, I, I would dare to say that we might see Ukraine jumping over some of the Western Balkan partners when it comes to the EU integration process. Uh, really? Unfortunately, I do not see much of a change when it comes to uh, the, the rhetoric among the partners in the region. They are saying all the right things when it comes to, to Russia and Ukraine. But when it comes to, when you see the political confrontation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, when you see the lack of progress on, in the normalization between Kosovo and Serbia, when you see uh, the, the, the processes uh, in the region, as if, uh, I mean, the, the Ukraine, Ukraine was not a wake-up call strong enough. And, but the European Union's, I would say, understanding, patience, tolerance, 
is definitely affected by the war in Ukraine. So it's really, you show us you are part of the solution uh, because we really don't want to, to deal with the, with the self-inflicted wounds that you are uh, sometimes causing to yourselves. Yeah, I will <coughs> pose the same question to Mrs. Bregu, uh, but uh, in another way. Do you think the war has, make, has made Western Balkans closer to the EU or further away? Well, uh, I have to say that the Balkans are at unease. If uh, we refer to like uh, the flashbacks of the war, which was like, uh, uh, let's say, the old war that happened uh, not only in the Western Balkans, but let's say the war that was like the previous one before the biggest one with uh, Ukraine, the war in the Balkans, then I would say that the trauma can really inflict some fear and usually when uh, countries and peoples are afraid, they tend to ask for, for solutions to get out of the trauma. In that sense and in that regard, I think that the solidarity that has been shown and the unity from the EU member states, it has always, it has been, uh, let's say at the very first days, a wake up call even for the Western Balkans. Uh, we see that the Western Balkans have uh, all of them voted rightly, if I can use this term, or, or voted greenly uh, whenever the votes happened in the, in the UN Security Council. But on the other hand, we see, and I can confirm what Mr. Lychak said, that the problems that are present in the Western Balkans, some of those, due to the lack of a clear European perspective, are becoming even more daunting and challenging. So are you saying, both of you, that the war made some candidate countries look better than others, more prepared than others? It's not about the war. I mean, we, we know very well that uh, our partners in the Western Balkans are all in uh, different parts or different stage of European integration. Uh, and that's well known because that's well measured. Uh, the, the war, as I said, the broader enlargement, the unfinished business of enlargement of the European Union back to the forefront and the understanding that we may not leave the, the region in the middle, that, that's very clear. Uh, plus what I have been saying for, for many years, that it's not a technical exercise, it's a political process. This, this has become very prominent now. But it will not happen by default. It will not happen, the process will not be completed by, by itself. Believing that thanks to the, the war in Ukraine, all of a sudden you don't have to meet uh, the, the technical criteria, you don't have to, to do everything uh, that the, the procedure requires, would be a big mistake. So this is a momentum. We have a political momentum which will not last long and, it, and, and it will not turn itself into something concrete and tangible by itself. That's my message. Do you think, Mrs. Bregu, that the war was a test which cleared some things which we didn't know before? Uh, in terms of when we are speaking about candidate countries in the Western Balkans. It and cleared mostly, I think, the concept that uh, the process of joining European Union of the EU integration is not only to bring the social, economic development and prosperity in the Western Balkans, but is a matter of security and stability. So it brought at the forefront two main or tandem of words, security and stability. Any time that there is a challenge of security and stability happening in the neighborhood, happening in the Western Balkans, or happening as it's happening now in the Eastern Partnership, so next door to, to EU, that, uh, that uh, shakes the stability as well of the big European Union. So the sense uh, that the security and things that we have been taking for granted for many years uh, might continue like that, it has been shaken. And on the other hand, uh, it as well, I think it, it uh, shook a bit the foreign policy of the EU. Although uh, I see that the moment of crisis is just bringing a new momentum in the EU foreign policy. It's bringing a new momentum as well in, the, in some decisions taken by the NATO members and, uh, and by uh, EU member states as well. When it comes in terms of defense, in terms of, of, uh, of sending arms and weapons to Ukraine or accepting uh, the... Uh, 
candidacy or like, like the, the application for membership of Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova in a moment when, uh, when there is a war in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. So all this, even in terms of foreign policy, it changed a bit the situation and it shaped a bit the moment in, in EU. If this is going to be a tipping moment for the enlargement or the EU integration of the Balkans, this is something that I cannot say. And usually, in foreign policy, uh, these moments of reshaping things take some time, so maybe nothing will happen in a near short time in terms of, of the process in the Western Balkans. Wasn't it security before was supposed to be a NATO thing, right? A NATO issue. Now, suddenly we say that security is also an EU issue, right? And it should have been part of enlargement, if I may say it. Yes, yeah, but uh, yes, the security was taken for granted. And yes, we believe that we can outsource it to NATO and, and the discussion about the European uh, defense autonomy or the, the, the stronger defense policy was seen as something uh, more academic. Now it's very clear that nothing can be taken for granted anymore. And there are, you know, security has many dimensions which we are confronted with, including the, the energy security or food security. So we, we really need to strengthen our uh, security in every dimension and we can no longer take anything for granted. That's also very clear. You said something very interesting just uh, minutes ago uh, about possibly Ukraine jumping over some of the countries of uh, the Western Balkans. Presumably you won't say uh, over whom, right? Uh, but uh, is there this issue Ukraine enlargement versus Western Balkans in enlargement? No, 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 it's not. But if we had this discussion, and I'm speaking really based on my personal uh, analysis and assessments of the situation. If we, first of all, European Union is looking very closely into how to bring U Ukraine closer, right? This issue was not there before, before the war. But there, there are the Western Balkan six, and uh, so that's looking at Ukraine makes you also look at them because they are part of the process for years and they have made an advancement in the process. So a month ago I would say there is no way for Ukraine to jump over the Western Balkans. That means the momentum generated by Ukraine created a momentum for the Western Balkans. But now I would say that if uh, our partners in, in the region believe that it will just happen by itself, that Ukraine will push them uh, into the European Union, it will not happen. So therefore, this is, you have a political momentum which was not there before, but I, I would wish to see a greater understanding that this is the moment to deliver. And we, we know what they have to deliver. And, uh, and uh, it would be a big mistake not to use this momentum, uh, because then the Ukraine might be progressing, and some of the partners in the region might be left behind. I hope this will not happen. So it has like, um, you know, we are, we are just trying now to make, to make like, uh, like the, the analysis of the situation, which is not yet clear for, for half of the world. Nevertheless, the Western Balkans has always been considered of geopolitical priority, first in times when the mandate of the new institutions in Brussels was renewed, and then secondly, in times of crisis, be it economic crisis, be it migration crisis, or be it like this time a war happening in the world and the global war. Uh, it can't continue to be like that. So Western Balkans are not a geopolitical priority any time there is like a, a big crisis happening in the EU. Western Balkans are important because Western Balkans are in the process of alignment or integration with the EU. That started, almo not almost, but 19 years ago exactly. And what Western Balkans is insisting, and what leaders as well, that citizens as well, and everybody, think tankers, were, were hoping, is that this new momentum of crisis in uh, Ukraine, so the war in Ukraine, can really like shift a bit the mindset that the process, as uh, uh, Miro started, cannot be based only on methodologies. And, uh, uh, I am the one who can testify how many methodologies or like uh, uh, action plans uh, or uh, checking boxes a country from Western Balkans has to run through in order to achieve a next step. But this process cannot start, cannot, cannot last for a lifetime. That's why maybe and hopefully the war in Ukraine can bring into the spotlight again the idea that the EU integration of Western Balkans is not a matter of priority and it's not only to the benefit of the region, but as well to the benefit of the European Union. 
Where do you see the main problem in front of this uh, possible enlargement of European Union with the Western Balkans? In the candidate countries, in their preparedness, or in the old members and their preparedness? Who is more adequate? It's a combination, of course, but uh, let be, let's be very honest. The problem is that uh, the European perspective is no longer seen as tangible, as credible. We have move the goalposts, we have come with additional conditions, and uh, uh, I mean the, the, the motivations of our partners is not what it used to be, so they, they no longer believe that we are serious when we are speaking about the European future. And, and uh, of course this is the strongest leverage, this is the strongest motivation. We expect them to, to undertake uh, very difficult European reforms, which you will do if you really believe that at the end uh, the membership comes. So this is, we need to return the credibility of the, of the EU enlargement process and that's on us and I really believe that it will positively impact the performance of our, of our partners. Because the fact is, Melinda mentioned 19 years ago, Thessaloniki summit, uh, the, the, the region was given the promise that they will join the European Union. Since then, only one joined Croatia. and out of the six, only two are part of the formal process. So that, that, that means this, is, this was not the vision that was foreseen 19 years ago. This is not the speed I, I would believe that that was planned back then. So this, this is what needs to change. Where do you see the problem? Well, first I have to say, you are like afraid that we might have a quarrel with each other. <laughs> now, as you see, we are just aligning the messages. Absolutely. <laughs> so I have to quarrel Speaking with you. <laughs> I have to quarrel with you, no, but I'm, so I don't want... For the, yeah, it might <laughs> be, even be a panel or no. speaking about Western Balkans where we have enough quarrels, so I don't think yeah. this is like... Uh, well, I, I already so started, started to, to think, yes, it's, it takes like... It took 19 years. It takes, it is a merit-based process. So in 19 years, we are, all, all of us have been grown up listening, uh, preaching to the to Pope, and then pitching again on the membership of our countries. But then you understand at a certain moment, this is not a process of technical requirements. So all technical requirements, for example, that Kosovo fulfilled, did not give them the visa liberalization. And uh, you know that, that uh, Kosovo is the only country in the Western Balkans where visa liberalization to citizens is not yet offered. Then uh, the whole technical requirements and meeting and considering the process as a merit-based one, so from one step you should move to another one, didn't allow Albania to progress forward in opening the accession talks uh, years ago. But we are like vetoed uh, by, uh, by one of the EU member states. I'm not mentioning uh, which one now. Uh, then the process of meeting the requirements or, uh, or dealing and patching a deal like the PRESPA agreement didn't help North Macedonia not to find out one day another problem with another EU member state as it is uh, Bulgaria. So it means that there are a lot of discrepancies in the process, which from one side, and I have to say, this is the very first time that I'm saying it today, not because it's like we invented it now, but because we are in the process of uh, reading the first data that we uh, take from uh, uh, two instruments, polls, surveys, that we commission as Regional Cooperation Council. And the data for this year, uh, which are still, uh, uh, let's say, under embargo, but I don't think that anybody in here will, uh, will just spell those out. It is the first time after five years that we see that there is a decrease in the level of, uh, uh, let's say, faith that the Western Balkan citizen ha citizens have in the process of EU integration. Uh, and the data might be even shocking for some of the countries of the region. So usually in the last five years, we always had a positive trend every year when the citizens and business community from the region were asked uh, on their level of support. Uh, and if they find the EU integration uh, like uh, a good process, this time, for the first time, we see a decrease. It's still within the margins of the error, but country by country or economy by economy, we see that there is uh, like a sharp, a sharp decrease. Which speaks a lot on the disappointment and frustration that is already seated and present in the Western Balkans. Why? Because problems, as I said, I don't think. The problem that uh, the, the countries of the Western Balkans are not EU member states, are not uh, really building any big wall for citizens to join EU member states one by one. 
are not really prohibiting uh, nurses and doctors from the region to go and find a job in Germany, are just emptying the region. So it means that the country is like joining one by one. The ones who have the chances have like some skills, not only a good diploma, to go live and work in the European Union. So if the process will be stagnating, it will be only a bunch of us, politicians or people being involved in the process that will speak on the process of the EU integration of the Western Balkans. Because the citizens of the Western Balkans, in five years' time, would have joined EU separately. Just with, with one word, do you think this war will make EU, if we see from the perspective of EU, stronger or weaker? Stronger. It, 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 it has made us stronger already, and I really hope it will stay that way. Mrs. Brego? I agree. It has made the EU uh, stronger. And on the other hand, even the actions and decisions taken in the long run should, uh, will, uh, like need, to be, need, to be, need to be notified to make EU the strongest club and union. I refer to like bringing and aligning like it is happening with the decision on, uh, on purchasing of gas uh, uh, to have the Western Balkans on the joint purchase of gas, which speaks a lot on the energy security. Food as well should be one of those. And other uh, policies to face in the Western Balkans into the EU policies. Those two who raise your hands to now will have the chance to put the question. Yeah, like in the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, nobody? Then I will ask the last question myself. This is a threat. This is a threat. Who is against policy of threats? <laughs> One, two, three. We scared the audience. No question. <laughs> we scared them. <laughs> So now, final question on my side. Let's imagine EU in 2025. I don't think it's very far away from now. Can we imagine how it will EU look like and with how many members it will consist? Mr. Lychuk, this is the $1 million question. Same number of members. So 27 members, <laughs> that's, number. yes, but I want to have a clarity about, uh, about what are we going to do with our partners, both to the, uh, to the south and to the east. So that means return credibility of the enlargement process, answer the questions about Ukraine's future and also Georgia and Moldova, but make sure that everybody believes in the process and every, uh, make sure that what is agreed will, will have to be respected by both parties, by, by our future members and by us. Mrs. Brego, how will I will reply the union... by, by two titles of uh, two different songs. One is we don't want to be left outside alone, and the second one is we are close but yet so far and nothing else matters of Metallica. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't expect that we'll finish on a heavy metal tune. You, 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 but, you threat it. <laughs> but it you was because, because of my threat. Uh, thank you very much. I think we were right on time in this 20 minutes. And uh, I uh, thank you very much for your attentive uh, uh, presence. Uh, uh, you were a great audience. Uh, I, uh, and thank you very much for the great speakers. Uh, who were with us just now. And I give you in much, much better hands right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Latic, you are the one. Hello everyone, we are already late with the next session, so if I can invite my panelists to come on stage so we can start on time.
One, two, three, one, two, three. I think you can all hear me. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nafisa Salatic. I'm a news presenter uh, and the host of Across the Balkans show on TRT World. That's a weekly program dedicated to the southeastern Europe. So if you haven't watched it, please do, because we do, do discuss all, the, all these latest developments. Now, before I introduce my outstanding panel, some of them are also online, uh, let me just give you a brief intro to the topic as we are a little bit late um, because of the time. We will be focusing on NATO and EU cooperation in a time of peace and in a time of war. The events that are taking place in Ukraine, as many of my previous speakers uh, of previous speakers of this forum mentioned, uh, have shaken the foundations of the entire international security system. And just today, actually just this mor morning, a Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said he views NATO as being, in essence, engaged in a proxy war with Russia by supplying Kiev with weapons. Now, in this volatile and unstable geopolitical context, the cooperation between NATO and EU is crucial, and we will look into that. How do they complement each other? What have we learned so far from the war in Ukraine? And also, we will pay attention to specifically the Balkans that, as we know, as of uh, recently, is facing uh, several uh, threats to its peace and stability. Now, uh, joining me here on stage, uh, please give him a warm welcome, is Sir Stuart Peach, the UK Special Envoy to the Western Balkans. Previously, Sir Peach was chairman of the military committee of NATO. Mr. Peach, thank you so much for being here with us. With me today also online is um, Elena Poptodorova. She's a founding member of the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria. She's also its vice president. Here on stage with me also Sabina Chudic, member of Parliament of Bosnia, of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and also online, Alper Choshkun, a senior fellow within the Euro program at the Carnegie Endowment of the International Peace in Washington. Sir Peach, great to have you with us. Two Bosnian women on stage with you today. Not uh, an easy task in these challenging <laughs> times. But also your appointment comes in extremely challenging times for the Balkans, Mr. Peach. And with your massive NATO experience, I guess this um, sends a very strong message from the UK to us here uh, in the Balkans too. How would you describe NATO-EU cooperation in the last, since February 24th, since the war started in Ukraine? And if you can briefly comment uh, on the latest Lavrov's warnings to the West. Thank you, and thank you very much for this opportunity uh, for the conference. And of course, we are in the middle of an appalling war in our continent, and we see sights, many of us, that we never thought we'd see again. The whole-scale movement of people, the brutality of the Russian armed forces, 
having launched an illegal war. So we need to take this seriously. Therefore, we need to provide security for the people of this region. The UK is determined to be part of that, and that's the background to my appointment, and also to link to the previous session. Part of this reassurance to the region and security for the region is the Euro-Atlantic journey. And I pick my words carefully, because, of course, we talk about the European Union, but it's also the Euro-Atlantic journey with the links to our North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Both organizations have stepped up to their roles since the illegal war began and have demonstrated both unity of purpose and unity of effort. So, of course, we see that unity and we need to sustain that unity, is my first message. There is always a risk of widening of a conflict or a spillover of a conflict, and we need to make clearer, and I'm sounding a little bit like my friend Miroslav Lajcak, we need to make clearer than ever that across this region we must not allow political disagreements and political difficulties to become the next security problems in the region. And so that's a serious message, and therefore we need organizations that are either treaty-based, such as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the Washington Treaty of 1949 is still relevant today, or our political decisions by member states, as you've just heard from both your previous speakers. I don't accept what Mr. Lavrov said today is accurate, but of course the first casualty of war is the truth. And now we see the information war is not a think tank issue any longer. Misinformation and disinformation is everywhere. It affects people's moods, they see the tragic pictures, but they see different stories. So I think the, 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 the honest answer to your question is I have always believed and I've always lived that NATO-EU cooperation is essential. I think it is now absolutely vital. It should never be competition. There is no friction between the two organizations. As some of you know, and certainly one of you knows very well, I sat as the chair of the military committee and I sat on both the NATO military committee and the European Union military committee for many years, many as the chair, and the cooperation is real. In fact, my, I used to say that my closest military friend as chair of the military committee of North Atlantic Treaty Organization was the chair of the European Union military committee, and that's true. And so the cooperation is vital, the cooperation is essential, and we must not allow the political disagreements in the region to add to Russia's opportunities. Uh, let me bring in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, here, Mr. Peach, before I go to other uh, speakers. Uh, countries facing the, one of the most serious uh, threats to its peace um, since the war. Uh, just recently, Russian ambassador to Bosnia said that if Bosnia one day joins NATO, uh, it will face a serious destiny as Ukraine. This was something that extremely disturbed every single person in Bosnia, including me, um, a Bosnian, um, although living abroad, but still uh, whose life was completely wrecked by the war that we've seen in the 90s. How do you plan, in cooperation with the EU, uh, to move forward to uh, protect uh, peace in Bosnia? Well, as the Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, has made clear many times, it's a sovereign choice of a country to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And nobody has forced any country at any stage of its history to join the NATO alliance. And the same applies to your country, Bosnia-Herzegovina. I absolutely condemn the remarks of the Russian ambassador. I was equally shocked by those remarks. They were obviously, uh, it was obviously a threat and they were very aggressive. The fact is, we need the Bosnia-Herzegovina state institutions to work, including the armed forces, and I'd also make clear to this conference that the, the role of the international forces in Bosnia and Herzegovina, whether they're provided by the European Union, known as the European Union Force, or the NATO headquarters in support, they work together. They work together in harmony to provide a safe and secure environment in your country. And that, it, it seems to, to me, and it seems to my military colleagues, to be more important than ever. I also welcome and warmly endorse the recent decision to increase the size of the European Union force in Bosnia and Herzegovina to provide that strategic reserve to give more flexibility 
to that force. And we will continue to provide that international support, which underpins the safe and secure environment in your country, as does the NATO force in Kosovo, with almost 4,000 soldiers deployed in support of a UN mandate. And so we mustn't forget that there is a strong international presence in the region already, and we must all show willingness to support those forces. Uh, Mr. Joshkun, um, let me bring in you here. What do you see uh, as the main challenge for the NATO-EU cooperation in, in the Balkans at the moment? Can he hear us? Yes. yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please uh, do continue, Mr. Joshkun. Thank you. Greetings to everyone, and thank you for the opportunity. It's very nice to see so many familiar faces, and uh, it's my honor to try and contribute. What I will try and do is obviously to answer your question, but um, talk a little bit about the state of NATO-EU cooperation, uh, I'll dig in a little bit into the dynamics that are inherent to this relationship, uh, talk about cooperation in the Balkans, and then the way ahead uh, in light of the war in Ukraine. And I'll do this in uh, five, maximum six minutes. Uh, let me start with the official verdict and the official account of uh, the state of NATO-EU relations as we see both the European Union and NATO talk about it. Uh, both institutions underline that there has been unprecedented progress in NATO-EU cooperation in the past couple of years. Uh, this is a statement that is endorsed by the NATO and EU councils, and as such, it's obviously noteworthy and uh, quite important. Uh, officially, the EU defines this cooperation as being uh, critical, as does uh, NATO itself. Uh, there's a relatively long history of uh, cooperation uh, between the two institutions. Uh, Sir Stuart Peach, uh, Peach also referred to that, particularly also in the, in the Balkans. Uh, this is a relationship and a cooperation that has incrementally uh, advanced in terms of its institutionalized nature. There's been additional momentum, particularly since 2016, uh, whereby we've seen uh, the practical cooperation widening and deepening. Now, this is all good, and this is mostly the good side of the story, uh, which constitutes the majority, if you will, or the, the, the dominant nature of this relationship. But uh, when we look at the dynamics that are inherent to the relationship, I think the story is deeper. It's a little bit more uh, complex. Uh, again, uh, Sir Peach alluded to this by uh, making the point that there should not be competition between the two institutions. That's quite clear. Uh, there are two undercurrents, in my view, uh, in NATO-EU uh, relations. Uh, the first is the positive one, uh, which is a shared sense of values, common interests. I think the Balkans is a perfect example of this, particularly in light of uh, current challenges. This constitutes a natural basis for cooperation between NATO and the European Union. And then, of course, you have the imp imperfect but significant overlap in, in membership structures between the two institutions. Uh, this adds to the rationale of cooperation between NATO and the European Union, at least in the eyes particularly of countries that are members of both institutions. And this is a number uh, that may increase if Sweden and Finland join NATO as well. But the second undercurrent uh, is potentially negative. Uh, and sometimes it's the elephant in the room. Uh, there is an inherent mutual suspicion uh, and a, an element of sense of rivalry between these two institutions. This is no secret. Uh, and uh, it's something that is mostly unspoken, but it's there. In a 2020 NATO Parliamentary Assembly report on NATO-EU cooperation, um, the paradoxes in the relationship uh, were highlighted, and the dilemma was outlined as how to push uh, European defense capabilities without jeopardizing NATO. And this is a challenge that's been there from the outset. Uh, there have been attempts throughout the years to address uh, this challenge in different ways. The concepts that we heard in the past of, for example, okay. separable but not separate military capabilities is a good example to that, uh, referring to the fact that nations in both institutions have a single set of forces uh, and that NATO and the EU should not be competing uh, for these capabilities. Or the famous three Ds, three Ds that were coined by the late Madeleine Albright, uh, the notion of no decoupling, 
no discrimination and no duplication. Okay, Mr. Josh, could let, uh, I have to bring in uh, other speakers now too. I'll come back to you a little bit later. We are very limited uh, with time. Uh, Ambassador Pompodorova, um, I, I want to bring in Bulgarian perspective here too. We've heard just earlier uh, that uh, the Prime Minister Kirill Petkov will be visiting uh, Ukraine. We've heard the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine saying that Ukraine expects from Bulgaria uh, two things, to support its EU path and secondly the weapons. Do you think um, we will see this happening in the future and how do you think in general NATO and EU cooperated when it, in Bulgaria when it comes to the U Ukra uh, war in Ukraine? I'm not... Uh, I'm unmuted now, I, I believe. Uh, am I? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Good afternoon, um, everybody, Madam Moderator, uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, I do regret not being able um, in the room, uh, uh, to attend in the room, but because of the expediency of some sort, I, I had to be away. So anyway, uh, great to be uh, with that panel today. Um, uh, actually, uh, NATO-EU cooperation uh, is extremely uh, important uh, from a very specific Bulgarian perspective. Um, unfortunately, and I've been uh, witnessing and being part of a, this laborious process over 30 years, many things in my country uh, have been happening and probably will continue to happen uh, on the basis of collective decisions already made um, uh, in Brussels uh, by both the EU and NATO. Um, yes, uh, the whole world already knows of this extremely um, uh, embarrassing situation where um, it is impossible for the uh, political institutions of my country to make a, a clear uh, decision on uh, uh, how best to support uh, Ukraine um, in the Defense Department. Uh, and we're not talking of lethal weapons even, but of uh, defensive weapons. Um, actually, um, the, the, all decisions that were made so far uh, were also part of Bulgaria's uh, kind of uh, involvement in the uh, bigger process, uh, EU and NATO. And this is what needs to be, to be uh, brought uh, to the knowledge of the general public here. I was tempted to, to speak today uh, in my native tongue, and even I had been almost on the verge of a, a, a kind of uh, uh, um, informing you that I will be speaking Bulgarian, although the format does not um, uh, facilitate it, because uh, we have never had the real conversation uh, nationally. Um, it's a very, very delayed uh, conversation on geopolitics, on why and how Bulgaria is in the EU and NATO. Um, and uh, Again, one of the silver linings of this war is that uh, inevitably and, 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 and absolutely urgently the discussion is already on the table and, and it all has to do with Russia's excessive um, and I would say um, many times abusive uh, um, influence and interference in Bulgaria's uh, policy making, be it domestically or internationally. And this has been true for many, many years on end. So uh, again, referring to a silver lining, uh, the stronger the uh, common decision making goes in EU and NATO, uh, that will immediately have its positive reflection on, uh, on, on Bulgaria. Mind you that there is a very strong pressure on the government and on parliament right now internally to finally make the step forward and make this decision. I cannot bet on, on uh, having it at, by the end of this week, but what I'm thinking of, and that also goes for the whole process in Europe, because Europe has awakened itself, uh, uh, that we don't have the time to discuss how Europe has behaved post, not even 2014, but even post 207, uh, neglecting, dismissing rather ingenuously and consciously symptoms which were uh, accumulating one on top of the other. And now finally Europe has awakened. So I don't think there is a way back, to put it briefly. And there is a no way back for Bulgaria either. It won't be easy, it will be controversial, it will be um, laborious, sometimes it won't be pretty, but there is no way okay. back. There is no way back. Uh, Mrs. Chudic, 
what do you expect as a member of parliament of Federation Bosnia and Herzegovina from the international community in this time of crisis? And how serious are the threats uh, that your country is facing at the moment and uh, the growing Russian influence that we are seeing, especially coming from the entity of Republika Srpska, still uh, rejecting joining NATO uh, in any time uh, in the future? Um, thank you. Uh, I've been listening to the speeches carefully the entire morning, and I've been disappointed and disheartened by the sheer fact that we months later are still reverting to the idea that we were shocked by the Russian invasion in Ukraine. And this concept of being shocked by what has happened is actually freeing us from responsibility of recognizing, and I think it's a liberating thought, that we simply failed. We failed as the European Union, as liberals, as individual member states, in recognizing the political reality on the ground, because there is literally nothing shocking about the Russian invasion in Ukraine. If you look at the developments in Western Balkans, if you look at the developments in Ukraine, if you look at the developments in Georgia, if you look at the intelligence offered by NATO, by American counterparts, we literally missed invasion by days, not months, or perhaps even hours, in predicting exactly the scenario. So hearing people today saying we woke up in a different reality, in a different world on the day of the invasion and aggression, I think is a major failure to admit that not only did we fail to see the evidence, we refused to see the evidence. And looking from the Western Balkans perspective, failing to see the evidence uh, goes actually decades back. And let's know, we don't even have to go decades back. Let's go a couple of years back. Don't go decades back. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> so let's not go decades back. We don't have enough time for that. The headline, Sputnik headline, October 20, 2017, not so long ago, five years ago, not decades ago, says, uh, collapse of Bosnia and Herzegovina would not only provide Serbs with the state, but the Serbs with the state, but there are opportunities for Croats as well. Let me remind you of two attempted coups in Montenegro, in northern Macedonia. How exactly is it shocking that after these developments in Western Balkans, the announcement essentially of aggression to Ukraine is happening and, and we wake up in a new reality. We woke up in the exactly the same world that we lived in the day before the aggression, but we, we claim to have woken up in order to abolish ourselves, to free ourselves from the responsibility of not preventing it. So how real are the threats, specifically in Western Balkans? Exceptionally real. Exceptionally real. And this is not because of Ukraine. We are living the same reality from before aggression in Ukraine. Um, when you look at the successionist policies, today somebody said in the panel, and I, I, I don't want to play the blame game and, and name names, but we heard that there was a unified reaction from Western Balkans to, um, to the crisis and war in Ukraine. That is absolutely not true. Two leading parties from Bosnia and Herzegovina, SNSD led by Milorad Dodik, um, and HDZ, led by Dragan Čović, voted against aligning Bosnia and Herzegovina's policy with the EU's policy on Ukraine. So, <laughs> I can't, and, 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 and I think you can't wake up people who are pretending to sleep. If you're pretending to sleep, that there is no crisis, then I can't wake you up. And I said it a couple of days in Hague, many of you probably have small children, or have experience with having small children, if you've ever played hide-and-seek with a small child, there is that time in their life when they think that if they hide themselves, if, if they hide, if they cover their eyes, that you can't see them. If they can't see you, you can't see them. Uh, and that's exactly what the EU is doing right now. If it closes its eyes from its responsibility, then perhaps the problem won't find it. 
um, and the problem will find Sir you. Peach was nodding the head while you were talking about the unified um, mm -hmm. stance coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mr. Sir Peach, Air Marshal Peach, one of the, you were one of the highest authorities in NATO. And now you have to deal with the region where in one of the countries, that is Bosnia, half of the country doesn't accept NATO as an institution. So how do you plan to communicate with these people? I'm here talking about the Republika Srpska entity in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and not just in Bosnia, but uh, those who are against NATO and EU values uh, in the Balkans. Well, the first point to make, and listening to the panel, is, is of course the, the nature of NATO-EU cooperation works on the ground in, in the Balkan region and works extremely well on the ground and provides a safe and secure environment in both Kosovo and Bosnia-Herzegovina. We mustn't forget that. Secondly, it is the choice of the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina to move towards NATO membership if it wishes. It is not a question of entity politics for foreign policy and such high, high um, measures as joining the NATO alliance. And there is a process for that and although there is opposition, as our colleague has brought out, and which we saw after the Ukrainian invasion, the most important message I can offer to our friends from Bosnia and Herzegovina on behalf of the international community is support the state in institutions and make the government work for all the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina and stop this endless division. Now, easier said than done. But now more than ever, we can see the reality. I agree with you. We can see what has happened. We also need the international community to support the state institutions and not negotiate outside of them. So that's, we do that's support, one, we do one support segment them. as well. And of course, the, both the, the Alliance and the European Union support those institutions. European Union through its force and NATO through its support to that, those institutions. And we also support the armed forces because the armed forces of Bosnia and Herzegovina in this case are important as an element of the state and must be supported and not divided. So I reject, we reject, in the international community, any attempt towards secession, which is the, the heart of your intervention. We must reject that, because secession will take us backwards. Uh, Mr. Joshkun, I want to bring in uh, here you again. Uh, how do you think NATO and EU cooperation will change uh, moving forward and following the war in Ukraine? Do you think um, they must do certain changes in the way they approach the Balkans after what we've seen uh, that, uh, that took place in Ukraine? I think the important point to make here is that in reality, on the ground, this cooperation, including in the Balkans, is quite extensive and it's successful. We see that in Bosnia, we see that uh, in Kosovo, uh, and uh, we need to recognize that. An important point was made uh, in terms of the overall implications of the Euro-Atlantic aspirations of countries on security and stability. I think that's also something very important uh, and is of relevance in terms of the contributions that both NATO, NATO and the EU have and continue to make in the region. Supporting the Euro-Atlantic integration aspirations of countries in the region is of critical importance. Clearly, the, the war in Ukraine has demonstrated and added to the value of the importance of NATO-EU cooperation, including in the Balkans. So it will be critical in the days to come to ensure, especially given that NATO is coming with a new strategic concept, the EU has just come out with its strategic compass, to ensure that there is a seamless uh, mode of cooperation, practical and institutionalized between NATO and the EU, uh, according, obviously, to the needs and requests of the countries of the region. I'll leave it at that. Ambassador uh, Poptodorova, uh, do you think the solution for um, these crises that we are seeing in the Balkans is a speedier NATO membership? And can we expect that for certain countries? Um, that's, uh, that's not a yes or no answer. Um, it may not speed it up in technical, in time terms, but it will definitely make it... Uh, irreversible. Um, speaking of proper EU NATO cooperation, uh, I would just like us to remind the audience, because as I said uh, previously, we are also work working for a bigger audience, not just for the pleasure of talking to one another. But let's remind uh, the general audience uh, that uh, EU NATO cooperation was on a literally daily basis ever since the outbreak of uh, 
of the war ever since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And this has uh, a kind of set a, a pattern which is very much likely to continue. Um, since I would really like to offer a glass half full, maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but at least a glass not empty. And this indeed goes, as Mr. Choshkin said, to, to the two upcoming summits at the end of June. Uh, one is the end of the French presidency where President Macron is uh, uh, totally um, invested in, in having the endorsement of the uh, um, uh, of the, of the, um, uh, his, his own kind of uh, uh, idea and, and plan of the strategic compass, but also the Madrid um, uh, summit of NATO, as the Spanish defense minister put it uh, very rightly, uh, in Madrid a new NATO will be born. And that will inevitably also involve uh, um, more, let's say, specific steps on, on, on further enlargement. As I say, it won't happen automatically, uh, but it will definitely uh, have a, it will be better streamlined. Uh, let me tell you one more thing uh, about this strategic compass. I was part of a working uh, group with Globsec, uh, a well-known uh, organization. And I can tell you that starting work on this strategic compass, it was uh, kind of just one of many, one more working group, one more document, very theoretical, very how, uh, kind of self-centered, self self-fulfilling kind of uh, idea. Um, and indeed, February the 24th changed dramatically also the content of the compass itself. Uh, something extremely important, and this is what wants me to bring some more um, kind of uh, to the plates of Europeans. So actually, it is for the first time that Europeans will release a joint threat assessment, which has been kind of methodologically, methodically rather, uh, of avoided for many, many years um, and never endorsed previously. And now it will be endorsed by, by uh, uh, at, at the high level uh, by uh, the uh, uh, head state of, of the union. And this uh, will be a level of political unity and the recognition of threats, which is uh, absolutely uh, uh, indispensable, very, very kind of critical uh, uh, in terms of uh, ma making uh, next decisions and next steps. So. Basically, um, it's a, a, a guarded uh, kind of, uh, even not optimism, but a guarded expectation, uh, if I may phrase it this meanwhile, way. Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, uh, the membership uh, uh, plan Sir Peach, to you wanted to jump in here. I just want to make a brief comment. Of course, the, the subject is essential and vital, as we've agreed. But it's also worth reminding the audience that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is a military alliance. It is threat-led, and it has a proper command and control structure and a planning process. That provides collective security for a billion people in this continent and is underpinned by an internationally agreed treaty. And I think it's that, that sense of strong defense that NATO brings to the continent of Europe, and perhaps we need to make more of that in our public narrative. What I want to bring in uh, now, Sir Peach um, and Sabina, this might be a um, uh, topic for you uh, too. Lately we are seeing that several countries in the region are buying weapons from uh, different um, countries. We are seeing Serbia ordering high quality surface to air missiles from China that has never been tested, turning to other sides too as Russia is not now uh, capable of uh, selling them weapons uh, as before. We are seeing the same thing in Croatia, ordering uh, fighter jets from France, Rafale fighter jets. How concerning is this, um, Sir Peach? And a couple of countries lagging behind, again, like Bosnia and Kosovo in this uh, army race. Well, countries make their own choices on, on def buying mm. weapons, and Serbia is entitled to make those choices. Uh, but it's not, I'm not seeing what you would describe as an arms race. I'm seeing modernization across Europe. And, of course, Russia has embarked on a long modernization program for its own forces, as we see before us in the war in Ukraine. The choices people make in the alliance are required to work together. And that sense of NATO solidarity by having systems that can work together, can interoperate operate together at sea, in the air, and on land is more important than ever. And the, the 
the way in which a force structure, as a military alliance would call it, is brought together with little bits and packages from all around the world is much more difficult than when it's actually conducted through a properly organized and understood process with support from NATO, even though allies make their own choices on equipment. Uh, Sabina, uh, but that's what not, will Bosnia do here? I mean, having in mind it's lagging behind uh, this modernization of the weaponry. When we say countries make their own choices, that's not quite true in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Governments make their own choices. And we have a Russian proxy state or wannabe state operating within Bosnia and Herzegovina. So countries are not making their own choices. Um, and, and in that sense, if we are going to be blind to that issue that we currently in Western Balkans have states that are openly a neutral, and we know what neutrality in the instance of Russian aggression means, and looking at the activities and the malign influence that Russia has been in the Western Balkans region, to leave the region outside of NATO and the EU by saying it's entirely your responsibility because countries, sovereign countries, make their own choices, I think it's literally serving Western Balkan states and particularly Bosnia and Herzegovina on a platter to Putin. Um, so in that sense, and I think it highlights the discrepancy between the statements we hear, because they need to be said, and they were said today, how much we need Western Balkans and how it became a political issue again. Whereas it really, on the ground, it hasn't. Because the negotiation process that's happening and that's led by Brussels, and that's led with, with actually exception of the UK, which has been braver both in Ukraine and in Bosnia and Herzegovina, specifically because it wasn't bogged down by people like Orban, uh, and it and it doesn't play to the, uh, to the kind of appeasement policy that I, that I strongly believe both Brussels and Washington are currently playing in, in the Western Balkans. It feels like, as we said earlier, we woke up in a different reality, as they like to say. But the tanker, the kind of the political thought and the foreign policy and the security agenda towards Western Balkans hasn't moved. We are screaming from the tanker, but the tanker is moving in the same direction that it has been moving in the past months. So in that sense, it's very concerning when we see neighbors arming, not to mention the psychological effect and re-traumatizing effect for Bosnia and seeing Croatia and Serbia arming themselves, and the scenarios in which the United States completely and utterly wrongly sees Vucic as the factor of stability, and in the special congressional hearing say, yes, but he has more military exercises with NATO than he has with Russia. And that's the kind of little threat, thread on which we are hanging in Western Balkans to assume regional stability. If we are shocked by Ukraine, I guarantee you one thing, we will be shocked by Western Balkans as well. Uh, Ambassador Poptodorova, what kind of an impact will the war in Ukraine uh, have on Bulgaria and are there fears that we will be seeing a rising anti-NATO sentiment in the country uh, following the war in Ukraine? Uh, what can we expect in the, couple of, in the next couple of months and weeks? And your, your final thoughts on this topic. Um, you know, it's a funny uh, situation. Uh, a most recent poll is, of, let's say, a couple of weeks ago, uh, gave 63% uh, support for NATO membership. Um, I deep down, deep down, I was fearing that uh, that percentage may have gone down because of a very vocal uh, minority, I would call it, uh, still uh, in Bulgaria that would uh, object uh, government policies, um, especially about the weapons. Support for Ukraine, uh, as uh, already the panel mentioned, is easy. That's verbal, that's uh, declarative. But yes, we all are uh, with the victim. Uh, of course, the important thing is uh, about uh, real, real deeds, real acts. So um, what I think is that there is no risk of uh, kind of challenging NATO membership. At the same time, it will be uh, difficult to sustain it on the popular on the public level, as I say, because of, because of uh, uh, vocal groups and, uh, honestly speaking, Russia-supported political parties. Uh, I remember reading uh, very, just a couple of days ago, 
um, something which uh, uh, a well-known name uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, journalism uh, wrote, M Moises Naim, who's a journalist and writer, and he mentioned the three Ps, which are the big challenge to, to um, de democratic governments and the, dem the democratic world today. This is populism, polarization, and post-truth. And I can tell you that we have all three of these, not just in Bulgaria, everywhere. In Bulgaria, they're strongly fueled by, by, uh, by Russian sources and Russia proxies. So the big challenge is to have the public voice heard um, in terms of uh, Bulgaria's good strategic future. This is why I was saying that the responsibility of uh, organizations like ours that host this event uh, has never been bigger, even uh, uh, more important and more critical than at the time when we were paving the path, when we were building up support for NATO membership. So uh, bottom line, um, no risk um, with regard to Bulgaria's geopolitical orientation, but it will be very hard with every decision to be made, especially when we come to, to specific uh, de decisions, not just weapons to Ukraine, but we will definitely have, as a result of the Madrid summit, decisions for the reinforcement of the Eastern Bank of NATO. We will have decisions made, followed by, by practical uh, steps um, regarding Black Sea security. And then and there, we will need the regional and the European and the transatlantic unity as, as, as strong as never before. Uh, Mr. Chashkun, final thoughts from you on the topic. Yeah, I think um, we're at a critical juncture. Ukraine is clearly uh, an inflection point, including for the Balkans. And uh, it's critically important looking into the future since we're focusing on NATO-EU cooperation here, that both institutions approach the region in a seamless manner. They retain their sense of unity, not only in the face of the war in Ukraine, but also in terms of their approach to uh, the Balkans region. Thank you. Uh, Sabina, Georgia and Mo Moldova swiftly um, sent in applications for the EU membership in the wake of crisis that's being assessed by the EU Commission now. Can something similar be done in Bosnia and would this in some way bring back that trust in the EU and NATO that can solve uh, crisis uh, when it happens? We did it. I mean, the opposition jointly from Republika Srpska and Federation in the times when it was the least publicly popular to cooperate managed to jointly put on the agenda the three remaining pieces of legislation for the EU candidacy status. They are not ethnic-based issues. They are policy that's deeply anti-corruption relating to public procurement, uh, and, and judicial, judicial system reform, and the two parties who rejected it, again, are the same parties who rejected alignment of Bosnia and Herzegovina with the EU policy, which is SNSD and HDZ. And still these parties remain, in the eyes of Brussels and Washington, credible negotiating partners. And in that sense, the messages that the population in Bosnia and Herzegovina gets is, yes, an, According to all the studies and surveys, Bosnians of all ethnic prefixes still put the EU membership as their top number priority. And here we are negotiating and collaborating with the political parties who are voting against this precise legislation that ensures candidacy status. In that sense, Mr. Leitrak is right what he said in the previous panel. The credibility of the EU is falling in the region and something needs to be done about it. Um, the new survey suggests that actually popularity of Russia in Serbia is increasing. It's not even staling, it's not decreasing, but it's increasing in the past two months. Um, and, and I think the, 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 the hesitancy, the hesitancy of the EU to position itself as the partner of Western Balkans with serious conditions and not playing the policy of appeasement, and not feeding into uh, the narratives of ethno-nationalists, which they currently are doing, um, I think would bring a new momentum to the EU accession process and NATO membership of both Bosnia and Herzegovina um, and, and when it comes to EU membership of the neighboring countries. Uh, Sir Peach, um, before I go to final thoughts, 
Uh, I just wanted to say one thing. Your Prime Minister Boris Johnson, as Sabina mentioned, was very vo vocal when it comes to condemning uh, Putin's actions in Ukraine. You, as the UK's special envoy for the Western Balkans, and for the Balkans, uh, I agree that we should be calling it Western Balkans, is the Balkans. Um, how do you plan to fight this rising Russian influence um, and uh, falling, uh, un uh, rising uh, anti-NATO sentiment in the Balkans? Well, I think the polling needs to, to be revealed, and, and, and I'm not sure it's true that across the region support for NATO is falling, but we need the facts to, to rather uh, I was talking about the EU, I'm sorry. The EU... Because uh, I think NATO is actually stepped increasing, up, absolutely. and support for the alliance is very absolutely. strong. What the UK will do is, remember I said earlier, it's the Euro-Atlantic journey. We must also remember the friendship of the United States in this region, the importance of the United States, both in the NATO alliance and in the region more broadly. And the UK, along with the United States and other non-EU partners, will call out Russian bad behavior, will call out and push back against influence. And what I'd, I'd ask for in a panel such as this, at a time like this, we must start to tackle mis- and disinformation and not just keep talking about it in academic settings. We have to get on with this and not allow the Russians to continue to weave their webs of distortions. And I think it's a really serious point because it influences public opinion. It allows the ethno-nationalism that colleagues have made very clear is happening. And the UK will continue to lead in pushing back on that. Okay, thank you all for joining us here today and those of us listening uh, online. Uh, and thank you um, to the organizers for giving us a platform to discuss this extremely important topic for the Balkans uh, in these um, difficult times. Thank you all once again. And I'm sorry if we've been a little bit longer, uh, but I think we managed to finish on time. Thanks again. Thank you, Peter.
Ще сега някой трябва да ни каже, че ще почваме или... Да започваме. Христос Воскресе, добър ден на всички. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for inviting me to be the moderator of this uh, panel on disinformation in the times of a crisis. I think that it well suits the Bulgarian Telegraphic Agency. It is the appropriate agency to moderate uh, this discussion. Our panelists are uh, Vice Admiral Mitko uh, Petev, who is our um, military representative to NATO and EUMC, Mr. Peter Horrocks, uh, former director of BBC World Service Group, Dr. Milos Hodum, Vice President of the European Liberal Forum, Mrs. Tanya Mihailova, who is the director of the Bulgarian Diplomatic Institute with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Uh, Mr. Dimitar Ganev uh, is one of uh, the founders uh, of uh, the leading uh, uh, sociological agencies, uh, Trend Research Center. I still don't know if Dr. Preslav Nakov uh, will be taking part online. So, yes, we can see Dr. Nakov, who is already online. Dr. Nakov uh, is a leading analyst in the area of disinformation, member of the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria. First and foremost, uh, uh, Dr. Nakov works with the Qatar Computing Research Institute. By way of introduction into the topic, let me tell you what my answer to the question is. How can uh, we tackle disinformation? We can counter disinformation only by means of information. The only way to counter fake news is to provide genuine true news. Most of you being liberals, uh, I assume you will be agreeing that uh, one of the silliest thing is is starting to resemble those uh, who are a source of fake news. We shouldn't just uh, be blocking uh, media. However, the uh, real answer is ensure as many sources as possible of uh, genuine, reliable information. What is uh, the definition of reliable information? We, BTA, have long-standing traditions. We have had our rules in place for many decades. The last time we updated them, we once again uh, emphasized uh, on the need to know for sure what our source of information is. When you know that the source of information comes uh, from a place uh, with a lack of democracy, you know that you are hearing a dictator's uh, 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 voice. Sometimes uh, it is worth listening even to the dictator's voice, but knowing that uh, it is a dictator's voice. The second uh, rule, uh, we do not make any assessment. We do not uh, use adjectives. Uh, We uh, don't have uh, the high or low uh, stylistic register. Mm, we, we can use uh, qualifications only for what is more than obvious, such as black and white. Uh, by adhering to these rules, the next important answer, as soon as we have ensured as many information sources as possible, these should be free sources. Europe made a huge mistake. As uh, uh, Europe um, uh, kept uh, uh, locked, so to say, the reliable uh, uh, information from reliable sources, as it was uh, um, information, as it was information with uh, a thief, it. So uh, uh, we BTA 
uh, uh, no longer charge any fees for our information, for our reliable information. The Bulgarian Telegraphic Agency is entirely free of charge. I mean, the information provided is free of charge. We are state-funded, uh, similar to the way in which the Constitutional uh, Court uh, or the Court of Accounts is state-funded. Uh, I'm uh, saying this, I'm emphasizing uh, this. Uh, uh, however, uh, the, our constitutional court is entirely independent, even though it is uh, funded uh, from the national budget. Let me emphasize once again that uh, Mm, we shouldn't be uh, supercilious enough and believe that people are uh, stupid and they cannot uh, make the difference between reliable and unreliable information as long as they know what the sources of information are. Let me uh, say a few words about Balkan cooperation. I think that the Balkan information agencies are well ahead of Balkan policy makers. We have an association. It uh, uh, will have its uh, 30th session this year. It will take place in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is to take over the presidency of that association in September. This is an association of all of the information agencies in the Balkan region. We have had an excellent cooperation. Uh, the uh, priority uh, issue on our agenda is uh, a, a setting up a Balkan newsroom. This will allow us to more easily exchange information. What BTA has already done, we have uh, agreements for direct uh, exchange of news with half of the Balkan countries. Even moreover, it is not just access to information. We uh, exchange a piece of news we have selected from the other agency. Thus, we are able to better judge the news and edit uh, the news. Mm, having too many uh, pieces of news is just uh, similar to censorship. It is like an ocean in which you can get drowned. Hence, uh, the uh, crucial role of media, media help uh, people to find their way in the ocean of news. Now that I have uh, uh, presented the list of uh, our panelists, I kindly ask everybody to use five minutes to start with. And afterwards, we can have the discussion among ourselves. Let us start with Vice Admiral Mitskopetev. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be one of the uh, panelists, one of the highly distinguished panelists. The role of disinformation in a military conflict. Uh, uh, could we have uh, anything more dangerous uh, than a military conflict, which is the largest uh, threat to security? Disinformation has been part of military conflicts for many years. The first date, uh, about this date, uh, uh, 300 years back into 330 years back in the past. Uh, I'm referring to the Gadesh battle uh, in 1272. Pharaoh Ramses II did not win the battle then. Hence, uh, uh, a battle ended on an equal par. In order for the Pharaoh to go back to Egypt, uh, he uh, ordered that disinformation be uh, provided. Uh, the, the first uh, uh, battle in our history documented uh, was a source of disinformation. Later on, this uh, resulted in the first uh, free agreement. Uh, you can see this uh, in uh, the NATO headquarters in the United States, uh, the first uh, uh, longest well-documented uh, uh, treaty. Um, this is, this is uh, indeed a happy case with disinformation. Uh, the very essence of a war um, 
presupposes uh, the disinformation. Uh, a war is not waged by the military because they want to kill people. This is not uh, the goal. A war is a continuation to policy. Uh, in case you cannot achieve something uh, by means of diplomacy or uh, politics, uh, then you end up uh, with an armed conflict. The same with uh, uh, relations among people. Uh, if people uh, do not uh, agree among themselves, uh, they start arguing in a very loud voice. So the idea behind a war is imposing your uh, will on your opponent by military means and uh, uh, you this is the ultimate uh, goal of a war and i think that disinformation is the best in instrument to undermine uh, the capacity of a state uh, to uh, resist so I would say that the way you perceive information is what matters. Hence, disinformation can distort this perception. Mm, a nation, uh, a state, an alliance, uh, that a uh, union that has uh, uh, sufficient uh, uh, capacities for military actions might give up uh, military actions as it perceives itself uh, as being weak. This is the very fundamental of contemporary theory of defense and deterrence. In order to successfully oppose an aggressor, it uh, does not suffice to be stronger. What you have to prove to your opponent is that there, uh, the cost is so high that it does not justify waging a war. What is the evolution of disinformation? Of course, uh, initially, it started by exaggerating one's own capacities uh, and in order to um, increase, you know, to improve uh, the uh, overall uh, capacity. Uh, the, the war between uh, Spain and the uh, uh, US uh, and, and America uh, Pulitzer generated uh, uh, the news about uh, the main vessel in Havana, that this uh, vessel had been sunk, and that was disinformation. Later on, the First World War, dehumanizing the opponent was very important. I'm referring to the uh, Russian uh, bear, uh, the uh, German eagle, uh, the French cock, and so on and so forth. In other words, showing that civilization uh, is opposing uh, the animal nature of uh, the opponent. Uh, the later uh, stage, uh, the Second World War, the two parties involved accusing themselves with respect to um, military, uh, to war crimes, uh, the uh, Nazi uh, pro uh, propaganda and the propaganda uh, on the other side. Uh, we might have another option. Well, we have committed war crimes, but the other party has also committed war crimes, so uh, everybody are to blame. Later on, even uh, a higher level, the war for people's hearts and minds. Uh, this is the way uh, use, this is what Mao Zedong uh, used, uh, namely a non-state uh, force being able to take over the rule of the state. A good example is set by Vietnam. The military victory did not uh, a link to the final uh, victory, but just undermining uh, the capacity to wage a war. And the instrument used was an information war. What is the new development? The new development uh, relates to electronic media. Hence, the impact uh, is immense. Mm very uh, fast uh, spreading of information. This is informa disinformation changing the course uh, of the war. I'm not referring to the Rothschild uh, technique. Uh, 
uh, when they said that uh, Napoleon had won the Waterloo uh, battle. Uh, so they had uh, five days at their uh, disposal. Uh, they caused the collapse of uh, the London uh, uh, Stock Exchange. And this resulted indeed in uh, changing uh, the uh, course of the war. What about uh, NATO's reaction right now on the 13th of uh, uh, April 2002? The concept uh, for developing a toolbox uh, to counter foreign manipulation of information and foreign uh, information manipulation and interference. What was the purpose? The aim was uh, uh, that uh, the actions taken, the measures taken, be restrictive, uh, aimed at uh, preventing uh, the impact of foreign disinformation, the impact with respect uh, to eroding, undermining uh, the trust uh, in European institutions on the one hand. On the other hand, weakening the EU's capacity with respect to its foreign policy. As regards uh, uh, regulatory restrictive uh, measures, uh, it turned out uh, that uh, the uh, UN enjoys uh, substantial uh, uh, support uh, uh, from dictatorship uh, states. Uh, the issue at stake uh, was uh, restricting the freedom of speech. This is uh, uh, the uh, so-called uh, uh, behavior-dependent principle. We have the NATO communication strategy, 2022 strategy. There are three important issues. Uh, firstly, uh, the capacity to assess information using artificial intelligence. Professor Vakov is an expert in this area. And thirdly, Mm, educating young people in tolerance. This is a joint project with UNESCO. Uh, therefore, uh, countering uh, uh, disinformation is also a matter of education. So you had uh, four minutes more at your disposal. We spoke longer than five minutes. Now our next uh, speaker comes uh, from uh, a media institution. Uh, uh, BTA, when I was an intern some 30 years ago, we used uh, your uh, guidance, the guidance issued by BBC Media. What I remember from your uh, manuals uh, is that we shouldn't uh, define in our information uh, whether a person is fights for uh, freedom or is a criminal in case there is uh, an armed conflict in a country. So we shouldn't avo we should avoid such qualifications. We should rather use neutral uh, words, uh, not uh, specific. Uh, uh, words. Uh, we used this terminology during the communist rule in our country, uh, a, a fighter for peace, for example. Uh, do you still apply these standards in your media, in your BBC medium? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, still, uh, I still believe in the importance of impartial and objective information. However, I think the question we have today is whether just doing some good journalism is enough to counter disinformation. Um, so if I may, I'll just reflect on what we have heard so far today. Uh, I was very encouraged that the issue of disinformation was referred to in the previous panels. Um, the foreign minister referred to it. Uh, Sir Stuart Peach referred to it in the last panel. And, that's, and he said, that disinformation is no longer a think tank issue. It's not just an issue for journalists, because disinformation has helped to create the war that we're now facing in Europe. 
So the question I want to address is, what can we do to prevent war? Uh, the Admiral has talked about disinformation in war. I think we should talk about stopping war. Um, so it's encouraging that it's being taken seriously. Um, I remember when, between the country of Bulgaria and the United Kingdom, uh, information war was so serious that a Bulgarian exile journalist was killed on the streets of London because of the reporting and the writing that he was doing, uh, Georgi Markov, in 1978. I think, to be honest, we're back in a time where information wars are as important, or maybe even more important, than they were in that height of the, co of the Cold War. And uh, as an outsider, I hope you won't regard this as impolite, I, I need to be honest about the problems that you face in the Balkans, I including in Bulgaria. Uh, 28, 20 years ago, when Bulgaria joined the EU, the Reporters Without Borders, who produce an annual global index of media freedom, rated Bulgaria as 38th. Last year, that had fallen to 112th. Serbia, a country where disinformation is even more of a problem uh, than it is in Bulgaria, is 93rd. So there is a huge issue of disinformation. And I just want to give one, show one example. This was, this was the headline in a Serbian tabloid newspaper the day after the start of the conflict. And it says, Ukraine attacks Russia. And, of course, there is sympathetic media to Russia in this country. So I think in policy terms, the EU and social media platforms need to think about the information environment and improving the information environment. And it's no longer the era of simple broadcasting when an organization like mine, the BBC World Service, could broadcast shortwave around the world and some people would listen. We have a much more complicated world. So national governments and the EU need to think about independent regulation, absolute independence, independence of the public public broadcaster, uh, training in high editorial standards. The EU must make sure that its, mo that its money that it spends to support media is used to support high-quality media, not to support client newspapers and client broadcasters. Governments using public funds to ensure that the journalism is on, is on their side. That, that must be challenged. And that applies in many countries in the Balkans. But particularly in countries where extremism and the threat of violence is greatest, and this is most true for Serbia, Kosovo, and Republika Srpska within Bosnia-Herzegovina, it is critical that political leaders and those who inflame public opinion through the media, that there are controls. And I hear what you said, Kirill, about the answer to disinformation is good information. I'm not now totally sure of that. I think the social media platforms in particular are playing a dreadful and risky role. That has helped to create the war in Ukraine. We need to make sure that the social media platforms do not create the circumstances for further conflict in the, in the Balkans. And in particular, controlling the speech and reducing or banning the speech of those who deny genocide against laws and who create hatred using uh, violent language. Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, with a new owner, uh, they need to be taking action, and if they do not take action, the EU, governments like my own in the UK, which is introducing legislation, and uh, the United States, 
need to make sure that they're taking, taking, stopping this poisonous information. It's interesting, the United States has sanctioned uh, the owners of the Banyaluka TV station, ATV, but the US social media companies, uh, Facebook in particular, have done nothing to stop a news organization that denies genocide and, and promotes hate. So I want to support more good journalism, objective language, and high standards, and media support programs that do that and that help good journalism. But I believe together we need, as the international community, to take action against disinformation because it's creating real threats to security in this region. Thank you. Four minutes and 57 seconds. Yes, we did have an English speaker. You said uh, a few very important things. Let me highlight two of them. Disinformation is not something that occurs only in war times. It is something that can provoke a war. Media need to be helped, uh, as you have been doing in the UK. As uh, information is an entitlement, it is not uh, a market. There is an extreme liberal uh, uh, attitude, namely uh, the media are similar to a market, uh, a market functioning on the basis of demand and supply. As you mentioned, TikTok, uh, even uh, if uh, you um, stop something in TikTok, my daughter will never end uh, uh, following and uh, watching TikTok. Uh, the only solution is BBC being involved in TikTok, BTA being involved in TikTok. It is not easy to tell a war story in 30 minutes, uh, in 30 seconds, I'm sorry. <coughs> However, we, ha we have to find a way to do this. Our next speaker is Mr. Milos Hodden, Vice President of the European Liberal Forum. You have the floor, Dr. Hodden. Thank you for, for having me in this panel. and. Uh, yeah, th th there's already so many things I would like to uh, comment and, and build on what it has been said already, because w w what you just said is about the wars that are basically provoked by uh, by disinformation. And and I would like to, I think, add one one more thing. I come from Poland, so you know, a country which is uh, w which is which is special because of it, its government, because it's special because of the illiberal regime where, where Poland is, is is heading to, right? And uh, and of course, right now with the war uh, on, uh, in Ukraine, after the attack, Russia's attack on Ukraine, the situation is, is very different. But if we had the same conversation about disinformation a year ago, you know, I, I would tell you the first message would be that in my country, but this is not the only country in Europe, it's not the only country in the European Union, it's not Russia that is the biggest factory of misinformation, fake news. It's actually the government. And it's actually, we, we, we have state-owned TV in Poland, and it's the same about Hungary, that, that could, you know, give you fake news like, like the one you, you, you showed. It's just state-owned TV. It's paid from our taxes, and it's feeding the people every day with manipulation, disinformation, and fake news about everything internally. They're not so much interested in, in external conflict, but they're provoking conflicts that are internal. They are leading to, uh, you know, something that we could call civil war, because they they leave and they can succeed because of the extreme polarization. And this maybe you know, brings me to, 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 to an answer. If, if you ask me, like, what should we do to, to stop this information, to stop this war, this civil war? And uh, I would say we need like, the, the social cohesion, the rebuilding trust within the societies. Because this is, this is a circle. This is a circle that is feeding itself. So we, we have the extreme polarization provoked and, and fed by illiberal regimes, by right populist, uh, writing populist parties who are creating this contact to, contact, uh, content to polarize even more. And because of that, they, they are rising. And you know, this is, like the, the, this is a circle. And if we don't stop it, if we don't stop this circle of, of, of hate, if we don't stop this extreme polarization, this disinformation will be only they, they will be benefited. They, they, they will t take all the benefits. So they, again, I, I mean, right-wing populists, extremists of, of all sorts. And, and this is, there is a huge role of the European Union here, and there is a hu huge role 
again, of, of the member states, but also of, of the European Union. When the European Union is fighting for the rule of law, is fighting for human rights, it's also must, it's also must fight against disinformation, because this is a big part of it. The fact that the countries like Poland, you know, big country in, a, in the center of Europe, basically has this propaganda tube instead of a state-owned TV, it's, it, 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 it making, it's making our democracy vulnerable and weak, and not only our democracy in Poland, but also in Europe. If one, if one of the countries is sick, Europe is sick, European Union is sick, and, and this is something that, that we can observe in, in Poland. So we must do everything, we must first of all understand that media and, and, and the, the state and the status of public media is part of the rule of law, and as Poland and Bulgaria and other countries, you know, we are members of the EU, we must observe the European values, we must observe European laws, and this is part of it. So having a, a healthy media landscape and having a healthy independent uh, state on TV, it, it's a really big and important part of it. And I, I guess my, my time is almost over, so I would just like to add one more thing that I, I, I find extremely crucial in combating mis misinformation, disinformation, hate news, and I think it was mentioned, but I would like to, to comment on it, because it's also connected with illiberal regimes, it's education. It's education, it's media literacy, something that is absent in so many countries in the European Union, something that is absolutely, you know, overseen. Uh, uh, the governments are not interested in providing quality media literacy because they, they are not interested in, in citizens being able to think critically about the, the media they get. And so I, I also think this is a big uh, role of the European Union to, to, to sponsor, to help programs that will make our citizens, young citizens, citizens but not only, media literate and be able to think critically and to analyze critically. Because illiberal governments, and again, I'm talking about my government as an example, but there are more, they are changing curricula in, the, in schools, primary schools, high schools, so that kids do not learn critical thinking. They are more interested in memorizing facts, of course, facts, facts that will raise, raise a new generation of their voters. So, you know, about the great history of Poland, all the conflicts, all the battles we had, this is what matters for them. But what matters for us as liberals, and I think for, uh, us as Europeans, is that these kids, but also adults, they, go, they get quality education, including uh, media literacy education and uh, soft skills and critical thinking. So I think this is, I, I will, I'll finish here. Thank you, Mr. Hodson. You gave a very important answer to the most important way of uh, countering disinformation. You need uh, well-educated people, people who have the knowledge and skills uh, to find their way around in the ocean of information. You said something else which is also very important. As soon as uh, disinformation doesn't come from the media, but those who are in power, what can we uh, do? Um, shall uh, uh, we uh, prohibit uh, the use of a specific uh, name or a specific concept? Uh, uh, what about uh, uh, banning the opposition? The opposition are uh, telling lies all the time, so we're not going to broadcast uh, uh, the uh, statements made by the leader of an opposition party, for example, Mr. Karadaya. We have lived through uh, this, just uh, uh, imposing such bans. Uh, I'm saying this as uh, the choice is not easy at all. Now, our next panelist is Mrs. Uh, Tani Mihailova, Director of the Bulgarian Diplomatic Institute. Esteemed uh, guests and uh, friends, uh, so far, all uh, the speakers um, that uh, uh, presented, and uh, thank you very much to Vice um, Admiral Patov. Um, it is true that um, in the course of the last uh, 60 days, uh, we have uh, witnessed um, the, the, the most unprecedented uh, um, and large-scale uh, military aggression um, in Europe, and it seemed to be completely unexpected. Uh, for us because we believe that in our modern world of uh, international cooperation uh, such war is impossible. However, this war is different uh, from the previous ones because it is um, led, it is waged in a new 
um, environment outside of the conventional areas of land, air, and uh, sea. It is also led in the cyberspace, and uh, it is uh, just as important uh, strategically, and it is just as violent there. And what is at stake is uh, quite a lot, and that is why the experts call this war um, 2.0. If uh, so far the risks um, uh, have uh, been uh, together with the disinformation that have been uh, discussed by think tanks, by um, researchers, and by security experts, I believe that all of us, uh, uh, we have to admit uh, um, that um, we can no longer uh, leave this topic only to the people interested uh, uh, in it, uh, people who are involved in researching the topic. As you know, um, cyberspace is um, a favorable environment um, for all kinds of um, uh, disinformation campaigns, uh, trolls. Um, there are many paid uh, participants uh, in uh, the social media platforms. Uh, and what is really um, concerning is uh, that um, uh, there are all kinds of uh, manipulations uh, that uh, uh, have been used repeatedly. Unfortunately, the Bulgarian society is still vulnerable uh, to hybrid uh, disinformation campaigns, and uh, it seems uh, that uh, we have seen it uh, even stronger um, as of the onset of uh, the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, according uh, to uh, data, 73% of uh, the Bulgarians uh, identify this information as um, uh, a publicly important problem. However, uh, this is a huge difference compared to um, the citizens of other member states. It seems that um, uh, the Bulgarians, they trust much more uh, social media platforms than uh, mainstream media such as uh, um, the Bulgarian National Television, uh, as well as um, uh, the Bulgarian uh, News Agency. And this is something that we should be worried about, uh, because um, the social media um, uh, platforms are the ones uh, that are least for regulated and uh, that uh, yield more, uh, most of all, to disinformation. Now, we know that this is a phenomenon uh, that g goes back uh, to uh, an antiquity. Uh, I'm sure that the state administration is well aware of this fact. Um, I believe that that should be also an issue uh, that is part of um, uh, the national um, security policy, one of the greatest uh, challenges today facing uh, diplomacy um, is actually how to treat um, um, disinformation. This is due to the fact that uh, uh, the Institute of Diplomacy is a training um, institution. We included this um, uh, topic in uh, the agenda for the training of diplomats. Uh, however, what I would like to say is that we have been actively involved uh, with the British um, um, service, communication service, and uh, we um, trained uh, dozens of uh, diplomats and civil servants um, uh, using the resist uh, uh, toolkit. There are several uh, structures in the state administration that are aware of this challenge and that are trying to introduce um, structural changes. Uh, one of uh, uh, them is um, uh, the Ministry of Defense as well as the Ministry of um, uh, E-Governance. Um, also, a new guide uh, will be uh, will enter into force uh, in uh, the Ministry of Foreign uh, um, Affairs, uh, a guide that has uh, been targeted at public uh, um, uh, diplomacy. And now let me go back uh, to the challenge um, that we um, that Solomon Pasi uh, asked us uh, in the morning about the mistakes that we uh, have made. I believe that our choice has um, has been irreversible. We have chosen to be a member of the European Union and uh, NATO, and uh, we should encourage all our allies and partners in the region uh, to follow our example. This is um, our uh, irreversible choice. However, this is uh, not... Uh, something that uh, 
uh, has already been achieved uh, once and for all, um, and we should ensure it uh, um, through education because this is actually the freedom for um, the fight for freedom uh, is um, uh, something that everyone should be engaged in. The, um, Well, diplomats, future diplomats uh, are uh, taught not to be afraid by the media. This is what you uh, teach at the Bulgarian Diplomatic Institute because you should be able to face the media and tell the truth, especially when um, uh, there is an issue um, in one of the country and perhaps um, the behavior that is worst of all is for diplomats to be hiding and to be afraid to speak up. Um, and um, you really do your best in order to um, teach Bulgarian diplomats to be more courageous. Um, Dr. Preslav Nakov. Hello, Dr. Nakov. Let me introduce you once again. You are a disinformation uh, analysis expert. Uh, you work with the Qatar Computing Research Institute. Uh, we, BTA, approach to you with the answer to the question, could we give a mathematical answer to uh, disinformation? Uh, we have a joint project, uh, Sofia University and BTA, namely starting with the virulence uh, namely the capacity for disinformation, for lies to be spread uh, through the news, firstly. Secondly, an answer to this uh, uh, by mathematical means. Is this possible? Uh, thank you for inviting me. Artificial intelligence can be helpful in many ways. Most efforts are focused uh, on whether a certain piece of news is fake or true. So the focus is on whether something is true or false. What uh, journalists uh, need uh, is a different type of tools. I fully agree with you. I agree with what you said that we have to focus on the source. This is what we learned when we started working with journalists. Do, can I trust this source? We cannot uh, verify each and every uh, um, article, each and every report. Uh, um, it is uh, a huge flow of information. According to some research, 50% of some of the very virulent news that takes place in the first five, in the first 10 minutes. This means that we have to be uh, expeditious, we have to be proactive and focus on the source. What do journalists need? I think that what journalists need is the uh, a possibility to uh, check the source. Furthermore, they need to check what, uh, to make sure what should be verified. Uh, verifying the source uh, might take even one or two days, so we shouldn't be wasting much time. Mm, on the other hand, there are many things that have already uh, been uh, verified. Uh, can uh, we... Uh, make sure that some media are providing information for which it is well known that it is not true. Another issue, media literacy. Artificial in intelligence can be helpful in this respect. Uh, we have uh, uh, worked uh, on detecting various propaganda techniques. We uh, have uh, to use people's uh, emotions. Uh, we use about uh, 20 propaganda techniques. Uh, many of th they have different focuses. There are also logical uh, uh, things. Uh, you're either with us uh, or against us. Uh, so uh, there should be no accusations of hypocrisy, for example the mathematical solution. We could uh, formalize many of these things. 
There are two important ones. On the one hand, uh, providing journalists with tools that can uh, help them uh, so there shouldn't be competition between humans and artificial intelligence. Intelli artificial intelligence should be a tool. And media literacy, which has already been mentioned, media literacy is uh, indeed very important. I think uh, that we have to focus on developing tools uh, um, aimed at enhancing media literacy. This is uh, the best uh, medium-term and long-term solution as far as fake news are concerned. Back in 2019, uh, in the month of May, BBC and other media um, reported uh, that Finland had won the war uh, by means of fake news uh, following uh, uh, the uh, invasion of uh, Crimea. Uh, this was followed uh, uh, by a large-scale disinformation campaign. According to research conducted by Open Society Institute in uh, 2019, Uh, the Balkans uh, are ranking very low in terms of uh, media literacy. I dream uh, about uh, getting for fake news uh, into the state of spam. You know what a huge problem spam was some 10 or 20 years ago. It is no longer such an issue as it used to be. So this would be something similar to what uh, Finland claims to have achieved. Thank you, Dr. Nakov. We have to add that uh, AI is uh, uh, one of the tools uh, used for disinformation. Uh, those uh, who produce disinformation make use of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we know that there is a variety of techniques uh, that uh, uh, can be provided uh, that are used by artificial intelligence in this respect. Mm, we have had uh, some rules since March. Uh, uh, these rules uh, do not allow uh, using information unless you have clearly indicated the source of information. There are uh, some exceptions, but these are extraordinary uh, exceptions. I myself uh, have uh, the prerogative uh, to allow using such information. For example, uh, information coming from the European uh, uh, Commission, uh, a source of the European Commission has provided uh, uh, the news, uh, you publish the news, and a couple of days later, it turns out uh, that uh, uh, what has been reported is not quite true. Mm. So the, uh, I uh, think that uh, whenever information is provided either by NATO or the European uh, Union, the source must be clearly indicated. Our last panelist, Mr. Ganev, co-founder of Trend Research Center. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. I have acted as a moderator several times at various fora. I will uh, do my best uh, and uh, uh, stick to the five minutes or even uh, speak for less than five minutes. Let me just focus uh, on uh, a few issues that uh, might be, that might contribute to our discussion. Over recent years, uh, all the indices uh, measuring uh, disinformation have shown an upward trend. This is not surprising. We had an answer from Mrs. Mihailova. Of course, the answer 
uh, relates to the social media, the so-called uh, bubbles. This is not a secret. Let me add a nuance to what has been said. Why do we think that the person receiving information is a victim? I would say that this uh, person is out there seeking uh, fake information. The person doesn't uh, just come upon the information. Being in the social media bubble, uh, you are in a kind of a spiral uh, and uh, you seem to be digging there for uh, arguments in support uh, of uh, uh, your attitude, of your thesis. And sometimes, and very often, uh, you don't uh, perceive the news as uh, fake. Yet another uh, concern, data from our January uh, survey, it is a nationwide survey conducted in uh, mid-January, uh, 1,012 uh, adult respondents, Bulgarian citizens, uh, sources of information, 81% uh, the national TV. The national TV, uh, we know the two uh, national TV channels, 11% uh, 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 press, 10% uh, radio, 30-something percent social media. The access to information from the traditional uh, media is widespread. These, uh, this is the, the old school media. They corroborate uh, the information from uh, several sources. That's what they usually do. Uh, hence, this allows uh, the majority of Bulgarian citizens to have free access to reliable information. However, the youngest respondents uh, uh, pointed to the social media as uh, the predominant source of information. In addition to statistics, let me give you another example. The first war that Bulgarians lost, the war against disinformation, this was vaccination, the vaccination war. For a simple reason, Bulgaria lost the momentum and didn't conduct uh, a strong uh, awareness campaign. Hence, uh, the social media uh, provided lots of uh, conspiracy theories. And many, many people uh, um, more or less approved of the conspiracy theories. It is uh, the youngest uh, Bulgarian citizens that have the lowest vaccination level. Uh, one of the reasons uh, is that uh, uh, their major source of information are the social media. We had uh, two parallel worlds, uh, the world of the mainstream media, the two uh, major uh, national TVs, and uh, uh, the other parallel worlds, the world of uh, mass media. I will end my uh, contribution with this and ask a question. How can we tackle the uh, challenges of what is uh, upcoming? I think that serious challenges are upcoming. I'm referring to the social media. Thank you, Mr. Ganev. You actually outlined very important um, points, um, how to respond, to how to face the social media. Well, perhaps we should not stop them or we should not uh, limit, uh, restrict, uh, put an end uh, to the content. Uh, perhaps uh, we should uh, ju have just as widespread the uh, truth uh, uh, as is um, a widespread the lie in uh, the social media. So whenever I have uh, talked to my counterparts uh, in uh, global agencies, for instance, uh, France Press uh, um, uh, allows uh, only uh, 25 uh, uh, pieces of news to be published from uh, um, the news um, uh, session of France Press, but uh, 
um, the social media online, they do not have um, any limits. So perhaps uh, truth have to, has to be made just as uh, widespread, just as unlimited and unrestricted as is uh, um, the lie. So perhaps this is something that the Western world does not understand because uh, the main focus uh, seems to be on money and not on information as a value. It was also important what you said that um, people who look, um, who want uh, to be um, misinformed, they're actually actively searching for such kind of uh, information. The main um, uh, media channels um, um, in uh, the media announced that. Um, our prime minister is the youngest prime minister ever elected. And I really doubted that piece of information. And um, uh, I checked that he was actually um, the fifth uh, uh, youngest, right? So perhaps we should be um, careful when it comes to using uh, such superlative terms. Uh, so that is why I advise my colleagues to be um, sure that um, um, whenever they want to um, announce news um, um, that something is the best or the worst, it, they should have bulletproof news. So perhaps now is, uh, now is time for discussion. Perhaps um, we can have questions from the floor or uh, let me ask a question. First, we had uh, fake news, but then we started uh, calling them uh, disinformation. Um, as far as I remember, a directive um, was about to be adopted about uh, what uh, a fake news uh, um, a fake news is. So, if we um, try to apply definitions of um, a, a fake pieces of news. So, How um, how would people spread the news that uh, someone uh, um, has reason? So how was that piece of news uh, uh, spread 2,000 years ago? So when people did not want to accept that um, there was another uh, king, another lord, um, um, than such pieces of news about the, um, the rising of Christ, uh, they would have been stopped. So perhaps we should also um, be able to rely on education in order to somehow um, adjust among sources instead of uh, just choosing one source. So let me um, go uh, away from uh, a religious interpretation, um, especially during this first week after Easter. But um, I believe that uh, um, education and the strategic concept of uh, NATO um, actually um, uses uh, uh, Merlin or considers Merlin that is um, um, as a way of uh, fact checking. Now, you would like me to answer on behalf of NATO and the European Union, but I'm just uh, a military uh, representative um, of uh, Bulgaria uh, to NATO and the European Union. So I would not be able to give you uh, the answer. Now, I believe that um, sometimes um, um, the representatives of the military seem to be much more accurate uh, with their definitions. Now it seems that, um, uh, and if we go back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he said that the war starts uh, in people's minds. And if we want to have peace, then we we'll have to change the thinking of people. This information attacks uh, um, human thinking, and that is why 
when we fight against disinformation, we actually fight against wars. So who says uh, um, what information and what disinformation is? So how did you uh, resolve this issue when um, you had it at the, the BBC World Service? A news organization, it's relatively straightforward. You have to train people, you have to teach them to use language in the way that you described at the beginning. I, I don't think it's so much about news organizations, it's more about how the social media companies decide which information is to be promoted or demoted. And in the same way that journalists are taught to think about sources, I think the part of the answer is that the social media companies need to be rating the sources of information so that reliable sources of information are distributed more widely and poor sources of information are distributed less not necessarily banning information, but making sure that it circulates much less. So in a way, the social media companies need to be more like editors. They, ha they, 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 can, they can no longer <coughs> pretend that they're just neutral platforms. If, they're, if, they're, if their algorithms were just very neutral, then they could claim that, but they don't. Their algorithms push content to people to excite their emotions to get them to use the platform for longer, to sell more advertising. So their business model is about driving emotional response, and a lot of that is through inaccurate information. So there has to be legislation, there has to be regulation, and the social media companies need to balance their need to make money with the damaging effects that they are having. And as I say, a lot of that is about them becoming better editorially. And for, in the English language, they're starting to do that. But in places like the Balkans, with many different languages, with complex issues, they need to invest in editorial-type people to help them to make, those, to make those decisions more effectively. Всъщност, от вашите думи може да се извади извода за това колко голямо бъдеще... So it seems... Uh... Uh, that what you say shows the future of uh, mainstream media because the mainstream media seem uh, seem to be able to consider the sources. Uh, uh, they are able to somehow navigate and rank um, uh, different pieces of news and sources. And this is something that social media companies cannot do. Um, I mean, I, cause, because we heard from Poland that there is mainstream media, broadcast media, that is under political control. As I said earlier, there are newspapers, there are some broadcasters across the Balkans that are also politically aligned, and that needs to be dealt with as well. So regulation, the regulator being politically neutral, the public broadcaster serving the public and not the government, and making sure that newspapers under regulation respond to public, pu public needs. But that is important, but the bigger new problem is social media. So that's, that's why I think that's the primary focus now. You mentioned Poland. So who in Poland says what uh, is truth and what is uh, fake uh, information? Difficult question. Uh, you know, Poland is a very re religious country, so there is also <laughs> one additional factor who says <laughs> what's true and what's not. No, but. Uh, but I mean, we were facing the, the, the same the same issues, right? Like, like, like everywhere, who is saying w w what is true? But the, the problem is about those who who know that they are not saying the truth, who know that they are manipulating facts, and they are just using it and, and changing some media outlets into tubes of propaganda, like like in your face. And if you watch public public TV, the TVP, it really looks like North Korea, and I'm not exaggerating. It really looks like like North Korea. The the way. There is absolutely lack of any new ones, like all these messages against the opposition, against the European Union, against Germany, against France, against U.S. Democrats. It's being given like in the style that many dictators all over the world would be, you know, would be proud to to copy. Uh, but uh, maybe let, let me finish with one thing that I find optimistic, actually, 
the data that just uh, I just read the data last last week they are from Poland that they are about disinformation and they are also about the social media platforms so researchers say that this conflict in Ukraine actually is for the first time when they see that average citizens react on disinformation online so this discussion as, as, as we said before it's not anymore among think tanks uh, experts it's not anymore among politicians some of them but actually some part of the society learned the lesson and for the first time researchers observed that actually people react on social media saying why would you share that this okay. is this is not true why would you share a source that is anonymous and stuff and uh, and they are saying this is this is something positive that maybe this terrible war in ukraine that there is one lesson that we, we've learned that's positive is that we learn how to recognize some of this information online Zawata, really? Questions from the audience. Mr. Karadeya. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. I've been listening to this discussion with a huge interest. I want to congratulate you all. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, not only to the panelists, but to everybody participating in the audience. I've been uh, listening very carefully to you. I have a few highlights. These are words uh, that you have used. Information is peace and prosperity. Disinformation is uh, war. We need uh, media literacy. This is one of the tools uh, indicating the source of information. This is a must. All these are really nice things. However, we get into the following situation if we read things in the reverse order. We indicate uh, several sources uh, that uh, quote each other and have been uh, uh, reporting uh, news, uh, the same lies over time. What literacy do we need? Maybe we need artificial intelligence uh, in order to have a proper response. Uh, can we provide a response via AI to the same lie coming from the same people, people who keep quoting each other? I don't know what uh, the solution is. Your comment will be very interesting. I hope that you have understood uh, what I've said. Do you have an answer to the issue raised? I hope, Mr. Karadeya, you didn't mean uh, banning uh, these sources. If we, if uh, the lie didn't exist, uh, how would we know that something is true? If we didn't have the devil, uh, how would uh, we uh, have God? Uh, it takes patience. Sometimes it takes uh, uh, centuries uh, to uh, tackle a lie. There are two important words. Critical thinking. Uh, we, sh we shouldn't uh, always uh, accept things as being true. We need to be critical in our thinking, in our analysis. I'm well familiar with this idea about media literacy. Media literacy is like uh, driving an aircraft. Uh, I bought the aircraft uh, and I need some uh, literacy for uh, being a pilot. However, what if something happens? Uh, uh, what it takes uh, is a well-trained uh, pilot uh, driving the aircraft. 
It is the same with uh, the blue point in uh, Twitter or in Facebook. Twitter and Facebook use this blue point. Uh, thus, you uh, prove that you are Kirill Volchev or Mr. Karade or Tane Mihailov and so on and so forth. You have the blue point. This means evidence uh, proving that it's uh, you and uh, this concerns the source of information. By means of artificial intelligence, as you have rightly pointed out, uh, we can uh, uh, do uh, the uh, fact-checking. This is a fact-checker, and uh, it is artificial intelligence that we can use. Uh, hence, the uh, question uh, who will carry out, uh, who will run uh, the fact-checker, artificial intelligence uh, cannot uh, be the only uh, role. Uh, well, uh, we know what uh, uh, capacity artificial intelligence has. Uh, it doesn't all boil down to media literacy. It is something good, of course. Uh, however, it is similar to medical literacy. If uh, you proceed uh, with uh, Google uh, or Twitter for medical treatment, you are lost indeed. Oh, you, yes, you uh, chose the blue point. Maybe you referred to BTA logo. It, it has the blue color. Uh, it, uh, I think uh, that finding your way around in the media is not like uh, driving a car or riding a bicycle. Mm. Mm. Mr. Ganev, I think that Mr. Passy uh, gave the answer. What criteria will be used uh, with respect to artificial intelligence? Yes, uh, uh, we do have artificial intelligence in uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, AI focused on detecting fake news. Uh, Twitter has uh, uh, been acquired by Elon Musk. But uh, as soon as there is a uh, bot a script uh, uh, detecting uh, fake news, we will have a kind of an Elon Musk who will say this is not the reliable algorithm. I will tell you uh, what the algorithm is because even that person uh, will not provide us with uh, the absolute freedom. Hence, we will end up uh, with a battle of a variety of algorithms uh, trying to convince us uh, that they are the best tools to detect uh, fake news. That was just a hypothesis, an assumption from me. Other statements or issues raised by the audience? On Musk, um, I think his view that information can be just completely free is quite scary. If you think about the issues that this part of the world faces, the idea that you just take controls away, and that's fine, I think that Musk owning Twitter is probably going to accelerate the need for public control of social media platforms and the kind of policies that I was talking about. I think the EU already thinking about this, thinking that Musk's idea that just the answer is just to let everyone say what they want uh, is going to be the moment when social media really starts to come under control. So I think he's paid a lot for something which isn't going to be what he wants it to be. Well, Mr. Uh, Horrocks, uh, in this country, when you speak about uh, control, and this is a country where we don't have any agreement uh, on uh, exercising control over newspapers. We have a national council exercising control over uh, the electronic media, over the radio and the TV. 
what about the press if we add the press and if we add the social media this will take us back to the communist past uh, and our uh, communist leader Todor Zhivkov uh, and uh, the state uh, press committee that the communist party had at that time control is difficult to do the answer isn't no control the answer is to do proper control in the public interest, not in the political interest. And that's about democratic institutions, it's about laws, it's about shared culture. It's difficult to do. But just because it's difficult to do, I think it's a disaster to say, let's not try and control at all. You need regulation, you need properly publicly supported regulation, rather than just throwing up your hands. What happens in, 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 in Bosnia, which we were hearing about earlier, where the threat of violence is so strong. Is the answer just no control? I don't, I don't think it is. It's, it's about the right control. I think we have a crossing point. Back in 2004, when Mr. Percy was still Minister of Foreign Affairs, we copied from uh, your code of conduct uh, uh, and we uh, developed our Bulgarian uh, code of conduct. And uh, this code of uh, codex was indeed useful. The largest media that uh, signed the code were doing their best to observe it. Maybe countries such as Bulgaria, Poland, uh, what we need to do is uh, uh, developing uh, some mechanisms uh, within the regulators uh, um, uh, maybe uh, doing something similar that you have had for many years. The EU has such an important role. So I'm interested in Poland. What, why is the EU allowing the degree of ignoring the principles of free media? Um, so in terms of proper public control rather than political control of the, of the, of the public broadcaster, those are the things which the EU should be helping countries which are still relatively early in the evolution towards a appropriate, responsible media. There is one very interesting text in the penalty code of Bulgaria, which was adopted 2011 as a result of a decision of the European Union. And this article in the penalty code says uh, I don't, don't have it in front of myself, so I cannot uh, quote correctly. Uh, rough, uh, roughly, that uh, who, is, uh, who is advocating Putin today should go to jail uh, between one and five years. This is 419.a. It is... Okay. Well, this is not what the uh, criminal code uh, says. Who is propagating very dangerous things. This is the, the, the text. So uh, we cannot say that this is a, a stopper to, to the freedom. This is a frame of the freedom of the speech. And we had, uh, with uh, my family, we had a problem with uh, one of the Bulgarian televisions. Uh, they sent paparazzi behind us, which happened at a certain moment to become extremely dangerous for the, uh, for the health and even for the life of my wife. And we started, uh, we started, we uh, asked, went to the court, and the court decided in favor of us. And now uh, the, the, the television, uh, well, they paid some, uh, some money, which uh, we, we, were, we were happy to invest in conferences like this. But uh, uh, finally, we need regulations. Freedom is not uh, something like uh, to go to the free market. This is not, uh, the, the freedom of speech is not like the, the freedom of selling eggs. <coughs> it is quite a different thing. If you go to the movie theater and cry, fire, fire, uh, this is not freedom of speech because the, the crowd will kill 100 people because you want to express yourselves and to make a joke. So regulation is something extremely important, uh, even in this sensitive field. And I'm telling this, being one of those who in the 80s was fighting for freedom of speech in Bulgaria. Well, 
maybe this uh, audience might consider your interpretation as uh, dangerous. I will not consent to you being uh, sent uh, to jail. So I will do my best uh, that your voice is heard in our uh, agency, similar to everybody else's voice. Uh, this uh, uh, topic uh, uh, has been on our agenda ever since the morning session. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Uh, we do need uh, such uh, events. Uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, uh, we have often used uh, the word trust. Uh, we're not speaking about uh, trust in policymakers, but trust in everybody. The uh, confidence topic is a huge topic. What I want to say is that our institute, together with the Bulgarian Atlantic Club, together with the liberals, uh, the civil society, and other institutions, we have to continue this uh, dialogue. Uh, it uh, needs a stronger practical focus. Together with our partners, we have conducted uh, a number of trainings. Uh, training as education is needed for all the sectors in our country. So, um, our discussion has lasted uh, longer. Thank you very much. Uh, stay uh, happy. Uh, it is uh, the truth that is always the winner. So we have this uh, lovely week uh, always after Easter. Thank you for being with us.
priateli. Ima oštet na panel. I'm sitting down here and you guys will go to the middle. Okay. Maybe also those who are still in the back, if you, if you want to sit down as well, that would be very kind. Gospodin Zonev. If you want to sit down. Because we are not in a real panel, because we have a slightly different approach to things, not only having a series of statements and then go home, but we have two very distinguished speakers that I still would like to introduce you to. Today we are talking about a new EU perspective for Western Balkans and Eastern Partnership Country, a topic that has been touched upon more than once today, and the factors that influence our region have been discussed many a time, so I will spare you and me repeating that. But there is one thing that I would like to highlight once more again, and that is the Russian influence in both of the regions. Um, there are very interesting studies, especially about Bulgaria, that it is the EU member state with the highest Russian influence in the public sphere. You have an ambassador here in Bulgaria, a Russian ambassador in Bulgaria, with a statement that she is making any other country, she would have been declared persona non grata a long time ago. Um, and I will not quote what she does because I have um, had a mother and a father who taught me better. Um, so here is um, an important emphasis that the fact that the unity of NATO or the, the uh, support of NATO and EU and both of the countries that are being represented here today, being Bosnia and Herzegovina and Georgia, are extremely high still. So we have a representative from both countries with who we will discuss, who will have a short intervention here with you. This panel is um, brought to you by the European Liberal Forum that I still represent as an executive director, um, but it's also and especially co-organized by the Boris Divkovic Foundations from Bosnia, our dear and beloved partner, member and partner in crime, if you will. Because Boris Divkovic Foundation does that one thing and they do it very special. They have a program that's called EU Mentorship where they bring in the experience from EU members and try to transport the message to new and aspiring member countries. And we have also started this program now in the South Caucasus. Um, this ideas of uh, transmission and learning is important for the Board of the Courage Foundation, just as for the European Liberal Forum. So please check out BDF and check out the great work. So let me quickly come to the panelists here to the left. Um, uh, Sabina Kudic, you have seen her before today, um, is um, a member of parliament from Bosnia. She is a former vice president of the uh, Liberal Party of uh, Nasha Stranka, which means our party, as you know, as you can hear, and current president of the party's main board, which is the highest political body in the party. She is also a former professor in political science in international relations at the Sarajevo School of Science and Technology. And with this, I will stop. Otherwise, I will do nothing else but your CV, because it's rather impressive. Also, your debate background. Then, um, we have Ambassador Batu Kutelia here, who is uh, currently a member of the board at the Atlantic Council of Georgia and a Next Generation Leader Fellow at the McCain Institute for International Leadership. He served as a Deputy Secretary of the National Security Council of Georgia. For, uh, Whoop. From 2008 to 2011, he was ambassador extraordinaire um, to the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So, with this little introduction, which is actually quite a long introduction, I will just hand you the floor and just ask you your thoughts on the topic without um, much further ado. What is the new perspective for Western Balkan and Eastern partnership countries, especially with the experience that you have also on both sides of the aisle. Uh -huh. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And, and again, I'm speaking for the second time here, so I feel like I'm already monopolizing, monopolizing the discussion. But I guess we can go a little bit more in depth than we went in, in the previous talks and panels. And uh, not necessarily in the detail, but I would say in, in, in the kind of general picture of, of, and perhaps even a bit of a summary of what we've heard today. Uh, coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, I've been sitting today entire day and listening to the speeches and then I wondered, would Putin, if he was here today with us, be encouraged or discouraged by what we have said and the leadership that we demonstrated and the resolve that we demonstrated or did not demonstrate? And I will not give you, provide you with the answer, because it, it, it may be the pressing one. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I was thinking about in relation, obviously, to Western Balkans and, and the message that I can relay to the citizens when, when asked uh, what, what kind of messages and commitments did we receive in gatherings like this. For those of you who don't know, I will just in three sentences try to summarize the, the kind of the most um, fascinating aspects of our political system. We are now a country of less than three million people according to uh, the estimates, uh, somewhere actually between, some, somewhere around 2.8 million, entire country of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, with the rate of uh, close to 100,000 people leaving annually with this, in this increased phase of emigration. So we are, in a sense, in, in demographics-wise, a disappearing, disappearing country. And why is that so? We have one of the most complex systems in Europe, uh, which was obviously organized through the Dayton Peace Agreement. Illustration, we have 13 ministries, for example, of education for a country of 2.8 million people, uh, and not a single national ministry of education. So to say that we are decentralized country is a severe understatement. And then we have, I would say, four policies relating to Bosnia and Herzegovina. One is official EU policy towards Bosnia and Herzegovina. Then, is, then there is the parallel unofficial but real policy of the EU towards Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is official Bosnia and Herzegovina's policy on the EU accession process and the parallel reality that actually goes against the official policy of Bosnia and Herzegovina on the EU accession. So we have this paradox where majority of Bosnian and Herzegovinians want to join the EU, and uh, that is actually one common denominator, and we don't have many, too many common denominators in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but one strong common denominator is that we wish to join the EU. Um, and at the same time, the EU gives us verbal commitments that they wish Bosnia and Herzegovina to be part of the European family one day. And then, as I said, there are these parallel processes of both Bosnia and Herzegovina um, pretending to wish to join, I mean, official policy, and the EU pretending on the ground that we wish to join, that, that it wishes Bosnia and Herzegovina as a part of it. Um, the reason why I say it so bluntly, and I wouldn't otherwise in a gathering such as this one, is because I think the time is so <laughs> of essence in, in this time that, that there is simply no luxury for white diplomatic gloves in saying certain things. And I say this because of the looming threat, which I think a large part of Europe is unaware, um, and that is Western Balkans falling apart in a sense and being a destabilizing factor, another open front towards Russia. And I don't say this lightly. I genuinely do not say this lightly. Um, when you look at the policies, I will remind you that Milorad Dodik, leader of Bosnian Serbs, flew to Moscow on the 21st of December 2021, met with Mr. Putin. Uh, there are no photos and there is no record from that meeting. There is, no, there is official statement that they met, but there are no official notes from the meeting what had been agreed. Four days after the uh, aggression on Ukraine started, on the 28th of February, uh, Mr. Lavrov calls Mr. Dodik. Uh, of all the things that Mr. Lavrov could be doing in that moment, he calls the Serb leader, and the public statements is made by the Russian embassy in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in which they say that the agreement made on the 21st of December has been, uh, the, the, the conversation was the, about the agreement made, the commitments made between Republika Srpska and, and Russia, and the steps that need to be taken in the following months uh, for the implementation of the agreement made between Republika Srpska and, and Russia. 
So in that sense, specifically Mr. Putin and Lavrov. So in that sense, there, there are reasons for concern. I do believe that the EU uh, did wake up and is, in a sense, and maybe this is a wishful thinking, rediscovering its spine, foreign policy spine, when it comes to Western, Western Balkans. Uh, however, I think it's too slow. And let me give you examples specifically on the ground, and I'll finish with that in the next two minutes. One thing is the election law reform and the constitutional reform that is happening on the ground, and the, the, the negotiations for which um, are now staling but will probably continue. Um, and these negotiations are a clear demonstration that the EU is not connecting the dots, what I just said about Russian influence in Western Balkans, and relating that to supporting the progressive forces, liberal forces in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but is doing the exact opposite, appeasing those that they cannot formally and openly appease because of the public sentiment in Ukraine, um, and is actually doing that in Western Balkans. Namely, for example, the European Union in Bosnia and Herzegovina has spent hundreds of thousands of euros on something called citizen assembly, where they asked citizens to provide solutions for and recommendations for the constitutional reform. They organized a beautiful press conference where they presented it, and these solutions are completely over 98% in line with the official recommendations that the Nasha Stranka, my political party, has put in the parliamentary procedure, for which both the EU and the United States have said that it's not the time because they are not realistic and went back to negotiating with the extreme nationalists. So they did the same thing, organized a beautiful press conference in which they said, here are the citizens, here is our project called Citizen Assembly. These are their proposals. Uh, here is a cocktail party relating to that. And now we go back to negotiating with the nationalists and asking them what they need and caving into their pressures. So there are parallel policies. And what I'm asking you to simply consider, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I will conclude with this, does not have to be the exporter of problems. We can be the exporters of solutions. And there is plenty enough, and if you look at even, and this is of course the fault of the opposition as well, having a kind of fragmented opposition, but when you look at the number of votes, more citizens in Bosnia and Herzegovina want a functional, modern, liberal Bosnia and Herzegovina that they want backward Bosnia and Herzegovina tied to the interest of China and Russia. What we are failing to see is that these liberal voices need support, need, need recognition, and need legitimacy provided by the foreign factors, by the international community, and bringing them to the negotiating table and making sure that these voices are at least respected as much as the nationalist voices in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and providing also a viable perspective for the liberal, progressive Bosnia and Herzegovina, and not only the reflection of the Russian uh, proxy uh, wannabe state on the ground. So what I'm asking you is simply to recognize the reality that there is enough in Bosnia and Herzegovina to orient it normatively, politically, security-wise towards Brussels, uh, as opposed to horrible Chinese loans that we are taking, uh, Russian proxy interest, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. <laughs> I, I'm very tempted to make some analogies of, uh, about wasting taxpayers' money for having citizen consultations in Europe at the moment, like a conference on the future of Europe that also will come with results where everybody will say, yeah, but that's not realistic, let's do something else, but let's have a cocktail party first. Exactly. Uh, and let me just remind you of the, of the new Ipsos survey that came out on the 19th of April. Uh, this year, so means just a couple of days ago, which actually shows that 26 out of 27 European Union countries, only Hungary being the exception, wish to see a greater both normative, political and economic stand against Russia in relation to Ukraine. And look what's happening in Germany. Actually, the government is decreasing in popularity. Uh, their popularity is decreasing. Why? Because for the first time, we actually don't have in Europe leaders any longer. Not only are they not leading, they're not even following the citizens. Um, and, and this discrepancy may be particularly, I would say, dangerous, but also opportune for European liberals. 
uh, to kind of rediscover what it means to lead in the time of crisis, to inspire normatively, politically, and in any other political aspect. When you talked, I was inspired for, for a little something to make a transition. You said something about a rediscovery of the foreign policy spine. Um, looking at 2008 and 2014, um, I might question that there is a spine, um, especially with the uh, Russian intervention first in Georgia and then Crimea and um, the proxy war that we have seen afterwards. Um, Georgia has been a country that has been pushing a lot for reforms that have been stalled every once in a while by outside interference. Um, Ambassador, if you, if you will, give your perspective from a not classically um, candidate country, but a country that aspires being part of the European, liberal, uh, of the European family. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor here to be here with you uh, and discuss I think the key question uh, of our common future. So uh, uh, when uh, uh, the war against Ukraine started, uh, a lot has changed in the world. So it is a, a milestone which really will be decisive uh, where the world will go and what will be European world order look like. I remember uh, before this war, every academic paper or even speeches uh, we are, uh, started with this common phrase, when the so uh, Soviet Union collapsed, and then all the description. So I'm pretty sure that uh, after this war will end, uh, there will be the common mantra saying, when Russia was defeated, uh, when it started war against Ukraine, and then. So what will be then, that largely depends everyday decisions we are making during this crisis as well. So I would like to pick on the uh, world that uh, uh, was uh, mentioned, uh, in, uh, inspiration. I think uh, democracy needs to inspire more rather than discourage. And this is what is missing, because I remember when Soviet Union dissolved, that was a very inspiring momentum. And uh, our generation joined politics, public service, because of this inspiration. And, uh, and joining EU and the NATO was an inspiration that really drew a lot of uh, uh, processes within our country and globally as well. And uh, one of the biggest and the greatest idea at that time uh, was the idea of Europe, whole, free, end, and peace. Unfortunately, this is an unfinished job. This job has stopped uh, as an unfinished job at the doors of the Ukraine uh, and Georgia at that time. When in NATO Bucharest summit, NATO really made a strategic mistake not to expand membership action plan to Ukraine and Georgia, though made the promise that they will become a NATO member country. That is the momentum which followed Putin's famous 2007 speech about his vision of the new world order and undermining liberal democracy as an obsolete form of governance or a political system. It was quite obvious that we were moving in that direction. And uh, step by step, then, we saw the consequences. Uh, it was initially as a shock, uh, Putin's speech in Munich, but as every shocking statement, it has some follow-up stages, as we all know. Uh, and first is denial, then the anger, then, you know, bargaining, then depression, and then the acceptance. So I hope that now we are at the stage of acceptance. We have to accept that Russia, as we knew before, will never stay. Russia, with the Putin's regime, lost its legitimacy as a state. And as long this continues, as many civilian casualties this war will take, the more uh, high probable is that we have to deal with this problem and not to try to contain it or modernize it. And one, another unfinished job, unfortunately, but was also to maintain uh, former Soviet Union, notwithstanding it has been dissolved, as a system and to save it for a greater security because of nuclear balance, etc. But the uh, system that the Soviet Union was standing on really regenerated the Putin's regime now. So I think system, a systematic approach to this problem will be very important. And uh, uh, for Georgia, again, Georgia is still inspired uh, with the uh, NATO and EU membership. Uh, it, it is inspired because uh, we have no other alternative. So uh, we often been asked, what is your plan B? The good thing is that we don't have plan B. 
because Plan B is becoming a part of Russia. Unfortunately, since the 2008 war, which was the first visible demonstration of Putin uh, reshaping or uh, adjusting the world order according to his perverted version of the history, uh, was Russian invasion in Georgia. But after invasion, Georgia maintained to keep its statehood and maintained the public trust uh, and the public opinion still in favor of the uh, European and Euro-Atlantic integration. The problem is that uh, Russian propaganda or Russian hybrid warfare that uh, really got a more and more dimension starting from the uh, information, economy, business has been used largely for a state capture. Even this uh, hybrid warfare adjusted quite well with the technical criteria of the EU and NATO. Particularly the EU technical uh, conditionalities has been successfully used to cover up the state capture which is happening. And Georgia is more in different degrees in various countries, but still Georgia unfortunately became a uh, victim of that type of state capture because Unfortunately, but again, we have an informal ruler, Russian uh, billionaire with the dubious origin of money, influencing political and economic decision making. And again, we have a people of Georgia who strongly support Ukrainian in absolute majority with all public opinions and even public demonstrations on the street. And we have a government who tries to uh, serve Russian interests even when the Russia is under the severe sanctions. So this type of uh, uh, condition of or state of the European perspective is not something that we were aspiring. Another problem is that that is linked and why inspiration has been lost is that political process, unfortunately, but has been substituted by the bureaucratic process. Bureaucracy is essential to drive things uh, or implement things but first should be a political idea, and then will to implement this idea. So I think, uh, again, this uh, momentum is unfortunate, but still it takes a lot of innocent human lives for the world to uh, reshape its approach and also to uh, admit, accept the problem as it is, because I have no illusion that the Western power, power of unity, power of liberal democratic order, is uh, supreme than any authoritarian alliances that Putin can uh, assemble around. And another important point, and I will stop here, uh, throughout the European history, we've seen an important role of the personal leadership and also leadership of the United States in terms of pushing forward the uh, European idea of Euro-Atlanticism. Again, the Europe whole and free and end peace. And security here has a key dimension, and all the EU member countries, since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, first became NATO member countries and then became an EU member country. And it has a reason why, and I think uh, with the current state of uh, Balkan countries and the Eastern Partnership countries aspiring to join EU and NATO, this process is parallel, but some of the countries who are the NATO member countries already have to join the EU and who are not member countries but aspiring NATO, they have to, in an accelerated manner, accept it to the NATO. This is the only recipe of the long-lasting peace and security. And plus one, the strong lessons learned after this last 14 years, even before, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, unjust peace never brings uh, lasting peace. And we've seen quasi-formats uh, of solving uh, conflicts, where uh, the part of the conflict being given the role of a moderator, like Russia was part of the uh, peacekeeping operation in Georgia, or Russia was a mediator in the Minsk agreement, it generated much more graver problems. So it's time to learn from the lessons and move forward with a decisive political will ahead. Thank you very much. Well, let's also not forget the 14th Russian army that is a peacekeeper in Moldova. Yes. And where we see an unfortunate um, risk at the moment that um, there might be the, the urge to reunify um, the, the Russian armies via land in Ukraine at the moment. There, there's one thing that I found very interesting and in that you mentioned, that it was the matter of alternatives. Alternatives are something that unfortunately, due to the lack of a proper path to becoming a member of the European Union, have manifested in the Western Balkans especially. Republika Srpska was already mentioned. If you look at the um, support for EU membership, how that has been dwindling, how much money has been flowing in 
from Russia and China, the Chinese money that has been flowing into Ukraine, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Hungary um, uh, uh, for, for a very long time. 16, 17, 16 plus one, however it is called right now. I would like to remind you what happened even in Bulgaria right after the EU president, council presidency was over. You remember that? There was the 16 plus one summit. So EU went out, China went in. And I think there is a symbol that has been not analyzed enough. And so I mean, you have been talking about, or we have actually on the side of this, been talking about look, the consequences of this lack of perspective. Not necessarily in your country, but can you give us a little bit of a snapshot what this vacuum of perspective has brought also in a regional security and cohesion perspective? Um, I'll start by saying that I think there is always an alternative. Even status quo is an alternative to that process. And uh, when we think about Bosnia and Herzegovina or the region, we always think in terms of things getting significantly better or things getting significantly worse. But it's actually a continuation of status quo that many are seeking as a destabilizing factor. And this is, uh, it's hard from one paradigm of how we understand security and influence to imagine what does Russia want because the behavior is not necessarily in all its aspects perfectly rational. Um, so certain pro-Russian forces or pro-Russian sentiment that exists in Western Balkans, they just imagine it, aha, uh -huh, instead of American cultural center, there will be a Russian cultural center. <laughs> but that's not the case. When you look at the writings in Russia in the past 10 years, they very much are in favor of status quo in, in Western Balkans because simply preserving, locking the, the states in this, in this limbo between the, there is some idea of the EU session process, but it's not really, doesn't seem particularly realistic, which opens the doors for informal, but without full responsibility, uh, influence of Russia and China. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Milorad Dodik are a low-cost investment, zero-risk investment for, for Mr. Putin. Because it doesn't require a significant amount of money, it doesn't require a sending army. You simply need to preserve the status quo in stability to have an, at least an idea of a proxy state in Western Balkans. So status quo is an alternative, unfortunately. And when there is no viable option, I think the numbers show that the, the support is at least stagnating for the European Union. Uh, it's not increasing, so the, senti the momentum is no longer perhaps there. And here is an opportunity for a momentum are we using it, is the question. Um, and here is what happened in the past years of, of this vacuum. Vacuum doesn't, doesn't stay unfilled for a long time. Water finds ways to seep into, into holes. And, and looking at, for example, uh, my parliament, Nasha Stranka is the only party out of 98 of us in the federal parliament of Bosnia and Herzegovina who didn't vote for a close to billion euro a uh, loan, Chinese loan, for a coal-operated thermal plant in Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina that had been voted 100% state, uh, state guarantee and a state aid against the, what we have signed with the, with the uh, European energy community. And so in, in that sense, we are in a situation where um, Chinese embassy openly called parties, political parties, to, to push for the Chinese for the Chinese loan, which by the way never had happened, I mean it was voted, and then China could no longer provide the, the turbines made by General Motors that were stipulated in the contract, and we have already lost about 150 million euros on the preparatory works that are now going nowhere. So in that sense, uh, the vacuum is being, being filled. It's already the sentiment is seeping that the Chinese and Russian money doesn't come with such administrative burden, and that it's an tab. easier money, that it hasn't have many conditions attached, um, and so on and so forth. And there is, this, uh, there, there is this sentiment that you can at the same time uh, 
A, what, of, uh, what aboutism, but B, neutrality as a residue of maybe even Yugoslavian attitudes that made Yugoslavia so great. So increasingly, not only are people talking about pro-Russian, but simply not being pro-anyone, which actually means being pro-Russian, because if you're pro-status quo and pro-neutrality, that means that this instability is something that's a goal in, its, in itself. Um, and, and it's hard to explain that to people who, both in Brussels and Washington, who also there are streams of thought that favor status quo. And when you look at the open Balkan policies and all these ways that the Balkans is supposed to kind of stay on the outskirts of European Union, but within the reach and stable enough that it doesn't cause a security problem. But that's a distant dream. That's, a, that's, a, that's an impossible dream, I would say. It's a security dream that's not going to materialize. Yeah. There, there has been for a very long time the saying of keeping a lid on it. And exactly. I think that sums it up perfectly, exactly. the European approach to the Western Balkans. Exactly. Um, Ambassador, you have been mentioning the issue of security, and I would like to elaborate just a little bit more on that. Just before I give, in case anybody of you has a comment or a question, just please wave your hand and, um, and I can give you the floor. Um, there is this joke that we have all seen that Vladimir Putin knocks on a door and says, um, uh, uh, ask, ask, why do you want a NATO? Um, uh, who, why? Because I want protection, protection from you. Um, he, is, he is the one knocking on the doors, threatening people not to join NATO because they are afraid that he knocks on the door, quite literally. So having, having that in mind, having the, the, the Georgian experience in mind, having in mind the fact that also some of the EU members are not NATO members, mm -hmm. like Austria, like Sweden, like Finland, is the EU, considering Mr. Putin's very strange narrative that he has been presenting as a general security threat, would an EU membership in the midterm be something that could substitute the uh, Georgia's urge to join NATO in order to be protected under the common defense umbrella of the European Union? Uh, well, that's a very important question. Uh, frankly, I think that, uh, again, uh, well, uh, I have to refer back to the world alternative, and uh, I agree with you, of course, there is an alternative of doing nothing or keeping status quo, stability is the best word of all authoritarians because they uh, offer stability and the, the status quo. But as Federica Mogherini mentioned, it's like driving a bicycle. Either you drive forward or you lose uh, your balance. Uh, so in this regard, I think, uh, uh, and current uh, war against Ukraine clearly showed the big gaps and deficiencies of international security system. There is no uh, security uh, arrangements that can either prevent what Russia is doing now or has done in Georgia and Ukraine uh, second time, or revert Russia's misbehavior. Only power that has uh, this type of ability is NATO as in a military security organization, not military political bloc, but the security organization. And it's transforming itself to the security organization. When Russia invaded in Georgia, Georgia had a uh, ceasefire agreement with Russia mediated by EU, led by uh, French President Nicolas Sarkozy, who was a president at that time. Uh, and this is the fourth year. Again, we have a French presidency, EU, and none of the points has been implemented in this agreement by Russia. So I think for today, the shape EU is, they cannot and there is no mechanism as well as a political will to provide the security umbrella. If under the strategic autonomy, uh, European defense capabilities that will be created and complemented NATO capabilities, that can be an option. But for now, as things, geopolitics has been accelerated in a uh, more than a uh, life speed because everything is changing almost an hourly, I think NATO, NATO membership is the most uh, relevant and trying to dissuade or create this you know, dilemma that you know, if we feed crocodile with lesser thing, then it will stop aiming us, to, it will not work. So I think uh, that type of division in opinions or either or really fits the uh, Russian propaganda, which creates uh, quite smartly the false alternatives. And this is part of the propaganda warfare the previous panel was discussing, the false dilemmas are the perfect tool 
to uh, make anyone you want to dissuade to lose their compass. So, uh, and we've seen a number of these type of false dilemmas injected in Georgia as well. Recently, their propaganda outlets injected discussion whether we want a territorial unity or NATO member country, uh, membership. There is no such an alternative. The shortest way Georgia restoring territorial integrity peacefully goes through the NATO membership and through the EU membership. So still, my question is, uh, I think, and uh, I hope I'm right, first NATO membership should come. And uh, Georgia is more ready right now to be a NATO member uh, rather than the EU member because of the state of the democracy, but while some of the reforms done in the defense security field because of the contributions uh, in different NATO missions, the biggest ones per capita we did, we are more ready to be a NATO member country. May I, may I interrupt our program with a very important news what happened two hours ago. Croatian president, Mr. Zoran Milanovic, made a public statement that he will block Finnish, Finland's NATO accession, uh, if, NATO, if Finland doesn't support election law reform that favors Croat nationalists in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So that's what happens when there are no red lines within the union. And when you allow A. Orban, B. Jansha, C. Zoran Milanovic, and they are all competing. Well, luckily, we, Slovenians got rid of Jansha, but I'm saying those were the people who are competing who can make uh, more inflammatory statements relating to security, uh, prosperity, and stability of the European Union and Western Balkans. And now you have Zoran Milanovic threatening NATO enlargement process with an internal matter from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And not only that, he says if Finland and NATO wish to poke the bear with a pen in the eye, let them do that, meaning it's such a immature, and he said it, it's a charlatan immature thing to do. But if, we, if they wish to do it, I will condition it with the internal situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So that's how, how far we have gone in the process of appeasing the bear instead of looking bear in the eye. Uh, and, and, and that is what we are currently living in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And this is why it's, these parallel processes and policies are so damaging, because it decreases Con confidence in, in the entire process. And we joke in Nasha Stranka, and liberals joke in Bosnia and Herzegovina in general, how European Union constantly pats us on the back and says, you are the future of Bosnia and Herzegovina and you will forever be. <laughs> because <laughs> in, order, in order to become a partner at the table, you, you need to win the nationalists whom we are providing legitimacy for and pretending that they are not Russian puppets. I think the analogy of the of the crocodile that you don't want to f that you uh, give something little. Um, I think it's very fitting because there's one thing about crocodiles: they grow for their entire life, and they need to feed in order to be fed in order to do so. So if you give a crocodile a little something it eats, it grows bigger and wants to eat more. So I think, therefore, it's a fantastic analogy. Plus, they're feeding it steaks and hoping it becomes a vegetarian. Yes. Well, <laughs> well let, let, let's, let's hope in that case it happens the same thing with the people who try to make uh, vegetarians out of their cats, and then they die. Maybe that also will happen. <laughs> you don't get to laugh. You are one of the brain drain people. <laughs> so does anyone... <laughs> you admit it. Um, does anyone from the audience have anything that they think is a smart comment or question to this very distinguished panel that I have here to my left? Otherwise, I will have one final attempt to an intelligent question. I hope it will land this time. Roman Jakic. <laughs> you always have something to say. I, I, I promised uh, Sabina this will be a little bit more of a rock and roll session, so not only my socks, uh, but also my <laughs> demeanor here on, on stage should accompany that. Hi there, Roman. Hi there. Here, I have a microphone for you. Come here. Yeah, Emil. Uh, 
So maybe, maybe. Uh, would, would you please state your name and affiliation, yes, uh, Mr. Jakic? Yes, Roman Jakic. I'm uh, coming from Slovenia, chairman of LIPSEM, Liberal Southeast European Network. So uh, maybe the, the, the comments or the questions when we are talking about the uh, uh, Western Balkan and, and uh, European Union uh, and enlargement. Uh, you know, in, uh, I, was, I was writing one uh, article in ELF uh, publication talking about sponsorship. Uh, when Slovenia decided uh, to join the, uh, the EU, we were lucky to have in that time uh, um, uh, Germany to be our sponsor yeah. for membership, so we and the Croats. Uh, that's also the case with the, with the Baltic states, with the Scandinavian countries. And in the time of um, late Djindjic, when Serbia was on the way to become the uh, member of European Union, uh, the French was the sponsor. Uh, so I'm, I'm just, maybe the, the question, do you, do you see any sponsors? I mean, I'm also talking about the, the Georgia and the, those frozen conflict. Uh, do, you, do you see inside the European Union the sponsor who would be somehow uh, uh, those who are pushing uh, you through, uh, to, uh, through, uh, through the door? That, that would be my, my question. The first one and the second one. Uh, Sabina was, we were together in uh, Den Haag, uh, where it was also a very good conference, and she was talking about the leadership, uh, how, the, how, how we, we are missing the leadership uh, in Europe. And that's basically in the connection with my first question, because in the time when the huge number of the countries from Central and Eastern Europe decided to join the EU and the NATO, uh, it was a lot of, let's say, leaders. In that case, for example, when I'm talking about Slovenia, it was Gensha who, who pushed, uh, uh, pushed uh, Slovenia, Croatia, and then the others through the door of the, uh, of the EU and NATO. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pick the right one. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, support or the sponsorship or the champion. Uh, Georgia's uh, Euro, Euro integration process largely has been championed uh, on one side from the United States, mostly in NATO membership. And as for the EU, uh, there was a uh, decisive momentum after 2008 war, then when uh, some realized earlier and some maybe later that it was not a only Georgia and Russia war. It was a Russia's war against the liberal democracy as an idea, which he openly said actually in G20 summit in 2019, finally admitting that that's what he's fighting for. And also he believes that this liberal democracy is somehow a creature of the uh, uh, Americans or Anglo-Saxons, so he's deep in uh, the uh, conspiracies. But uh, as a result, um, at that time, European political leaders uh, like Carl Bildt and Radek Sikorsky suggested the idea of the Eastern Partnership. And I think that was a great idea at that time that generated the momentum. So till today, uh, Eastern European countries, Poland particularly, Sweden, they are one of the most vocal supporters of the Eastern Partnership to be a, the platform that really prepares countries to join the European Union, and they are investing politically a lot in this as well. But uh, as I said in the beginning, all the logics or all, all the uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, we were uh, used to have prior to uh, this uh, uh, 24th of uh, February when Russia started war in, in Ukraine will not work after this. Who will be the new champions? Uh, what will be the composition of uh, the maybe coalitions of willing? for the enlargement and supporting Georgia or any other Eastern partner country or Balkan countries needs to be seen. And then at one instance, we see the new leader in uh, European foreign policy is emerging, um, uh, let's say UK, uh, not as a EU member, but any truly European leader, trying to find a new mechanism or kind of a, uh, a coalitions within the uh, larger formats of the cooperation. So that needs to be seen, uh, but we are very optimistic that there will be no uh, uh, space or no vacuum uh, left f 
for the uh, Russia, it's a hybrid means to fill up because vacuum never stays a vacuum and in the last 14 years uh, since 2008 invasion in Georgia, we've seen that this vacuum has been built by the rogue states and rogue actors like Russia and their uh, accomplices quite successfully. Not only uh, politically as a state, but also through the network of enablers. And that network of enablers directly or indirectly are linked to Russian uh, financial or dark finances. So again, this idea of uh, sanitizing or sterilizing the global financial system out of these enablers, I think an important step forward. And with this, we, we might see uh, some new, new leaders emerging on the European or in, in, a, in a free world, actually, let's say so. Um, I, will, I will start by being very self-critical. Self-critical meaning both for Bosnia and Herzegovina and particular political actors in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as the region. It is also our duty to nurture these kinds of sponsorships and to nurture these kinds of partnerships and friendships and to provide up-to-date, clear information of what, on what we need and what is going on on the ground. Is Bosnia and Herzegovina doing that homework? Absolutely not. And the reason why is because those who should be providing that data are the ones who would, by definition, most of them would be in prison if we joined the EU and met the criteria on particularly judicial reform. So that's why I talked about the four parallel processes. These people are saying they want to join the EU. They know that it would be the end of their political career and probably their, their, <laughs> their life outside of prison. Um, so in that sense, it, it goes both ways. The EU prefers, it used to prefer at least up until Ukraine, the status quo. So everybody pretended to waltz to that music, but without really kind of moving. Um, and, and in that sense, there is responsibility on the liberals to create these networks, the alternative to these, to these processes. Um, and I would here point out Netherlands, who has been the champion, for example, of progressive policy towards Bosnia and Herzegovina, stood up to the strategic compass language that favors national uh, ethnic division in Bosnia and Herzegovina within the strategic compass as a result of Croatia's lobbying, the language was adopted that is entirely damaging to Bosnia and Herzegovina, who stood up, Netherlands stood up, which then came up, was followed by Germany. German government came out and said that they join Netherlands on the opinion uh, on the strategic compass language. Uh, there are progressive voices now, voices in Austria as well. Uh, there are obviously very encouraging voices from new German government. We need to provide information, nurture these voices, create partnerships uh, that, as I said, are alternative to these old processes that didn't work from either, for either side, did not provide. It, it, it created a false sense of security to the EU and false sense of hope to Western Balkans. But both of the, pro both of the senses were, were, were fake. Um, and that's why I'm appealing to leadership, as you, as you suggested. There, are, there is an incredible amount of now responsibility, as I said, not only on Europe, but liberal Europe. Liberal Europe to go back to, to the roots and say, what is, it? what is the alternative? What is the inspiring alternative to what is being offered by the illiberals, both in Europe and from outside of Europe. And I think I couldn't have asked for a better closing statement for today's conference. <laughs> um, this kind of inspiration, please can I have a round of applause <laughs> for that. <laughs> Talking about this inspiration, this inspirational perspective, or in having inspiration because you have a perspective to make something better. I have to pour some water in your wine because I hope you, <laughs> people don't mind me saying that here. But as we have seen in Bulgaria, joining the European Union not, doesn't necessarily lead to people being arrested for <laughs> crooked things. <laughs> Only for one night, as we have seen with Boyko Borisov. <laughs> um, so with this, I also would like to not only draw a close to this panel, and I thank you both very much. I wish we have, would have done that early in the day, because personally, I thought it was the most interesting uh, panel. <laughs> and we are, we are very objective. <laughs> See, rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. Thank um, you. 
But there are a couple of things that I would like to leave the couple of remainders here in the room with. Number one, this is not the first and certainly not the last time that we are addressing this issue of EU integration, both for the Western Balkans, but also countries like Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. Because we finally have to make a plan how to actually do that. We have been talking enough, as you said, but now we need to have some actions that follow. Because, again, as you said, if there is a vacuum, it will be filled by someone. And there are two big things. One looks like Winnie the Pooh, and the other one wants to be a bear um, mm -hmm. who wants to fill that kind of void. So we need to work on that, and liberals indeed need to first make the first move. The Conference on the Future of Europe will not do anything for that. That's why we need to come forward as European liberals with our ideas. And when I say European liberals, I would like to have the definition of both the ALDE party and the European Liberal Forum. EU, UK, Western Balkans in its entirety, Turkey, South Caucasus, Ukraine, Russia the good part of Russia, like Pierre Pepanas or Yabloko, our sister parties on the ground who are fighting the regime on, in any way that they can. We will continue this kind of formats to finding those solutions. We will also have these formats in the future that are a bit more interactive, more solution-oriented, where we can come out with something that we can actually give the policymakers at hand. And I hope you don't mind me saying that, we need a realistic perspective for integration. We need a realistic perspective first for the Western Balkan countries, then for Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. Because there is no way in hell that I can explain to my friends in the Western Balkans, especially Montenegro, uh, Bosnia, North Macedonia, why all of a sudden, because there's a crisis, people can skip the line even though they have been put in, putting in the work for years and years and being left at the doorstep saying, we get you in next time. You have the wrong friends with you today. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for sticking with us. Thank you too very much. Thank you. And with this, I would like to close today's conference. <laughs>